The sight was one of the most mesmerizing the boy had ever seen. A shining sword thrust straight into the stone. The waves of energy emanating from it gave him goosebumps. The energy was becoming more tangible, and the boy clenched his teeth in tension when he heard his name. The weapon seemed to want to test Leon's strength. The boy heard another man's voice in his head asking insistently if he thought he was worthy. Leon realized that the holy sword had been the voice that had shown the path of his destiny. And now the ancient weapon was telling him that opportunity must come by fair means. The boy grabbed the sword and with his whole body felt the power that came from it. He was determined that he would do anything to prove that he was worthy of it. It was a fine morning. The light wind was beautifully developing the flags over the castle towers. The two boys clashed their training wooden swords. Everyone watched with interest as Leon and the blonde-haired guy practiced their fighting skills in a duel. Each of them tried to do as much damage as possible to their opponent. The blonde man lunged and swung hard. His blow made Leon bounce back, but he still managed to knock the wooden sword out of his hands. Leon hadn't been able to stay on his feet, and now sat on the ground, glaring angrily at his opponent and rubbing his arm. He growled that he wanted to be taken more seriously when he fought him. In response, the blonde smiled broadly and assured his opponent that he was quite serious. After all, Leon was the only one in the Imperial Academy who dared to challenge him. Leon shouted that he shouldn't be bullied. His opponent smiled and admitted that he was fighting at half strength. But he didn't deny that Leon was better than before. The guy was even angrier after those words. He smirked and decided to teach his arrogant opponent a lesson. In his head, a small plan had already formed. He grabbed his training sword and threw himself into a new attack. Leon couldn't stand being pitied, so he couldn't just turn a blind eye to such a condescending attitude. While the guys were fighting, the audience began to argue whether the fight was too long, because Leon can't even stand up to his opponent, Lion. It was assumed that it was all because of the same names. The names sounded similar, but they were spelled differently. Looking at Lion's satisfied grin, it was obvious that that wasn't the only thing that made him different from Leon. In the end, the fight could not last forever. It ended with Leon losing again. Leon sat on the ground in the shade of a tree. His head bowed. He thought about the fact that it had been three years since Leon had been transferred to the Imperial Academy. He clenched his teeth tightly against his emotions. He was thinking that no matter how hard he trained, he wouldn't be able to beat the blonde man. The image of Lion flashed through his mind, and he realized that no matter how similar their names were, they had completely different personalities that were completely different from each other. The whole image of this blonde-haired guy, his mannerisms, look, and personality were built on giving the impression of the main character from fairy tales. Thinking about it made Leon's teeth clench with anger. It was hard to deny that Leon was an ordinary guy. This was further proof that he didn't belong here. He should have moved to the class for the elites. He was pulled out of his musings by a familiar voice that asked if he was all right. Leon looked up and saw the same blonde man holding out his hand, offering to help him up. Leon waved the helping hand away irritably and thought about how it would be much better if this guy disappeared from his sight somewhere. These thoughts were dispelled when he heard a woman's voice calling his name. He turned his head and saw her blonde hair glistening in the sun. Leon decided that before his problems doubled, he needed to leave. So he threw Lion A back off and strode away. The blonde-haired girl observed the behavior of the two boys and irritatedly called out to the departing Leon, expressing her desire to talk to him. The girl indignantly declared that she had heard everything. She asked why he continued to fight Lion if he couldn't beat him anyway. These questions made the guy irritated and resentful of not being believed in his powers. Lion tried to defuse the tense situation. Smiling, he tried to calm down the girl named Chloe, but these attempts only increased her anger. Chloe's irritation reached its peak when she noticed the blood on Leon's hand. There was a wound on the boy's finger. She anxiously insisted to treat it urgently. The girl's excessive worry pissed the guy off even more. When she reached out to help him again, he pulled his hand away and said he didn't need it. Unable to stand Chloe's insistence, he snapped and rudely shouted at her to just stay out of it. Her worrying about little things annoyed him. Such rudeness upset the girl, so she silently watched the guy walk away in an unknown direction. The setting sun beautifully illuminated the Imperial Academy building. The evening calm was broken by the sound of wood being struck. Trying to control his anger, Leon practiced with the wooden sword in the playground. He beat his weapon incessantly. Anxious thoughts overwhelmed him. He wondered what would change if his hair were light, his blood noble, and his family supportive. From the forces applied, the wooden sword broke in two. 
Looking at the pieces of wood, Leon realized that he had none of the above. In this world, there are too many obstacles. Desire and effort won't always help. The boy remembered that today was Lion's birthday. An impressive party should be held for the pride of the Imperial Academy. The boy tossed the sword aside and flopped to the ground, promising himself to practice tomorrow. He had lost three years of his life here, and now another day was wasted. The realization of how much effort he had expended with no visible results hit him painfully. He wondered, why not just give up? If everything was a foregone conclusion, how could he get stronger? The injustice made him want to scream. He asked a rhetorical question. Why did he have to go through all this? Why does he have this life? Doesn't he make enough effort? Blowing off steam, the boy listened to the silence. He smirked as he realized the answers he was unlikely to get, or justice in general. Leon was about to leave the training ground when suddenly his attention was drawn to a huge fireball that was approaching him. At this time, the celebration was in full swing. Leon's birthday made many people come together, but the birthday boy was worried that Chloe couldn't find Leon anywhere. He hadn't seen him for a long time either. The upset girl said that no one had seen him in the dormitory either. She hoped that he would appear at the party. Now, Chloe's thoughts revolved only around Leon. Lion tried to pull her out of wondering where the stubborn guy had gone. He reminded her that she was with him now so those musings could wait. This argument did not seem convincing to Chloe, so without thinking long, she turned and walked away from the hall, shouting that she had to find Leon. A gray-haired man approached Lion. He watched their dialogue with Chloe. Cheerfully raising his glass, the old man remarked that his highness had just been rejected by a girl. It was Mr. Gilbert. Lion irritably turned to him and urged him not to use his title in the conversation. They might be overheard and then hiding the identity would become pointless. The man nodded in agreement. He also didn't argue with the statement that Lion wasn't entitled to the title yet. After all, then, he should be better than others. The old man smilingly congratulated the boy on his 17th birthday. Mr. Gilbert mentioned that there is only a year left before the prophecy that concerns the Imperial family comes true. Once a member of the Imperial family, the great empire Clyde becomes of age, the current emperor's life will be cut short and a new era will begin. While everyone mourns the previous holy emperor Roderick, a new one will take his rightful place on the throne. Lion clarified with Gilbert, is he really talking about Roderick who died 300 years ago? The guy ironically said that they had too high expectations for him, but Lion realized that they would only find that out when he reached his 18th birthday. The boy thought about the people around him. Chloe, who had a special talent and already possessed level 4 magic. Leon, who had a special stubbornness and inhuman strength. Leon wished these two would always be on his side. Mr. Gilbert looked at this almost adult young man and remembered the text of the prophecy. It said that on the day a man named Lion became an adult, a sword would descend from the sky to him that would destroy even the darkest evil. At this time, Leon was trying to realize what was now happening on the training ground. The bright light parted allowing him to see the object that had descended to the ground. It was a sword, its point stabbed into the stone. The weapon emanated a powerful energy that could not be ignored. The sword beckoned to Leon, and a voice in his head urged him to get closer to the weapon. He wanted to give in to that impulse. When he realized that the voice was real, he turned his head to look for its source. The voice asked, Can he see who's in front of him? Leon began to slowly add up the factors he saw. That shape, that blinding light, the voice that came from the sword. It was hard to believe it. He couldn't believe it himself, but he still said out loud that he was holding the holy sword in front of him. The boy couldn't believe it himself, but he said it out loud that it was the holy sword. Sword muttered that the boy had called out to him and he had answered that call. Leon's eyes rounded in surprise. Had he really summoned such a powerful weapon? Suddenly, Leon's image popped up in his mind. In the background of it, the sword spelled out that the guy thought the world was unfair to him. Some people get everything, and others have to grow through persistence. Sword said that those who don't put in the effort have no right to charge their lives. Only those who have really worked hard have such a privilege. The voice of the sword said reproachfully that Leon, who had complained about his life to the Lord, was too arrogant. The question followed. Did the boy deserve the opportunity to wield such a weapon? Leon shouted furiously that he deserved it. After all, he had seen so much injustice, and now it could be made up for. Seeing the boy's serious intentions, the sword urged him to possess him. Then it would give him a chance to prove to everyone that he was not a weakling. Realizing that the holy sword wanted the guy to take it for himself, he began to approach him. 
With each step, the question of whether he could take it at all swirled in his mind. But then, he began to remember moments of how life had been unfair to him. After all, he practiced every day like a cursed man. Who better to wield that sword than him? Leon came close to the sword. He was not a coward, so he tried his best to prove to those around him that he was capable of many things. But reality was harsh and cruel to him. The guy clearly decided that he would not turn his labors into garbage and throw them away to nowhere. Then the sword asked, Why is he standing in front of him now? Leon answered that he wanted to show that he was determined. Leon truly believed that opportunities should be equal for everyone. And by wielding a sword, he would right an injustice. Not hearing the sword's comment, the guy decided with irritation that since the ancient weapon didn't care and didn't share his values, he wanted nothing to do with it. So he turned around and stepped back, but the sword shone brighter than before and when Leon turned, the weapon said he had proven his integrity and called him a warrior. Once more he urged the lad to raise it. The boy interjected. Had he really called him a warrior? Was the sword going to trust him so easily? To which the weapon replied that it was his will, not his trust. Further, the sword began to speak a strange prophecy. A heart that was not broken by fate, was not born of a prominent lineage. A desire to prove conviction, not hungry for fame or riches. The gun said that Leon is the one who deserves to be a hero. This is his well-deserved reward which will help him prove his strength and will to everyone. Leon touched the sword and lightning ran through his body. The weapon said his name was El Cid and it belonged to the Holy Emperor Rodrigo Caldeas El Vivar. He is guiding the light into a new era. The energy of the sword filled Leon's body. He could feel the weapon calling to him, urging him to overcome evil with it. A second later, the boy saw a strange vision. A man was looking at him, apparently an emperor, and he looked remarkably like Lion. The emperor pondered that a holy sword and a commoner was an interesting combination. He said he had violated the prophecy because nowhere did it say that only a member of the Clyde family could wield the sword. He said that Lion didn't meet their requirements. Even considering his talent and destiny, he still hadn't awakened his will. In addition, the emperor noted the fact that the sword himself reached out and took a liking to Leon. He noted that people like the boy were a rarity now. The emperor said not to worry because even if he used the legacy, nothing would change. He added meaningfully that it was time to pay off his debts. The strange man addressed someone, urging them to do their job and watch Leon from the sky. His gaze was full of mystery. Leon opened his eyes abruptly and lost in space and time, tried to comprehend what he had just seen. He realized with alarm that he was in bed. A chill ran down his spine. Was this all just a dream that wasn't going to happen? He rose from the bed trying to get his head around it, but his gaze was immediately drawn to the holy sword standing against the wall. It wasn't a dream after all. The sword spoke, saying it was the guy's last chance to get stronger. But that doesn't mean that using it will make him better. Leon will have to go through the trials that the sword will set up. An entity appeared from the sword and said that those who have great power must live a terrible life. The essence said that Leon might have to sacrifice his loyal friends or the woman he loved. The images of Chloe and Leon immediately came to mind. The entity pointed out that this thorny path was Leon's personal choice to be special, to which the guy said it was his chance, not a thorny path. The entity looked at Leon carefully, studying him. Then it agreed with his assertion and said that his journey would begin now. The creature called out to the boy to show off his sword skills. After all, in order to teach him, it had to understand what level Leon was at. This was his first test. Leon's eyes were determined and stubborn. He would do anything to let the entity see the result of his hard work. The sun had already risen. Sword essence. Elsa had watched Leon asking why he was shaking all over. The guy wasn't himself. He was nervous and clearly worried about something. He reasoned that he should be at the academy by now. Also, after looking at the sword, the guy said that it bothered him that he had it in his possession. After all, if the ancient weapon is seen by others, they will definitely recognize it. Alcide agreed with Leon. The holy sword was hard not to recognize, but there was no need to worry about that now, for there was a way to conceal the sword's presence. Suddenly there was a bright flash and the sword disappeared. In its place, a shining mark appeared on the boy's arm. The essence explained that now the sword was hidden inside Leon and no one would see it. The boy worriedly asked if the sword would show up when he slept. Elseed said that the weapon would not appear in any way and would not interfere with him. Leon said with a grin that he was superhuman now. 
Essence said irritably that this was no time for jokes. From this day forward, the boy would forget about resting. They would be practicing hard. Leon dryly replied that El Cid would be disappointed. To which the entity replied that it was still not disappointed. These words put the boy in a stupor. El Cid reminded the boy that his dream was at stake and so he should try his best. But the result would depend not only on him, but also on his teacher. When he heard these words, he picked up the training sword and began to perform the usual exercises. He felt that his body was filled with energy and responded to every movement. Leon was puzzled that he had become stronger from El Cide's words. He was surprised that only a few phrases had given him so much strength and energy. The boy smirked. If gaining someone's trust made the power boil in his hands, then what would happen when he actually succeeded? Leon was distracted by the entity's command to stop. He froze, not understanding why, for he had not even begun. The El Cid replied that the sword might not be able to withstand the pressure. The boy looked at the wooden sword with incomprehension and noticed as splinters began to fly off of it, destroying it. Startled, he flung it away. Essence asked, hadn't he noticed it before? El Cid had no idea that Leon was already wielding a sword at the level of an aura bearer. Without taking his eyes off the broken sword, the boy asked what the entity's words meant. El Cid answered that it didn't matter. But if he continued to fight like this, he would learn nothing. The sword essence told the guy that he was still quite immature, and they had a lot to learn in order to achieve the desired result. However, El Cid noticed that the boy had good basics of swordsmanship, but they still needed to perfect his body. The boy was surprised by this endeavor and looked questioningly at his mentor. Essence said that without strength in the hands, even proper sword-swinging skills wouldn't help, for it was a strong body that was the foundation of martial arts. If you constantly train, you will be able to achieve a perfect result. Therefore, to begin with, the guy will have to develop his body with the help of running. Leon smiled and started to run. He asked about how long he had to do it. The entity said that until she told him to stop, he wouldn't get the results he wanted. As the boy ran, El Cid told him that later they would train their muscles with exercises, one arm and one leg stands. Leon was interested in these plans. When it came to running, he was as good as anyone, but standing on one arm or leg was something completely new to him. The boy didn't even understand the essence of these exercises, but he realized that if he could become stronger with their help, it was worth the effort and fulfilling all of El Cid's instructions. The image of Emperor Rodrigo appeared again, he was saying that everything was going exactly as planned. He mentioned an old Eastern saying that says, Leon is an empty cup, just fill it with the basics of swordsmanship and sword fighting techniques, and then there will be the expected result. Leon can become master of the sword. But this title is not all that Emperor Rodrigo's successor, born 300 years later, can achieve. He can become even more powerful. The emperor expects the boy to be able to bring the demon king to his knees. Though he doesn't know the power of this demon spawn, Rodrigo hoped it doesn't exceed his own. It remains only to watch the guy and wait for the results, because they have already chosen him. The gates of hell will definitely open in front of Leon, and only then they will understand if he can cope. Leon was sitting in class at the Imperial Academy. While everyone listened to the teacher, he tried his best to stay awake. Elseed's voice snapped him out of his slumber. The boy twitched, saying he was not asleep at all but listening to a lecture. When he realized that he still had lessons to do, his head began to hurt badly and his arm began to shake in protest. It seemed that practicing with El Cid was taking too much energy. Leon looked at his notebook and realized that it would be difficult to combine studying, training, and still keep up with everything that the essence of the sword told him. El Cid had watched the boy long enough, and now, he told him, he knew where he needed to start training. He asked Leon what he thought he was missing. The guy suggested that he hadn't mastered the swordsmanship skill enough yet, and also he should develop his stamina more. El Cid waved his head negatively. He said he lacked attention span, and the phrase made the boy's eyes widen in surprise. Essence told of an ancient Eastern saying that went something like this. One eye, two feet, three hearts, and four powers. El Cid explained that mindfulness was most important, followed by body endurance, followed by courage and only then was strength. It was important, but there were three more important indicators. There are certainly various times where you can argue with this saying, but mindfulness still comes first, Leon wondered. He had never heard anything about mindfulness training. Perhaps El Cid was implying that moving his eyeballs would increase the radius of attentiveness? 
To test this theory, the guy began to sharply twist his head and look in different directions. This behavior attracted the attention of his classmates, who were clearly displeased. Alcide assured him that the boy would be even better now. He said he could show how useless his eyes were. Leon stared anxiously at his mentor. The entity never ceased to amaze him. Leon wondered how exactly Elsid would show him the flaws in his current vision. The entity ordered to look forward and focus on the teacher standing in front of the blackboard. The boy should fix his movements in his memory for ten seconds. Leon tried to do just that. He saw a dark blue blackboard with the pointer of a gray-haired middle-aged man pointing at it. His green eyes looked at the students. After ten seconds, Leon closed his eyes, expecting to see something new and different. But Elsid's question brought him down to earth. He asked how many lines were written on the blackboard. Leon was indignant, for he had been told to look at the teacher, the entity said with a snicker, telling her to focus but not telling her to look solely at the teacher. The boy clenched his teeth in an attempt to remember something, but he saw nothing but the teacher. El Cid resented the fact that the guy could only think of the teacher's view since the blackboard had been hanging right in front of him the whole time. Was he really looking there for ten seconds for nothing? He asked Leon why he hadn't turned his attention to the board. The boy answered sullenly, I don't know. Elsid smiled understandingly, saying that he knew what was wrong. Essence explained that Leon was only looking at what he thought was important, and the rest of the details were left out. The realization struck the boy. Elsid went on to say that the eye is a much more wasteful organ than the guy thought. Few people utilize the full range of vision by referring to unnecessary information. Leon, on the other hand, should be wiser and able to concentrate on his entire field of vision. Elsid ordered to capture the full picture of what the boy sees. The entity advised him to relax his eyes. Then the boy would be able to realize how wide he could look. Leon tried to do exactly as it said. He looked at the teacher once more and now tried to look wider, just like his mentor had said. He had ten seconds to do everything and it seemed impossible to memorize the details. The tension made the veins in the guy's forehead swell. It all seemed absurd. He had never imagined that learning the holy sword would be so difficult but there was no turning back. Elsid reminded Leon to pay attention to the top of the board as well. The boy tried to memorize as many details as possible. The strange behavior of the guy began to draw attention. Chloe watched Leon staring unblinkingly at the board. She had a lot of questions for him. The sun was already setting over the horizon when classes at the Imperial Academy ended. Leon walked out of the auditorium so exhausted and tired that he didn't notice anyone around him. The guy felt like his eyes were about to burst and his head was about to explode. But looking at the confused Leon, the entity decided that they were doing pretty well. Alcide said the tired eyes were caused by dryness. It was because he was straining them more than usual. However, headaches come in many forms. Leon awakened a function he hadn't used in a long time, causing his brain to ache from the change. That didn't apply to the muscles, though. The boy rubbed his eyes, asking if it wasn't all muscle pain. His mentor replied that the brain doesn't feel pain at all, it's just the way they put it. There was one thing Leon should have realized by now. He needed more training. The boy nodded to his mentor. Elsid decided to start practicing mindfulness, so he asked, How many candles on the candlestick in the hallway? The boy's answer was two. Elsid called his student an idiot. After all, there were three candles. The question followed, Did the passing boy have glasses? Leon answered uncertainly, Yes, but whether there was a tie, he could not say. Going outside, Leon immediately received a new question. Whether the light in the twelfth window was on. The boy strained to remember but couldn't find the answer. He blurted out that it was on. But as we got closer, it became clear that the light in that window wasn't on. Feeling his brain begin to melt, the guy spat on the bed and yelled out that he wanted to sleep. To his surprise, Elsie said that the guy did pretty well for his first time. If he practiced constantly... He would develop a habit. The guy asked if he asked for a break. Would he get one? To which El Cid said a firm no. Leon felt especially helpless today, so he wondered how much longer he would be in such agony. The mentor said that to get used to is to adapt to new things, but naturally their training also has a limit. Repetitive learning has its advantages, but the biggest problem is that the body can show false results. The boy looked questioningly at the entity. El Cid explained that the body can lie if it is used to one workout. Therefore, it is important to use different exercises, jumping on one leg or standing. Leon guessed that this was the reason why one had to train the body. One must develop oneself in a well-rounded way. His mentor nodded affirmatively. 
Else had said that above all, it was important for him to see the weaknesses of his ward. The mentor said that all people develop their bones, muscles, and nervous system differently. It doesn't depend on how they live or how much time they spend practicing. Because of these differences, they came up with three main criteria. The sailor's sense of balance, the hunter's sense of direction, and the shepherd's superior eyesight. Leon realized that El Cid was driving home the point that one must use one's strengths and thus compensate for weaknesses. The mentor said that the boy's strengths were endurance and hard training. These were the basics of swordsmanship, but other skills were needed as well. Leon's weakness was a form that stiffened over time, repeating the same thing. To put it simply, the lack of physical and mental flexibility of fencing with Aura. The guy didn't fully understand what he was talking about, so Elsie got annoyed about it from time to time. But then he started explaining again that fencing is a way of handling a sword. And if Leon could successfully apply basic skills in different situations, it was fencing. Of course, the sword itself was powerful, and when Leon heard that, his face stretched into a satisfied smile, but El Cid did not share the lad's amusement. He came closer and asked if all this theory could teach the basics of battle. Leon answered that he did not think it could. Then El Cid asked the guy if his opponent Lion had used the aura skill against him, and that's why he defeated him. Probably he is not an ordinary guy because this skill requires special training. Leon will only learn aura skills after he graduates from the academy. But for now, if he wants to defeat Lion, he should focus on training. Leon's eyes lit up and he replied that of course he wanted to win the fight with his blonde-haired opponent as soon as possible. Elsid replied that mere desire is not enough. One must try harder. These words made the boy angry. But the mentor calmly said that he would only get used to using his skills if he practiced a lot. Today, he was learning to see more extensively. Soon they would go through the whole training course as well. This news made the boy uncomfortable, but he still asked when the next training sessions would be. Elsie had answered that it was better not to know about it yet. His mentor's smile turned sinister when he informed him that if Leon was slacking, he would be penalized for mistakes starting tomorrow. This information was not a little frightening, but the guy pulled himself together and said the punishments would serve as an extra incentive to get strong sooner. Elsid appreciated the phrase, saying that he had a good psyche. But besides will, you also need strength. That's why he decided to push the guy in this. Leon realized that his mentor was right. It would be unwise to screw up tomorrow. And if the punishments were effective, he wouldn't mind. After all, it would also raise his power level. Alcide asked if he wouldn't mind trying this method. Leon gave a thumbs up, saying he was in. As soon as the guy said that, he immediately felt a powerful electric charge that traveled all over his body, making him scream in sudden pain. It only lasted five seconds, but Leon felt like all his insides had time to fry. Alcide was not embarrassed by this at all. He calmly said that it was his first time, so he couldn't control the force. Next time it would be weaker. Then the mentor smiled broadly and informed him that with each new mistake, the power of the discharge would increase. So the boy would have to try harder. Leon lay there thinking that all this was pure torture. But nevertheless, he said that they would continue with the new training from tomorrow. The sun had just risen over the training ground of the Imperial Academy. Leon had already started his workouts. First, he started jogging, trying to run as many laps as possible. After that, he practiced his outlook. Under his gaze, one of the Academy's teachers was embarrassed. Next, he returned to his room to perform a new exercise, the one-arm stand. When Leon went outside, El Cid immediately set up a test of attention. He asked how many pigeons were sitting on the roof. The boy confidently answered that there were ten. When the mentor asked which of the birds arrived first, Leon said the sixth. El Cid was pleasantly surprised because the answers were correct. He asked, how many pigeons were sitting on the window? And again, he got the right answer. There were no pigeons, only a crow. El Cid said that the result of the training is very good, and he had only recently started to focus his attention. The mentor decided that the moment had arrived. Finally, he could let his mentee take a short break. Leon was very happy to hear this, because it had been a whole month of training. Suddenly, a guy called out by the name of Lion, who appeared as if out of nowhere. Leon squinted his eyes and muttered in an unfriendly voice that they hadn't seen each other in a long time. And they hadn't seen each other since the boy had started training with El Cid. I remember even Chloe looked for opportunities to talk to him, but she failed to do so. Ignoring the hostility, Lion announced that everyone needed to gather in the hall after lunch, and he was asked to get a guy. As he left, he said that he thought about the fact that Leon would definitely be on the set. This caused the boy's confusion. 
Leon crouched under a tree and noted with a tinge of sadness that for a month, Leon had never once wanted to fight him. He wondered if the boy had given up. Lion also said that by looking at the guy's face, you can tell there's been some changes with him. This phrase made Leon clench his fists in irritation. He asked if Lion was serious now, to which he received a positive answer. Lion reasoned that the faces of those who thought they couldn't defeat him were very different from Leon's. Leon was pleased with that answer. Still, he wondered what the blonde had come here for. If calling him to the hall was the only reason he could leave quietly, Lion smirked at such a cold tone. After that, he asked the guy to talk to him some more. Leon was not happy about this offer, so he asked the blonde man who he thought he was. But he said he was only asking for ten minutes of his time. With a sigh, the boy crouched down on the ground next to Lion, which caused him to smile lightly. After a few seconds, the blonde asked if Leon had heard anything about the rumors that said he wasn't a commoner. Leon smiled slyly and said it didn't sound like Lion was trying hard to hide his status, but he had heard rumors like that. The boy asked if the blonde was expecting special treatment. Lion didn't expect to be treated this way. He was no longer a rookie and was completely serious in his words. Besides, he said, he had to hide his identity. And though such an admission surprised Lion, he decided not to pay much attention to it. But the blonde reminded him that in fact he had accepted his challenge only because he had studied at this academy. The boy thought about it and decided that it would make perfect sense if Lion didn't pay attention to him, just didn't mess with him, and didn't cause unnecessary interest. Leon looked at the blonde man and realized that as the winner, he was very loyal to the whole thing. Lion sadly muttered that now that time was over. With this phrase, he did not, on a joke, pissed off his interlocutor. But the blonde said that wasn't all she wanted from the guy. Lion has offered to fight one last time, swords only and nothing else, and also no wooden sticks. This proposal surprised Leon quite a bit. Lion squinted his eyes and his gaze became menacing. He said that if he won, the boy would become his vassal without further ado. Leon's gaze lit up as he realized that his main opponent was challenging him. It was a gamble he was willing to take. He asked the question, where was the guarantee that he would keep his promise? To which Leon replied that he believed in the nobility and honor of the boy. Therefore, he is sure that Leon will not be able to break his word and just walk away. Those words felt good to the boy, especially when he heard that Lion would always be at his side. Leon clarified what would happen if he won. What would be his reward? Lion replied that he would do whatever the victor asked. But in doing so, his family and honor must not be endangered. He also refuses to pass on secret knowledge and methods of swordsmanship training. Leon smiled and said that he was completely satisfied with the terms, except that the date of the battle would be determined by him. Lion says to let him know as soon as the guy is ready. He'll find a place, but he needs to be notified three days before the battle. The guys went off in different directions, obviously thinking about something of their own and mentally tuning up for battle. The image of Emperor Rodrigo came to mind. He said the moment had finally come. Leon, chosen at the whim of the sword, and the prince who claimed the throne would meet in battle. Realizing the fact that Leon had never been able to defeat the blonde in battle, the boy was truly afraid. But it was too late, because he had already agreed to take the fight. El Cid asked irritably what exactly the boy was afraid of. He had been determined to win not so long ago, but now he had decided to give up. The boy replied that the entity misunderstands him and everything is not as it seems at first glance. He is worried about Lion because he is very strong now and can hurt him. The guy explained that a month ago, training seemed very hard for him, but now he feels much stronger and more dangerous. El Cid reassured the boy and said that although no one knew about it, he shouldn't worry so much. The entity explained that spiritual power was a power completely different from physical power. It was normal that the guy didn't notice it, since no one was using it. El Cid said he would help the boy, especially since he wanted to pass the endurance test, so fate was giving him a gift. The mentor said with an enigmatic smile that he was sure something very intriguing would happen. The main thing was that the guy dared not panic anymore. Early in the morning, the students of the academy gathered in the courtyard to begin their training. The teacher warned that if there were any among those present who could not participate, they should step aside. It was a test of endurance. Last year, Leon was in ninth place, which was a pretty good result. His success was the result of his physical training, but still, the children of high-ranking nobles took the prizes. They used special endurance potions and it helped them. Alcide asked what place Lion was in. Leon replied that he was in first place. Nevertheless, it was obvious from the blonde man that he had practiced very hard. 
He couldn't be compared to those who only boasted of their origins. Even if the distance is short, you have to run two laps. A lap of 400 meters for a total of 800 meters. The last record was Lyons, which was 1 minute and 20 seconds. Alcide asked what the record was for Leon. The boy answered 1 minute and 40 seconds. The mentor thought it was funny that the time difference was only 20 seconds. The mentor tried to calm the boy down. He said that he should try again and leave the past failures in the past. After all, he has El Cid now, and the boy is not the same as he used to be. After gathering his courage, Leon got to the start and mentally set himself up for the desired result. He had to surpass his opponent. The instructor waved a red flag and signaled for the competition to begin. Upon hearing this, all the race participants abruptly burst from their seats and started the race. Leon ran so fast that those standing on the edges of the participants backed up in surprise. Already at the start of the race, he was able to take the lead and was now well ahead of his rivals. When he arrived at the finish line, the instructor proudly announced that only 1 minute and 29 seconds had passed, meaning that he had set a new record. The man approached Leon, who was just trying to catch his breath after the race, and asked grudgingly if he had learned how to use his aura. The boy answered in the negative. It was obvious that the man didn't really believe in the truth of those words, so he decided to test them. He took Leon's hand and the space around them glowed. This is how they check the use of aura. If they recognize and feel the aura, the participant is immediately disqualified. The teacher confirmed the fact that the aura had not been used. He noticed that the boy had changed so much in just a month. The man asked excitedly what kind of training he'd had. Leon smiled embarrassedly and said that he was only training the basics. That's why you can see that his performance has increased dramatically. The trainer admitted that he had probably been training hard. The man wondered how the guy managed to become so strong in such a short period of time. Lion watched his opponents triumph from the sidelines. He cast unkind glances at him in silence. Leon stepped aside and immediately asked Elsid what was even going on. Instead of answering, his mentor asked him, Where does physical strength come from? The boy suggested that muscles helped, but that was the wrong answer. El Cid explained that most physical training methods in this world is to increase your own muscles and make them dense, but that is only halfway to getting results. He also told me that muscles also have nerves, and according to the development of the nerve, the limit of muscle strength is determined. His mentor had discovered to him that the reason why physical strength was independent of visible effect was because of the difference in muscle nerves. This was information the boy had never heard before. El Cid never ceased to amaze with new information. He said that muscle density is determined from birth and that they have a clear limit of development. Leon had already trained them almost to the limit, so now they were training the muscular nerves. The boy seemed to be beginning to understand his mentor's methodology. Leon wondered how much his neuromuscular system had developed. After all, he had never trained nerves before and he didn't even think it was real. El Cid smiled meaningfully and said that there was his punishment for that. After these words, the boy was electrocuted. The guy screamed so loudly that he attracted unnecessary attention from the people around him. El Cid said that everything the guy had been working for 10 years, he'd gotten in a couple months. The pain tearing the nerve endings took its toll. It was the reason for the neuromuscular training. Leon asked why his mentor hadn't shared this information before. He replied that it would have bothered the boy even more. Alcide said that practicing with mindfulness was the key to this training, and if he had known this information earlier, mindfulness and focus would have dropped significantly. Mentor smiled and said that a simple thank you would suffice. He was doing what a holy sword should do, so he was happy with the results, because it had been a long time since he had trained anyone. Suddenly a thought flashed through the boy's mind. What if the holy sword is actually a piece of the soul of the hero Rodrigo? A second question immediately arose. Was the great Emperor Rodrigo, whom everyone revered so much, really a villain rather than a hero? For a few seconds, this disturbing thought put the boy in a stupor. He watched the race indifferently. He was brought out of this state by the crowd screaming about how awesome Lion was. As it turned out, the blonde managed to break his record from last year. Leon walked over to the results board and saw that he was unable to defeat his opponent in the end. He was now in second place. In first place was none other than Leon. This information made Leon clench his fists in anger. Seeing this, Elsie said that he was in too much of a hurry since it had only been a month. The boy replied that he understood perfectly well, but it was hard not to notice his progress. After all, he was in ninth place, and now he was in second place. 
Lion were still in first place. It wasn't over yet. Leon smiled and determined to be sure to win next time. It was already dark outside and only the windows of the dormitory glowed, diluting the gloom. Leon was lying on the bed. He asked his mentor what kind of training awaited him tomorrow. He replied that they were almost done with mindfulness. That means they now have a tougher task. They need to get busy with their physical abilities and put everything into practice, El Cid said, urging the boy to take his time. After all, this business requires precision and attention, Leon asked. Couldn't his mentor just teach him swordsmanship? El Cid said irritably that it was too early to think about that. After all, in the beginning, a guy has to learn how to use aura. El Cid had noticed that it was enough to use basic skills to reach a certain level. Martial arts without the use of aura are just movements. It seems complicated at first glance, but in reality it's very simple. Right now, the guy's movements are easy to predict. El Cid asked if Leon was now ready to defeat the strongest swordsman, Lion. The boy was puzzled. His mentor said that he needed to be able to use his strengths. The sword forged by long efforts is very strong, so as long as his physical skill rises in level, even Lion won't be able to overpower him. El Cid specified that the boy would need practical experience as well. After all, he would have enemies stronger than Lion in his life. Leon gullibly objected, saying that such thugs lived in the slums, and there were no such thugs in the academy, so one could not worry. The boy walked through the corridors of the Imperial Academy with a disgruntled face. Yesterday, he and El Cid had had a serious conversation that was still running through his head. The boy was distracted from his thoughts by the question of a passing student who spoke. Was this really the commoner Leon? Three students stood in front of the boy and looked at him appraisingly. Leon saw distinctive marks on their school uniforms that indicated that these guys were students of an elite class. They shouted with anger and disdain that it was some kind of damn thing. And some tramp couldn't come second in the competition. They started pointing fingers at Leon and shouting that the instructor must have messed something up because you can't fool them. Leon said with a smile on his face that if they were not satisfied with the table, they could go to the curator at any time. The boys were amazed at his audacity. The bullies started saying they didn't know how he managed to cheat. But it was strange that he jumped from ninth place right to second. They asked sarcastically, had Leon just now reached his potential? Some of them wondered what kind of family this guy came from. Leon decided that there was no point in arguing with these weeds who were determined to demonstrate their power. They were not worth his time. Someone urged the arrogant kids to calm down, saying they were making too much noise. This student reminded them that everyone was equal in the academy, regardless of status. A guy with silver hair came out of the shadows. He said that it was their job as nobles to give these commoners a chance to stand out a bit. The crowd supported the lad, shouting that Elmont was right, for a commoner will always remain a commoner. Leon realized that he was surrounded by idiots. He was disgusted to see the students bragging about their origins. He explained to Elsid that before them was Elmont, the second son of the Count of Bourbon. Before Leon, he had been second in ranking and was a rival to the blonde man. Now he was angry at the loss of this place and the fact that he never got around to Lyon. But that didn't stop him from enjoying his status. Elmont walked right up to Leon and said in a not sincere voice that he was sorry their first meeting had gone like this. The Baron's son suggested that the boy probably thinks everyone is too unfair to him and doesn't understand anything about this life. He held out his hand to Leon and told him that if he agreed with him, he should follow his advice. Then everything would be all right. Leon had no intention of accepting this arrogant guy's offer. He said with a smirk that he wanted to listen to this valuable advice first, and then he would decide whether to follow it. Such behavior angered the students of the elite class. They called the boy a creep and wanted to teach him a lesson. Elmont suggested that Leon undergo an individual one-on-one -on -one competition under the close supervision of an instructor. Then, no one would have any doubts about his abilities. The guy looked at this snob and didn't understand why he would even waste his time on him. He clenched his fists and realized that no matter how tempting the offer was, by accepting it, he would be accepting an unfair accusation against him. According to Elmont, the fact that the guy didn't use the aura means only one thing, that they themselves want to use it to defeat and teach Leon a lesson. But if he ignored the offer now, everyone would consider him a cheat who decided to run away with his tail between his legs. Leon pondered whether to accept the offer. This guy with the silver hair must want to hurt him somehow, and he was looking for a way to do it. Among the crowd, the lad saw Lion, who was watching the scene with a sad look. It was obvious that the blonde could help get Leon out of this mess, but there was no desire to go to him. In his head, Leon decided that help from his chief rival was no different than a strong insult or disgrace. 
so he exhaled and made the decision to accept the duel with Elmont. Elmont laughed, unable to believe that Leon had agreed to his proposal. He asked with a grimace if he was really accepting the challenge. The boy nodded affirmatively. Leon set his own terms. Instructor Helmut would be present and everything would be over in one day. If Leon wins, Elmont swears not to doubt his abilities. The Baron's son thought about it, because if he accepted these conditions and Helmut was the observer, then no one would cheat. But still he agreed. Elmont grinned and decided that it didn't matter at all who the instructor was. He would make sure Leon was embarrassed and people would recognize his true power. While in the room, Leon remembered with pleasure the look on Elmont's face. He didn't even think he'd get hands-on experience so quickly. Elsid confirmed that it is indeed a huge luck and one should take advantage of the opportunity. The boy asked his mentor if he thought he had the skills to defeat an opponent like Elmont. After all, he hadn't fought an opponent who used aura. The sacred sword spirit suddenly offered to show the guy what it was like in practice. Leon asked what the man meant, for he had already mentally prepared himself for a new challenge or fight. The mentor didn't answer anything. But after a few seconds, a small blue screen appeared in front of the guy's face showing information. Leon scrutinized the information on the screen. His occupation, skill level, and skill level were written there. It was his statistics. El Sidham also described Elmont's skills and abilities. Seeing them, the guy was very surprised and asked why his opponent was so weak. The mentor explained that if it was the second son of the Count, he most likely uses potions often. That meant that they were the only things that gave him real strength. If Leon takes the potion, he won't be able to digest it. The substance would just be a nutritional supplement to him. So Elmont's training is nothing compared to his. Elsid explained that the physical ability that could be increased without the use of aura was equal to a value of E99. E was the rank, 99 was the limit. But with Elsid's help, the guy will be able to jump over this wall with his own efforts. He will be strong even without the use of aura. His mentor said that when he accomplished that, he could answer all the idiots who thought they were better than him in full. Leon realized that he shouldn't worry about his physical abilities right now. After all, he would get everything, but in due time. In the meantime, he would listen to El Cide. The boy firmly decided that from now on it was time to climb up, not down, and he's going to do his best. He wouldn't let someone like Elmont win. But there was a question as to why his rank was listed as a hero who couldn't use a sword. Perhaps he was too young. Leon walked through the corridors of the academy with a confident gait. He was ready for the upcoming events. His attention was caught by Helmut, the instructor standing against the wall. The man was a little surprised that the boy had come here. A lot had changed in a month and now the guy wasn't afraid to take on a challenge. He would make his abusers regret what they had said. The instructor had warned him that if he tried anything reckless, he would have to stop him. But the man knew Leon wasn't like that. The man told the boy to think with his head and then he wouldn't be in trouble. With a wave of his hand, he turned and walked away. After a second, the man stopped, turned his head and said with a wicked grin that he wanted Leon to show those bastards who was boss. Leon said nothing but copied his teacher's evil smile. He was determined to do exactly what Helmut had said. To the cheers of the crowd, Coach and Leon entered the hall where the competition would be held. His opponent grimaced and yelled that he didn't think he'd have to fight such a baboon. He openly mocked Leon, saying that he was too small to take part in sparring. Leon was not going to tolerate these taunts for long, so he turned to the instructor and said that he wanted to start sparring right away. His opponent had obviously not expected this. Instructor Helmut announced that in his presence, Jeff Heinrich or Leon would fight for their honor. These words signaled the beginning of the sparring. Helmut asked Jeff Henry what he wanted to get out of this match, to which the guy replied that he wanted this commoner to confess his sins. He asked Leon the same question. The guy answered that he just wanted to finish the fight, to determine his strength, to test his abilities and realize the results of his training. Nodding, the instructor clapped his hands, signaling the start of the fight. He ordered both participants to get down to business. The participants raised their wooden swords and stood in a fighting stance waiting for the first blow. Chloe and Lion were watching the fight closely. The blonde thought, could a wooden sword be able to cut through flesh if it used aura? If so, Leon was in big trouble. Leon was approached by El Cid. The mentor asked if the boy wanted him to show him his opponent's abilities. He waved his head in the negative. The boy's eyes lit up furiously. He realized that no matter how strong his opponent was, he was only Elmont's pawn. He had no reason to use El Cid to win. Jeff Heinrich, his face contorted with rage, 
snapped out of his seat and swung his wooden sword in an attempt to deliver the first blow to Leon. Leon quickly assessed the situation and realized that his opponent was using a diagonal cut that cuts from the top right to the lower left side. At first he thought that his opponent had used such an obvious trajectory on purpose. But then he noticed that Jeff Heinrich was moving incredibly slowly. Therefore, Leon repelled his opponent's attack with incredible speed. He did it without any special effort. Such a maneuver shocked and delighted his elite class opponents. And if this trick was easy for Leon, his opponent was literally exhausted from the effort. He was breathing hard and trying to regain his balance. When Jeff Heinrich collapsed to the floor of the sparring hall without strength, Leon couldn't believe their fight had ended like this. It was too easy. But the defeated opponent couldn't even get to his feet, let alone continue the fight. When Jeff Heinrich found his strength and stood up on shaky legs, all he uttered were the words that Leon was just lucky. In a hoarse voice, the defeated contestant shouted that he wanted another round. He demanded that Leon fight him again. That's when Instructor Helmet intervened, telling Jeff Heinrich that he had lost and the rules would not be broken. Smiling, Leon nodded in agreement. Jeff Henry couldn't accept his loss, so he started laughing hysterically and telling Leon that he was a commoner and he shouldn't get too cocky. He took a fighting stance and pointing his wooden sword at Leon said that he was going to be serious now and this time he wouldn't be turned away. Leon looked at his defeated foe in bewilderment. El Cid said in a moralizing tone that the boy should never again defeat his enemies with one blow. Eventually a second fight began. This was Leon's first fight against a man with an aura, so he might get some great combat practice. Jeff Heinrich was simply furious. He swung his practice sword with great force and screamed at Leon. Leon noticed that his opponent's arms, legs, and pupil movements were so slow, but now he was much faster. In addition, his movements had become different. Elsid told him that since he now saw a change in the enemy's maneuvers, he should know what was going on. This dramatic increase in Jeff Heinrich's strength was due to the fact that he had begun to use his aura. Nevertheless, Leon was able to predict his movements. Jeff Henry angrily demanded that Leon stop dodging his attacks and start fighting a serious battle. Leon decided that it was not worth trying to attack his opponent right now, as he was not yet experienced enough to change the course of the battle. It was his endurance that was important at the moment. Leon realized that even though his opponent had increased his physical abilities with his aura, he also had his limitations. Guy noticed Jeff Heinrich opened up and took the opportunity to hit hard into an unprotected spot. The boy recoiled from the pain in his leg. He told Leon that he should have gotten rid of him at the beginning, for he could not be defeated by such a blow now. Leon took this as a challenge and began to deliver blows to different points on his opponent's body, causing him to scream in pain. As his defeated opponent lay on the floor, he told El Cid that he was right, and in order to train quick attacks, one must attack a moving target. Leon looked at Jeff Heinrich. He saw the pathetic, beaten-up loser in front of him, shouting that he was giving up. Instructor Helmet walked over to Leon, held his hand up, and proclaimed him the winner of this sparring match. His elite class enemies were skewered with anger. They clearly hadn't expected this turn of events. In the evening, all the students at the Imperial Academy were discussing the fight between Leon and Elmont's gang. They said that they had never thought of Leon's abilities. The guys shared rumors that everyone in Elmont's gang was losing to Leon one by one. Now only Elmont himself was left to fight. Leon walked down the corridor and listened to these rumors with a slight smile. Elsid called all these people boring and said that even with the use of aura, they were of no use. Tonight, however, things are to be different. Leon would finally be fighting Elmont himself, so now it was important for him to be vigilant. Leon glanced at his current opponent, who looked quite imposing. Elsid decided that Elmont was pretending to be in front of an audience, acting very cocky. Walking into the sparring ground, Leon thought that by using the aura, the enemy's physical abilities would be higher than his. Also, Elmont had been in the second place of the rankings for a long time. Leon remembered El Cid's stats. Elmont had a secret sword skill. The unknown ability was the most suspicious of all, even though it was only at the first level. Seeing his enemy's evil grin, he thought Rodrigo's methodology might not help. Elmont said he hadn't expected it to come to him. Leon also decided to sneer, saying that he thought it would be interesting here, but his friends from the elite class had made him bored to death instead of fighting. Seeing how Elmont's face twisted at those words, Leon decided that this victory would be the most ideal one to confirm his strength in front of Lion. Leon began to analyze his opponent. Though his physical abilities were superior now, this fight had its nuances. If Elmont enveloped his sword aura well, it would be dangerous to block his attacks with a wooden training sword. Therefore, 
the boy wondered if he should avoid direct attacks. Instructor Helmut shouted loudly, alerting the audience to the start of the bout. As Leon approached Elmont, he felt a strange touch. He realized that the enemy had probably hit him with his aura. He looked at the young Baron's sword and realized that this was not an easy attack. After all, the basic speed attack was too fast. Leon was annoyed by the fact that this direct descendant of nobility was pointing out to him that he didn't have high status. Elmont said his friends got what they deserved. To lose to such a commoner was a disgrace. He reminded them that if Leon still wanted to obey him, he was willing to forgive. Seeing Leon's frown, Elmont threatened that if he stood his ground, he would make him regret what he had done. Leon didn't say anything, but after a couple of seconds, the first one rushed to attack. He landed a precise blow on his opponent. He cupped Elmont's cheek and let the first blood flow. This made the young Baron furious, and he started accusing the boy of showing off his shameful technique in front of everyone. These words made Elsid more than a little angry. He said that a dog like Elmont would not criticize his technique. This reaction from his mentor seriously alarmed and made Leon nervous. Leon could sense the ominous aura and resentment of Elsidus, who said that even after 300 years, some brat had managed to insult him. The mentor told the guy that insulting a teacher is the same as insulting all of his students. The spirit of the sacred sword decided that Elmont must answer for his words. So he told Leon that, until the match was over, the teeth on the young Baron's face should be knocked out. The boy decided that such an instruction was to his liking, and he would try to knock out not one or two teeth, but as many as possible. He also wanted to teach his enemy a lesson. Elmont was tuning in for the battle when he suddenly felt something strange coming from Leon. There was a strong energy emanating from him, the nature of which he did not understand. While Elmont was thinking about it, Leon wasted no time and threw himself into the fight, attempting another strike with his training sword. He put a lot of effort into it, and the lunge was successful. The students in the hall shouted in surprise that Leon had managed to move Elmont from his seat, but Lyon standing behind refuted it, saying that Leon had used his skill, but Elmont's balance had not been disturbed. If that was the case, then this battle would be a battle of Leon's endurance. When Leon made that strike, he wondered if he had put too much power into it. He was sometimes surprised at his own abilities, and he hadn't even used his aura yet. Elmont shouted, saying that Leon was too stubborn and the best solution for him would be to stop resisting and just give up. Leon began to repel the enemy's new attack, saying that this was not the end of their battle. After evaluating Elmont's fighting strategy, Leon decided that he lacked speed and power. He remembered his lessons with El Cid and determined that he would fill these deficiencies with Rodrigo's method. This skill predicted the opponent's actions. If only the guy could have seen them a little earlier, he could have easily defeated Elmont. Leon has to be even faster, see wider, make sure he has a full view until he feels like he's in the water. The boy did his best to act as his mentor had taught him, and when he knocked his opponent off balance with his blows, he was very pleased with himself. Leon had completely worn Elmont out. The young Baron couldn't believe that this guy didn't know how to use Aura. He had such power, but where he drew it from was unclear. Even Instructor Helmet had his doubts. He still couldn't sense Leon's aura, however. Couldn't explain how he was fighting on par with Elmont. Elmont smiled enigmatically and said that he didn't think he would have to use it against Leon. The boy immediately realized that he was talking about a secret skill. Leon didn't know the essence of this skill, so he decided that the best option would be to just wait. After all, it was very illogical to attack blindly, not knowing what to expect. The boy saw Elmont rapidly approaching him, swinging his sword with all his might. He figured he might be using an enhanced strike, so he had to dodge. Leon was able to successfully avoid the attack, but moments later he realized that the first attack was a trap. For even as he dodged, Elmont managed to strike next. So this was his opponent's secret swordsmanship technique. He knew how to make the sword always hit the target. If Leon tries to dodge, he'll break his ribs. And with such a serious injury, he won't be able to continue the fight with dignity. One could try to track Elmont's sword with the method, but there was a chance that he would be defeated. Leon couldn't lose to him, so it was necessary to end it. Leon jumped high, dodging his opponent's subsequent attacks. Now he was out of range. With this trick, he first disoriented Elmont and then struck him, breaking the protective armor on his shoulder. His opponent roared, not realizing how Leon had managed it. Leon has managed to break Elmont's arm. Now he had put him in a very disadvantageous position. The further course of the battle depended on Leon's next steps. Lion watched everything from the side. 
It was clear that the injury to his arm was nothing compared to the shock of seeing Elmont fail by using a secret skill. Elmont thought that with the integrity of both hands, the opponent would attack head-on. But the strength of his sword had already reached its limit. Therefore, if he broke the sword, his chances of victory would increase. The guy rushed to attack, but Leon managed to knock the sword out of his hands without much effort. All hopes of victory were gone. After that, Leon immediately threw his next blow, which came right into the young Baron's face, with blood spurting out of his mouth. When the audience saw that Leon wasn't just winning, but had also knocked out a couple of Elmont's teeth in addition, they started screaming and applauding. The defeated Elmont lay on the floor of the sparring hall. Leon and the instructor Helmut stood over him, who held the boy's hand up, indicating who had won this battle. Elsid couldn't stop praising his student. He was amused that Elmont had lost to a fighter who had a shameful technique. Now he would choose his words better. Leon didn't think that such a change in character was possible because of one defeat. But it was nice for the boy to get a taste of the battles at the academy. Elsid said he was very impressed with Leon's battle. So he thinks it's time to open a new door called Acceleration. Leon was surprised that his mentor had decided to jump into learning a new technique so quickly. But curiosity overcame him, so he asked Elsid if this skill was stronger than the one Elmont used. Instead of answering, Elsid began to explain that the body moves slower than the mind, even more so in emergency situations. People use reflexive movements that are not related to speed. The mentor asked Leon why he thought professional fencers could move so fast. The guy assumed it was because they knew how to use the aura. He was partly right. If he didn't use the aura, his body wouldn't be able to withstand strong and powerful blows. Thus, after learning the aura, one could start using acceleration. Elsid mentioned that Leon was able to use acceleration without mastering the aura. It was when he was able to jump high during the battle and disorient Elmont. The mentor said the guy succeeded because he was able to overcome the instinctive limit of his own will. Leon was puzzled. He thought that if he didn't use his aura during such maneuvers, his body wouldn't be able to withstand it. But here he was, safe and sound. Perhaps he had used the acceleration partially. El Cid confirmed his theory. If he used the acceleration on his whole body and not just his thighs, his insides would leak out. The boy realized how dangerous it all was. El Cid had advised him to take his body more seriously if he didn't want anything irreparable to happen. The boy glanced questioningly at the spirit. But instead of answering, he received a violent discharge of small lightning bolts into his lap. The boy fell to the floor and squirmed in pain. Elsid explained that it was caused by muscle pain. Seeing the guy's agony, Elsid said that even though he could use acceleration, it was better not to until he studied the aura. After all, he might get killed next time. Gritting his teeth, Leon replied that he would heed that warning. In the morning, walking through the corridors of the academy, Leon heard everyone whispering about him. The students marveled that he was able to defeat a noble student and revealed his use of potions to increase his strength. Leon grinned at how quickly the rumors were spreading. Elsid added that he laughed at the way the proud nobles justified their defeat. Suddenly, Chloe appeared right in front of Leon. The girl smiled at him in a friendly manner. Leon was confused. He remembered how he had rudely avoided talking to the girl and now he was ashamed of it. He decided not to repeat his mistake, so he and Chloe went out into the yard and sat down on a bench to talk. The boy asked confusedly why she was here. After all, her class was having alchemy right now. Smiling, the guy assumed that Chloe had started skipping. Chloe called Leon a fool and said that the lesson was canceled because of the teacher's illness. And anyway, couldn't she just see him? The girl sighed and said that she noticed how much the guy had changed. It was also strange to her that he was avoiding her. She wanted to know what was wrong. Besides, the girl was very worried about the fact that Leon was fighting with the nobles. She and Leon were very worried about him. Leon felt sad about making Chloe nervous. The guy was curious why he was now so easily and casually communicating with her. Then he realized it was because he was no longer weak and Chloe did not worry too much. In the past, he was very angry with his life, so he hurt himself every day. But with the sword, everything changed. Chloe said that the whole school was buzzing about him finding the sacred sword, and that's why he was so strong. When Leon heard those words, he couldn't hold back the tears. They began to flow down his cheeks. Seeing this, Chloe immediately began to calm the guy and said that all this was a rumor. After all, it had been a long time since the appearance of the last sword. Leon said that none of that mattered. The boy thought to himself that no matter how crude and complicated the sword was, it had saved him and pulled him out of the bottomless pit he had dug for himself. 
Emperor Rodrigo's image suddenly began to flounder, not understanding why the atmosphere around him was so gloomy. Everything was fine, after all. El Cid looked at his ward. He did not understand why during the conversation with Chloe the boy suddenly became stronger, even if only for a short time. Leon realized that if he was the hero who would save the world, then El Cid was the hero who saved him. After all, as the wielder of the holy sword, he should have no flaws. So Leon wants to become someone who will surpass El Cid's own expectations. Emperor Rodrigo was also puzzled. How could Leon raise the level of his strength and determination just by talking to the girl? He realized one thing. Now the real training would begin. Suddenly, Leon felt a strange sensation all over his body. He was obviously uncomfortable, and even Chloe noticed it. When Leon was already in his room and resting, he couldn't escape the thought that he really did seem to have changed a lot. Chloe said that even his look became different. The guy began to look forward calmly and not to worry about anything. The girl also noticed that he reminded her of Lion. She asked the question, is there a difference between a person looking up and a person looking down? Leon looked at her with bewilderment. At last, Chloe said that she and Leon needed to talk. The girl said that the blonde guy hardly ever talked to anyone normally, and Leon seemed to like him. The guy was pleased to hear that, so he said he'd do his best to talk. When the guy was alone with himself, he felt ashamed of the promise he had made to Chloe. After all, he would hardly be able to fulfill it. The guy didn't understand how he could be friends with whoever he was scheduled to have his next match with. Leon started practicing early in the morning. He exerted so much effort that another wooden sword shattered into splinters. He was unhappy that the training weapons were wearing out so quickly. Elseed said that regardless of skill level, sword also plays an important role in battles. Training swords are weaker than real swords, so a guy should take that into account. Leon looked at the stump of a wooden sword and said that the most important thing was that the sword should last for one fight. Besides, it was better to use the secret technique only once, because if the same technique was used against a genius like Leon, he would quickly defeat the guy. But now, apart from skill, he could only defeat Leon by reading his moves. El Cid, with a sly smile, suggested that his ward look at Leon's sign. Leon enthusiastically agreed. After reading the stats, Leon realized that his opponent's skills were quite high. He asked his mentor if the blonde could use sword energy. So the last step is to use the aura outside of your body. It turns out Lion is stronger than most instructors, because even the most talented warriors mastered this technique somewhere in their 30s. Leon took another look at the stats and realized that his opponent's strength and speed were higher, but Lion's stamina was inferior to the guy's. Leon realized that the opponent was very strong, but he couldn't afford to lose this battle. El Cid said approvingly that this was not a bad start. The mentor gave the boy some advice. Based on what they had been through, their task now was to defeat their enemy and Leon had every chance to accomplish the task. The boy asked El Cid a question. He wanted to know if something suddenly went wrong and he lost to Lion, what would the spirit of the sacred sword do in that case? El Cid tensed at such a question. He said briefly that he did not want to answer it. Leon asked why the mentor was so embarrassed by the question, but El Cid replied that it was his own test. The mentor irritatedly told Leon that he had warned him at the beginning of training that they had a lot to go through. This fight and the outcome could be the biggest change in the kid's life. So, if a guy wants to know what happens next, he has to defeat Lion. Only then will he hear the words that will make him understand. Without another word, Leon went to practice, and did so until the sun went down. Leon stood near the panoramic window and watched the heavy downpour outside. The man sitting on the sofa said that Leon was so good that he managed to defeat Elmont. It had exceeded his expectations. Lion thought that even Sir Gilbert himself recognized that, though the lad remembered that the last conversation about Leon had been rather unfunny. The man clarified if three years had really passed, after all, to acquire the right people. That's not such a long time. He also noted that Leon had defeated the Count's second son with a body that had no aura. This meant that his potential was not to be doubted. Lion said he got a text from Leon today saying he was ready for their fight. Sir Gilbert was very excited when he heard the news. It meant that things would soon be back to normal. Lion decided that he couldn't let Leon win. He has to show the kid his place. Also, the blonde thought that if he won, he might gain the favor of Chloe, who was always more interested in Leon. The thunderstorm continued, cutting the sky above the Imperial Academy with bright lightning. Leon paced the corridor of the Academy and realized with a smile that everyone seemed to be talking only about him. 
The students whispered that the hero of the Holy Sword was fighting for his future. Leon walked into the sparring room where he was met by the instructor, Helmet. The boy noticed that it was very quiet today. The man said that was Leon's condition. The instructor said that unlike all previous battles, he wanted to fight without prying eyes and focus solely on the battle. Only one observer will be present. Leon immediately wondered who this observer would be and for what purpose he would be there. After all, the instructor would be the judge. Elsid said in a playful voice that it would probably be Chloe. These words infuriated Leon. He shouted at his mentor, asking why he thought it would be her. Elsid replied that he thought so, because Leon thought that there was a special bond between him and the girl. Elsid said the blonde wants to use this match to prove his greatness to her and the guy, as if he was the king and Leon the servant, and there was a conflict between them over a woman. Those words made the guy really angry especially after he remembered Lion's demands to make him his vassal if he lost. Now the reason why Chloe became a watcher was clear. It was a well-thought-out plan, the result of which was known in advance. It was a way of self-assertion at the expense of another. Leon smirked sadly, realizing that his opponent had no pity for anyone, neither Chloe nor him. The boy realized that Lion was indeed a man of blue blood. He was used to subjugating people and playing with them as he pleased. It was a pity that such a hierarchy still existed. Leon was incredibly angry at the realization of what his opponent was like inside. He didn't like it at all. Elsid didn't understand why his ward was so and angry. The boy said only that he was absolutely sure of his actions now. Lion would get a good lesson today. The boys met in the center of the sparring arena. Helmet, the instructor, stood next to them. Lion quipped that Leon was late, to which the guy replied that it was the blonde who had come too early. Leon told his opponent that he knew someone else would be with them, so he wondered where their watcher was. Lion laughed and said he couldn't see it from here. He asked the boy a question. If he lost, would he regret his actions? Leon didn't want to be frank on the battlefield. Therefore, he said that no one knows what will happen in the future. The guy didn't want to stall for long, so he offered the blonde to start the fight right away. But he said to wait a bit. Lion pulled a vial out of his pocket and took out a single pill in the palm of his hand. The blonde man swallowed it immediately, causing Leon to be puzzled. He asked apprehensively, What did he eat? Leon explained that it was a special drug that suppressed the aura. He'd promised he wouldn't use it, but it could manifest itself. And if it did, Leon would lose for sure. Leon didn't like the fact that his opponent was protecting him from his power. The boys took up their fighting stances and prepared for the battle to begin. It was strange. But Leon didn't feel any hostility from his opponent at all. Still he would have to be vigilant. Instructor Helmet announced in a loud voice the start of the sparring session. The boys crossed their swords, thus beginning the battle. Lion began to strike a series of blows and they were so strong that sparks flew from the swords. It was noticeable that the guy spent a lot of time practicing. Leon tensed his whole body, trying to withstand the force of those blows. He realized that if this continued, he wouldn't last 30 seconds. Leon threw a couple more blows. Leon was able to withstand them, but when he tried to swing the sword away, he realized how strong it was. The guy decided to apply Rodrigo's method against Lion, but even with him, his opponent's actions seemed completely unreadable. Leon exhaled and realized that he needed to calm down. The most important thing was to make sense of what was happening after all. It wasn't the first day he had fought the blonde. The boys resumed fighting, trying to knock the sword out of the enemy's hands. Mr. Gilbert, who was watching the battle from the side, watched and couldn't believe that it was really a battle between the students of the academy, especially since they weren't using their aura. Instructor Helmet also marveled at the way these young boys fought. Their depth of swordsmanship and fighting spirit, even compared to the knights, were at a high level. Leon realized that his opponent was just a monster in battle, but he promised himself to cope. Sparks from their swords flew in different directions, and Mr. Gilbert could only stand and wonder. Lion knew that his opponent was a genius, but Leon was fighting almost on par with him, and he was the one who hadn't even mastered the aura. All this time, Leon had been attentive, as El Cid had taught him. But it was only now that he managed to read his opponent's movements. Leon swung his sword and spun around, delivering a series of blows. Lion didn't expect these maneuvers to be successful at all, yet his opponent managed to cut a strand of blonde hair off his head. For some reason, Leon could only make out the blonde's first punch. He assumed Lion had planned to exhaust him physically from the start. It wasn't a bad strategy, but Leon had his own strategy. By persistently defending himself, he managed to reduce his stamina, gradually reducing his opponent's advantage. It was a tactic that didn't forgive mistakes. 
Each time, the feeling of victory grew more and more inside Leon. He had to break his opponent's will or else Leon would never yield to him. Leon noticed that his opponent was about to use the pure law skill. Was he really going to do it here? Its essence was that all attention is focused on the muscles and blood flow, increasing the forces beyond the body. But he had to be careful, as he was not using his aura and risking his life. Leon decided it was a good time to apply acceleration to the maximum. He did so and managed to avoid his opponent's blow. Lion was confused. He didn't understand how his opponent had managed to dodge. Leon managed to bounce back just in time, but the sword still caught his arm, and now it was bleeding profusely. He was surprised that his rival could wield such power without using his aura. El Cid suddenly appeared, confirming the fact that Lion didn't apply aura, since he would have sensed it. The sacred sword spirit explained that the human body could be much faster and stronger than the guy thought. El Cid said that there are different types of training that affect the speed and strength of the body. There are also workouts that affect the strength of the body. He concluded that the boy had a rather narrow horizon of knowledge. Lan again. Lion threw himself at the attack, but his opponent fought it off and smirked, asking if he just wanted to break him with his swordsmanship. The boy realized that Lion seemed to have reached the limit of his power, but he couldn't know that for sure, for El Cid was silent. At the moment, he himself could not accurately determine the limit of his opponent's strength, but it was better to let the spirit not interfere. Leon saw that there were only five to six steps to the edge of the platform. He could push Leon back a little and push him out of bounds. Mr. Gilbert noticed that Leon's mood had changed, but he realized that Leon's level was too high for simple basic attacks. Leon decided that victory would be his. He just needed to calm down a little. He realized that in order to maintain his physical strength, he needed to wait until Lion was exhausted. However, he didn't know the exact time, so he would need to keep a close eye on the enemy. The guy himself felt funny at his own thoughts. Leon clearly realized that all he had to believe in right now was himself and his power. The boy prepared himself for the final maneuvers that would turn the tide of the battle. He hoped that luck would be on his side. Lion caught his opponent's intentions, so he smirked and said he accepted his challenge. Even as he watched Lion use the pure law technique, Leon had no thoughts of giving up. He had clearly decided that he didn't want to be anyone's servant. Mr. Gilbert watched in amazement as his ward used the technique without aura. The man thought that he must have gone beyond his limits long ago. Leon knew there was a huge difference between him and the blonde man. He had sweat and persevered in swinging his sword to become stronger, while his opponent was a born genius. The guys fought without noticing anything around them. They were both putting in as much effort as they could. Eventually, a loud clang was heard and someone's sword shattered into shards. Lion was stunned to see what was left of his sword. The hilt and a small shard of steel. He didn't understand how it had happened. El Cid flew up to Leon and said contentedly that it looked like they hadn't spent so much time practicing for nothing. Leon realized that the skills he had learned from his fights with Elmont's gang had helped him. An unusual sword technique that attacked the upper body adding some power to it. So many swords had been broken during this time, but the training had taken its toll. Leon approached his opponent and said that if he had a real sword in his hands, the results of the battle would have been very different. He smiled dazzlingly and announced to the blonde that he had defeated him. Mr. Gilbert approached the boys, clapping his hands loudly. He said enthusiastically that it had been an exciting fight. The guy didn't have time to answer anything because El Cid flew up to him and asked him what he asked Lion for in case he won. Leon remembered that the enemy had promised to give him anything he wanted as long as it didn't hurt his family and honor. But Elsid the boy had told Elsid that he wouldn't need a reward from Leon. Lion muttered sullenly that he had lost, that he had accepted the boy's challenge too confidently, and now all he had to do was accept the result of his mistake. The blonde man looked at Leon sternly and said a promise is a promise. He asked him what he wanted for his victory. Leon smiled and said he would put off deciding on the award until later. The boy said he wasn't thinking about it right now. Instead, he suggested to the blonde after a while to fight again. Lion's eyes lit up in delight and he gladly accepted the offer. After the battle, walking through the corridors of the academy, Leon clutched his wounded arm and grumbled about Lion swinging his sword a little too much. But then, out of nowhere, Chloe appeared. Her hands glowed brightly and she used healing light. The girl asked to let the wounded man rest and heal him. After a moment, the wound on Leon's arm quickly healed. The boy said in surprise that the girl was incredibly strong since she possessed the healing magic of the fourth level, but the girl did not react to the praise. On the contrary, 
She was angry and shouted that she didn't understand him or Lion. She put Leon in a stupor by asking the question, how could they fight against each other? Chloe was incredibly sad. She could hardly hold back her tears, asking the boy if he was going to leave the academy because he had become so strong. Leon asked why she thought that, to which the girl replied that she was not stupid and yet she knew the guy quite well. The guy's always been like that. Challenge those who were much stronger. Others said it was impossible, but he still won in the end. However, the girl had noticed that now it took him longer to defeat his opponent. Leon said lightly that he thought it was relatively fast because the difficulty level was very high. The girl nodded and said that he had done well. This conversation really amused the boys and they couldn't contain their laughter. Leaving, Leon said they were done fighting so she could go ahead and hit Leon for him. The girl let that barb pass her ears, but asked if the blonde man needed to be healed. Lion, though he doesn't show it, is very stressed about his failures. So in Leon's opinion, a spanking from his girlfriend might bring him to his senses. The guy says he thinks this defeat won't stop him and the blonde will become even stronger. In the meantime, he asked the girl to take care of him. Chloe was disturbed by Leon's words. She asked him what he was going to do after leaving the academy. As he left, the guy said it would remain his little secret. The girl was really very worried about her friend, so she bowed her head and offered a prayer to the Almighty for him. El Cid cheerfully remarked that it was the first time he saw a wizard who did not believe in God praying for others. Leon said that Chloe is really an amazing person. Leon told El Cid that the spirit must have been eager to find a special person. El Cid stared at the boy with incomprehension. He explained that for years he had been desperately trying to become stronger, but it was all going downhill. The wall of status and talent seemed impossible to overcome, Dot. He struggled with feelings of abandonment all the time, but the encounter with the spirit changed everything. This fateful encounter helped him to overcome himself and become stronger, which in turn brought him out of the shadows. And now Leon is about to become a hero. After all, in his opinion, no one in this world was as special as a hero. Hearing this, Elseed laughed and called the boy a snob. Leon thought the spirit was disappointed in him, but he replied that he thought it was normal to want to be a hero. The mentor said that if you work hard and don't give up halfway, you can achieve anything you desire. Desire is the power that proves humanity. Elseed shocked Leon by telling him that the hero was not originally supposed to be him, but his rival Lion. The spirit said that the blonde man's full name was Lion Callum Gladius von Clyde. That meant that he belonged to the imperial family of Clyde, and the sword had to go to him. Leon realized that his rival would make the perfect hero. He couldn't believe that the glory Lion was supposed to enjoy had gone to him. Leon irritatedly asked if this match was a test. Elseed nonchalantly said that it was, but the guy did a great job with it. The spirit of the sacred sword said that whoever becomes a hero without any prophecies will discover his own path, and it will happen through his own willpower and determination, not status. Leona turned around and saw that Chloe had slapped the blonde on the cheek after all. Elsid in turn said that Leon was wrong. That's why the sword didn't choose him. The mentor asked Leon if he felt guilty about taking his chance. The boy turned away from the spirit and said he didn't know the answer to that question. Leon winked and said they were all on equal footing now. Why would he feel guilty for a guy who was too arrogant? It was stupid, so he didn't feel guilty. Leon surprised Elseed when he said that rather it was his opponent who should feel guilty for being defeated, especially since the spirit of the great hero Rodrigo, the holy sword Elseed, has chosen him. So he has no time for nonsense now. Elseed nodded approvingly. He liked the boy's attitude. The next morning, Leon applied for expulsion from the academy. He decided to leave the place and become an adventurer. His mentor didn't want to say goodbye to him and gave him a letter of recommendation instead of a diploma. The fight between him and Elmont's gang was an incentive for the rest of the commoners to not be afraid to manifest and for the aristocrats to become stronger without the use of potions. The boy was glad that he had given hope for a better future, but he would not return to this academy again. A new story was beginning. Leon was on his way to Blaine, a free town where adventurers gather. Leon's path passed through a dense, dark forest that was frightening in its mystery and inhabitants. Once in that place, all the guy wanted to do was get out of the woods and finally arrive in the city. Seeing the outline of Blaine seemed incredibly distant. It had been half a month since Leon had left the academy. He was anxious to get into a comfortable bed and get some rest. Elseed rolled his eyes and said that the forest wasn't scary at all. The boy should be grateful that the spirit had trained his stamina very well. 
Leon said ironically that he really wouldn't have survived without Elsie's help, but the boy really was grateful to the spirit. Half a month ago, he and Leon had entered this forest to shortcut their way to Blaine. It had been scary and unfamiliar at first, especially since they were attacked by goblins at times. The boy realized that if it hadn't been for Elseed and his training at the academy, he wouldn't be alive now. Leon even managed to use the holy sword when they were attacked by a gang of goblins. All those days in the forest, it was as if he had been retrained and trained by Elseed. And though it took the lad a long time to deal with the danger in his mentor's opinion, those goblins had a decent amount of trouble. Leon became so strong that he destroyed everyone who posed a threat to him in ten seconds. The boy realized that he had definitely become stronger than before he entered this forest. There was only one thought in his mind now, to fight the new monsters. Elsied marveled at how motivated his charge was. The mentor said he should wait a little longer because he was inexperienced. He needs to gain experience to fill his glass to the brim, and no matter how much he pours in, his power will grow. Alcide threatened that if the glass was empty, there would be no effect. Leon said he would heed the spirit's instruction. Leon was very close to his destination. The city of Blaine was a small, beautiful place fortified by two rows of fortress walls. The boy had no trouble getting through the guards near the city gate, showing his academic ticket. The streets of the city were crowded and beautifully decorated with colorful flags. There was an atmosphere of coziness and anticipation of adventure. Elsid Blaine was clearly not pleased. He said the town sucked. He said there were dozens of people like him 300 years ago. The spirit said this town was small and not small, and Blaine itself was filthy with rabble everywhere. Leon said that wasn't the main thing right now. They needed to reach the guild first. He thought it was best to register now rather than later. Elsid asked if the guy really wanted to join there. After all, he had said he wanted to be an adventurer, and compared to them, the guild had a very narrow range of actions. The guy said he needed training first, so he would go to a guild and take monster slaying quests. Elsid wasn't very supportive of the decision, but decided he would be patient, after all. There was plenty of time before his seal was released. In the forest, aside from battles, Lion learned a lot from Elsid. Since the sword fell a year earlier than planned, much of his power was sealed away. Originally, the main purpose of the sword was to prepare the wearer's body for immortality, giving him immense strength in return. The sword could make a guy an invincible hero. The aura would strengthen his skills and body. Leon realized that right now he needed to learn how to use his sword fluently. That would require an aura, so he should work on improving his skills. While the boy was thinking, he did not notice how he reached the beautiful building to which his path lay. He changed his mind about going to the guild and decided to register as an adventurer. Leon signed the necessary papers and was accepted. The girl who accepted the documents said they were confirming his training at the academy and accepting a letter of recommendation from Sir Helmut. As an adventurer, he would be able to start at rank D. Leon was surprised that he was given this rank, but the girl reassured him, saying that if he followed the rules, he would quickly reach the C rank. The girl said that in order to be promoted, he had to prove his aura skills. After all, its use is the minimum condition for promotion. Also, Leon learned that in addition to simple use, the aura control must be at a level where a sword covered in aura could cut stones and break steel. Leon was shocked. He realized that even with high skills, he would only be at the middle rank. He had no idea what kind of strength he would need to reach the highest rank. As Leon stepped away from the girl, the Elsid said in surprise that this was a very interesting organization. The mentor noticed how many different times there were in the building. The boy looked up and was surprised too. There were elves, werewolves, and other strange creatures nearby. Elsid marveled that those who were feuding with each other 300 years ago had decided to unite. The spirit said that the man who created the organization was pretty good. They were distracted from these thoughts by a girl who told them that the registration process was complete. If the guy wanted to officially start working, he had to accept one request for free. Leon was confused by this sentence. But the girl said that being an adventurer means having a guild certificate. And in the beginning, a guy has to prove that he can be an adventurer. Elsid muttered to an annoyed Leon that not everything came easy. The free inquiry brought Leon to a not-so-nice place, a city sewer with stinky sewage. There he had to fight a horde of vicious creatures. Trying hard not to get killed, Leon realized that today was the first time he was seriously fighting with a sword. Elsid noticed that before his swordsmanship was always one-on-one. -on -one. Now, however, the guy's field of vision had to be turned towards several enemies. Mentor said that there was no better practice than fighting wild flying monsters. 
Leon remarked with a nervous smile that that was exactly what he was doing. Elsid commented with a clever look that the mission Leon had chosen was to clean the sewers, so that's what he's forced to do now. While fighting the overgrown rats, Leon noticed that one of them had a horn. He asked Elsid what it was. The spirit replied that it looked like the rat man had evolved. He explained that monsters also go through evolution. There are some that gain abilities when they absorb a lot of resources. Elsid said that these horns prove the fact that rats who have them have special abilities. The bigger the horn, the stronger the rat man became. They were very dangerous creatures. Leon asked the mentor to tell him what ability the rat man who stood in front of them had. Instead of answering, the mentor said it would be a good idea to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. The guy realized that he wouldn't wait for an answer, so he prepared his divine weapon to fight a new, dangerous opponent. Leon swung around with gusto and demanded the rat man give him his horn. When the guy had dealt with all the sewer rat overgrowth, he came to the adventurer's building and threw a bag of severed tails on the table in front of the girl. The girl exclaimed that it was just unbelievable because the guy brought 23 kilograms of tails in his bag. Smirking, Leon said, referring to the 230 rats he was able to overpower. Also, the guy threw rat horns on the table. He said he'd seen 200 of them, but had only caught four. He asked if he could sell them. The red-haired Miss Lee was confused, but answered in the affirmative. She placed his fee in front of the guy, 13 silver and 50 copper coins. It was more than Leon had expected. Miss Lee explained that rat horns were quite expensive and in high demand. The girl said that Leon was the first to be able to complete his mission so well. She was very surprised. Miss Lee added that it would surprise her even more if the guy had managed to bring a live rat catcher here. She said dreamily that she hoped Leon could subdue all three evolutionary species. The girl assumed he was just as good with his aura. The boy looked away and scratched the top of his head in silence. He didn't say he hadn't mastered it yet. Miss Lee congratulated Leon on being registered as an official D-level adventurer from this day forward. She reached for a small box. Opening it, she showed the plate and said that the seal on it symbolized the free city of Blaine. The boy asked if he could use her in any way he wanted. Miss Lee answered in the affirmative. However, she added that if he was below rank B, his mission parameters would be changed to second priority. The girl explained that this is a measure to prevent people who only look for lucrative missions. Leon looked at the plate in his hands and realized that he was no longer a student of the Academy, and this thing proved that he was an adventurer. In parting, Miss Lee added that if a guy had a special request he wanted to go through, let him let her know. Even if the payment is small, she will try to help. When Leon had already left the building, Elseed told him that the lady behind the counter seemed to have mistaken him for the strongest hero. The boy asked, embarrassed, wondering why she would think that. The spirit explained that the guy had no money or fame. He volunteered for a difficult mission. Since ancient times, heroes don't reveal their identity until people themselves consider the person with the hero. Alcide said that they would soon find out if the boy could be a hero. Leon replied that he didn't need the extra attention. The spirit said that no one knows what will happen next. Maybe decades from now, the guy would become a legend in this guild and would be talked about like a hero from a book. Come to think of it, Leon was happy with a future as a general favorite. The main thing is that it should be good for people. The lad told Elsid that he would stay in Blaine for a while anyway, for it was not a bad chance to pump up his abilities. Leon decided that he would leave the adventurers once he reached rank B. He wondered how long it would take. Elsid, with certainty, said that a hundred days would be quite enough for the lad. His mentor said he would train him for six months with intensified sessions, because the sooner he gets stronger, the better. The spirit said that the fact that his apprentice was catching rats in the sewers was a great blow to his pride. The boy disagreed because he thought it was a normal part-time job. Elsid said that Leon must become strong enough to defeat even a dragon if need be. Leon was infuriated by his mentor's overly demanding nature. He asked if he had missed too many ranks. Elsid said that the boy had now fully learned the skills he had been given. But he needs to become stronger in battles. After all, by defeating monsters, he will be able to absorb and accumulate their strength. He remembered that the spirit had told him before about the connection between aura and monsters, but before that, he had thought that the fastest way to develop aura was to take potions. Elsid added that in fact, anyone could absorb the monster's power and turn it into their own aura, but the nobles and royalty hid it for their own benefit. The new knowledge motivated Leon to become even stronger, but even if you devour a thousand rats, it won't be enough. He must hunt stronger monsters. The mentor said that once the guy gets used to it,
he'll be able to hunt even dragons. After all, a holy sword isn't some scavenger who's always cleaning rats out of sewers. When Leon came out of the sewers, he asked Elseed to use the purification ability. The spirit didn't seem to like using his powers for such matters very much. The boy asked why it was so important for the spirit to start hunting dragons. Elsid answered, because their next target is the Mountains of the Titans. Leon was shocked by this statement. After all, not even dragons could enter this place. It was a land ruled by a titan. The boy asked why a spirit would head to a place it had failed to conquer. El Cid replied briefly that it would do him good. It was true that Emperor Rodrigo's body was there, which the spirit had neglected to mention. Instead, he suggested that he set a goal of getting there within six months. Leon thought seriously, for this was quite a dangerous place, but Elsid said he could handle it. After some thought, Leon said that he trusted Elsid. He replied that in that case, the infernal training would start right away. Upon entering the adventurer's building, Leon faced ridicule. They called him a cat and asked him if he was going to kill rats today. The others whispered, asking each other, is such a young fellow really a cat? They said he killed hundreds of rats every day. Leon had become quite popular due to the fact that he hunted rat folk too often. Now he had the nickname Cat. When he brought in the bag of tails, Miss Lee asked if there wasn't enough prey today. Leon replied that he hardly ever saw any rats now, and that they were fewer in number. It was as if they were afraid of him. The girl said that rats are not that smart because intelligence is not their thing. The boy didn't comment on that but asked to see other tasks. Thoughts excitedly laid out four sheets of paper in front of Leon and said that there were four special orders. Leon perused each case and noticed one very old order. Elsid said the guy made a pretty interesting choice, since the pay isn't that great. But Leon was adamant that he wanted to choose this particular case. The point of the mission was to destroy the stone slime. It lived near the underground passage of the wall. This creature gnawed on the stones, and if it was not destroyed, the strength of the fortress would sag. The boy looked at the customer's count and saw that it was the Knights of Blaine. Now it was clear to him why they paid so little. As the lad approached the wall of the fortress, the knight asked in surprise if he had responded to their request. The boy asked where the stone slime was, and said he had received an official request from the guild, but the guard was in no hurry to answer. A man standing behind him asked, Is Leon the cat? The same adventurer who cleared the sewers of rats? The boy nodded affirmatively. The knight smiled broadly and said that there should be more adventurers like him in this city. The man complained that there were such weak adventurers now that there was no use for them. It was ridiculous to call such helpers for help. The knight said that depending on his progress, he might even increase the reward. Leon realized that it wouldn't be easy. Leon walked into the underground passages of the fortress and didn't notice anything special. So far, it was just muddy, but the floor was very slippery, so it would be hard to move and keep his body balance. Elsid said cheerfully that it was the perfect workout for the legs. Suddenly, with his side vision, Leon noticed some movement. They were three glowing green spheres that moved smoothly down the corridor. The boy thought it was too easy, but the mentor said that if it was just an ordinary slime, the knights wouldn't hire adventurers. It did. A moment later, the slime manifested and attacked Leon, throwing a rock at him. The boy managed to dodge, but the force of the blow was staggering. One green sphere flew straight at the guy, so Leon swung his sword and struck. However, the slime repelled the blow so that the sword simply bounced off the green body. Now Leon understood why these creatures were called stone slime. Elseed, as always, started to get smart, saying that his opponent's weak point was the core. If this core is broken, the slime will be destroyed, regardless of what abilities it possesses. But the stone slimes were different. They stored countless stones inside them. This creates an impenetrable armor around the core. It was a very elaborate method of defense so the new adventurer had a difficult task on his shoulders. Elsid explained that blunt weapons would not penetrate the slime. Only the sharpest sword or arrow could pierce it. The weapon must be sharp enough to cut through rocks. The mentor assured me that these monsters were difficult to defeat with weapons alone. After those words, the green spheres began spewing out rocks, aiming at Leon. The guy swung his sword relentlessly, trying to fend off the attack. Elsid said that the monsters realized that the guy won't be able to fend off all the attacks so they aim for vital organs. The mentor asked to analyze the monsters. Leon listed that the distance at which the slimes start firing is five meters. There is a slight delay between shots. The guy realized that if he could get close enough, he'd be able to land a couple of attacks. The main problem was that he might not be able to penetrate the defenses. There had to be some way to cut through the core while avoiding attacks. 
Else had prompted, watching the movements and flying stones, one would have to have time to pierce the slime's body with the holy sword. But the main difficulty was that you would have to dodge the attacks of these creatures as quickly and efficiently as possible. Leon had already imagined how his opponents would spectacularly be blown to pieces. Guy asked Elseed, in his opinion, could he penetrate the core? The mentor replied that it can only be done when the slime creates an opening to fire. For a moment, the flow of stones inside the monster stops. The mentor said that this is the moment when the opponent becomes vulnerable. With the guy's skills, it would be the perfect moment to attack. Leon grudgingly asked why the spirit had taken so long to explain. The guy took a fighting stance and decided he was obligated to tackle this mission. He rushed to attack the first slimy monster and hit right on target, destroying the core from the middle. There was no room for error. Every second counted because the monsters could read the guy's movements from the vibrations of the floor. Leon realized that he needed to use a stepping technique to reach his enemies almost imperceptibly. Leon began to cautiously move closer to the slime, but he didn't manage to get halfway across before a torrent of rocks came crashing down on him. The guy clenched his teeth with all his might and tried to endure this unexpected attack. When he finally opened his eyes, he saw that the nearest monster had prepared to attack, which meant he had discovered his weak point. Using this perfect moment to attack, Leon rushed forward and pointed his sword at the right place. The guy hit the target. He punctured the core and his opponent shattered into several stinking green piles. As Leon tried to scrub his face clean of the slime, Elseed said he never thought the guy would do that. Seeing the incomprehension on the guy's face, the spirit explained that he was referring to a trick performed with his feet that had reached level two. The guy was able to keep his balance on flat ground. Reducing the sound of the movements is just the basics. Elsid said you have to learn to adapt on any surface, whether it's ice or burning platinum. According to the spirit, the point of footwork is for the guy to be able to use the environment as his own territory in peace. Leon listened interestedly to the fact that such power was useful and that an unfavorable environment could be changed and to one's own benefit. Elsid noticed that the first Leon got lucky, but he spread his legs wide, apparently deciding to lower his center of gravity. Thus, he left a standing position from which he could easily dodge and attack from different directions. The mentor clarified that if the environment changes, Leon's posture should also become different. Leon was surprised to hear that the poses he used originally were more suited to flat open areas. Else had clarified that in this situation, he was in a place with wet ground and a low ceiling, which meant adjusting his posture. The boy corrected the position of his body and noticed that he was indeed much more comfortable. Elsid nodded approvingly, saying that feeling his body was the best training. The mentor said that for the best training, the guy needs to stop dodging. He needs to learn how to take a punch while minimizing the damage. Elsid advised to try taking the punch as if he wanted to block it but couldn't. Leon didn't understand how using such tactics could be successful. Elsid continued to describe the tactics, which meant not to try to attack, but to hold out for a certain amount of time. Also, one could not chop if there were less than three enemies. Leon shouted irritably that the demon sword wanted him dead. Elseed, on the other hand, shouted that it was all for the boy to gain experience and get used to fighting. While Leon was yelling at Elseed, asking why everything was so difficult, more green monsters were coming towards them. On the surface, the knights waited for Leon to come out. It had been three weeks since the beginning of his mission. Today he had been in the dungeon for over ten hours. At first, the knights did not believe in the success of the young adventurer and thought it was another failure. However, he started coming out with a full bag of slime every time. The men were shocked, for stone slimes are not easy to defeat. When the men heard footsteps approaching, they waited curiously for the lad to appear. Today, Leon was carrying two full bags of slime. Leon said that today was the last day of his work. The men stared at him, not believing the monsters were gone. Smiling, Leon said that the slimes wouldn't bother them anymore. He added that they grow very slowly so it would be clear for a while. The guy threw a bag of slime in front of the knights saying it was the last batch. As he left he asked them to contact the Adventurer's Guild to confirm the completion of the task. As Leon moved away from the knights, Elseed said that all the power he had gained while mopping up the slugs should be used to activate the aura. Sitting up in his bed, Leon twitched with impatience for this was coming sooner than he had planned. At first the guy thought that destroying stone slimes would take him longer. After all, they are magical monsters. But thanks to Elsid's training, he made it through in a short period of time. The mentor appreciated it, saying that their schedule had shifted by almost a month. That was impressive. Elsid said that the guy had built up enough strength and now it was time to start using the aura. 
Leon said firmly that he was ready to start training. The boy remembered that the descendants of noble families like Lion were given the power of aura from birth. They nourished their bodies with potions, building a foundation for it. Aura development was more difficult for ordinary people to access. So much for the class difference. LC decided to clarify one important point. Not everyone survives during purification and opening of aura channels. This news greatly disturbed Leon. He didn't want to die without mastering his aura. The mentor reassured the boy, saying that the magic he had absorbed as well as the holy sword would not allow this to happen. Spirit said they would protect his vital organs and vessels. They would heal them at the same time so everything should go well. However, there would be pain. The spirit of the holy sword threatened that if the guy lost consciousness, the purification wouldn't work. It was up to him to awaken the aura. El Cid glared, starting an irreversible process. Leon stared in surprise at the multitude of swords made of light. One of them went straight into the guy's back. The sensation took his breath away. A cry of pain burst out of Leon. Blood spurted from his mouth in different directions. The holy sword launched discharges of lightning at Leon, which made the guy's body wriggle in pain. The guy was in a semi-conscious state and could not come out of it. All he could do now was clench his teeth and try with all his might not to pass out. Watching the guy's collapsed body, Elcid said he should be able to withstand ten swords. The mentor was sure that the boy would be able to endure the agony, and then his aura would awaken. After a while, Leon finally opened his eyes. He could feel this flow inside him circulating throughout his body. A powerful force was moving within him. He had the feeling that he had become stronger than everyone else. It seemed as if he could roll mountains. Elcid frowned at the excited boy. He said it was only an illusion, and he didn't have his full power yet. Emperor Rodrigo was watching all of this and found the guy quite amusing. Given that he had managed to awaken his aura so early, the sword spirit thought that he had made the right choice regarding the boy. However, the emperor had a dissatisfied face. Rodrigo was obviously not quite in agreement with the spirit. For him, the hero's strength came first, not his aspirations and desires. However, the spirit reminded him that everything the emperor did didn't follow through to the end result. He hadn't even used his power to display the holy sword. The sword spirit reminded him that he was Rodrigo's holy hero and Leon was his successor. So it was time for him to stop interfering and quietly observe them. El Cid muttered that he had expected Leon to only be able to withstand five swords. All they've managed to do so far is open the aura channels. Now they had to undergo a hell of a lot of training to use it properly. Right now, Leon was only at the beginning of a long journey. Leon nodded, confirming that he knew all of this. And yet, he had the feeling that his physical abilities hadn't changed. He merely felt a flow in and around his body as if his nervous system had gone beyond him. Elsid said that right now the guy could feel his aura. If he manages to concentrate, he can control it. Leon's eyes lit up. He realized that this was a skill he wanted to master. Elsid stopped the boy, thinking it necessary to repeat the basics of using aura. He reminded him that the aura had an individual attribute. The spirit explained that most often it is one of the five elements. Wood, fire, earth, iron, water. But the boy was lucky with his aura, as it was different. Leon became alarmed and asked his mentor to explain what his words meant. Elsid said that his aura has the attribute of the sun. It is light and fire. Leon was quite surprised to hear that this supreme attribute represented justice. The guy was very happy about this news because justice is his main value, which he strives to protect. Also, the legendary great hero had this attribute. Sighing, Elsid said that they needed to summarize before they started the main part of the training. The mentor showed statistics that were very different from last time. The guy's stamina increased and many skills improved, as well as his aura. Leon was shocked that he hadn't started training yet, and his aura was already at level 3. Elsid attributed it to the fact that the guy used acceleration before he awakened his aura. He could also use aura senses, and that's within the first two levels. The mentor said that because of these factors, when he awakened his aura, his battle body had reached level two. This meant that one could start learning how to use a sword. Leon couldn't contain his joy. At last, he could learn Rodrigo's swordsmanship. With happy twinkles in his eyes, Leon asked if they would start today. Elsid replied that Leon had not yet fully recovered. Before they began training, the spirit felt it was important to tell them that their enemies had appeared in the city. He said he didn't know exactly where they were, but he could clearly feel their aura. The mentor mentioned that since Leon is a future hero, he should be able to deal with his detractors. El Cid said that from time to time, the heroes defended the world from monsters and bandits. 
Leon wondered who had come to the city. The spirit replied that it didn't matter now. If a guy wants to, he can call them minions of the devil. But, in order to fight them, the spirit of the holy sword recommended to gain strength. Leon objected, offering to take the risk. He was determined to be a hero. El Cid said that it seemed that the enemies had been lying low for some time, for he could not feel them now. But he supposed that in about two months they would begin to move. So for now, they will keep practicing and afterward they will fight back against their enemies. His mentor informed him that from now on, Leon would know his true purpose. To do so, he will go through a sea of blood and hatred. At dawn, Leon went to the adventurer's guild building. There, Miss Lee told him that she had received a message from the guards on the wall and the mission was completed. But the boy made her nervous because he hadn't shown up in four days. The girl squinted at him and said she sensed a change in him. Leon replied briefly that he had accomplished a lot by killing monsters. Miss Lee was delighted by his words. She happily said that now there was definitely a reason to celebrate her boyfriend's promotion. The boy stared at the girl in disbelief. He asked her what she meant. Miss Lee held out her palm with the new plate to him and congratulated Leon on receiving his rank. Leon was surprised that he had gotten a new rank so quickly and without any checks. It was unusual. Miss Lee said he received positive feedback after hunting rat folk and stone slugs, so the thank you letters helped him reach a new rank. Leon was pleased with the fact that he was promoted after only two assignments. El Cid was pleased too. After all, the new rank meant Leon would be able to take more complex orders and that would make it easier to find evil. Miss Lee confirmed that Leon can take C-rank assignments from this day forward. While the guy was choosing the tasks, Miss Lee thought about how the guy was completely different from other adventurers. Looking at the red-haired girl, the spirit thought that she had a powerful divine power and light aura. Leon asked his mentor to comment on the assignments. He said that there were a couple of them that would be suitable for training, but nothing unusual. The boy asked El Cid if they should concentrate on training then. This aroused the girl's interest because she had not seen Leon's interlocutor and thought that he was talking to himself. She offered to help the guy with the choice because she noticed that he was interested in tasks with a lot of monsters. The guy denied it. After thinking about it, Leon asked if they had any slum-related assignments. He'd heard that not everyone was up for that. This question gave the girl a real shock. She asked if the boy was in his right mind. Slums are said to be places where poor people live, but Blaine's slum was different. In this city, the slums were the territory of thieves, fugitives, smugglers, murderers, and illegal criminals. Leon was sure that in this place he could find what he was looking for. The girl replied that there were no slum-related assignments at the moment. She told me that it had long been mostly mercenaries rather than adventurers working there. Adventurers never got into conflict with humans and almost all they did in the slums was fight. Leon couldn't become a mercenary due to certain restrictions, and hanging around the slums without a specific purpose was a dangerous endeavor. The boy was distracted from his musings by Miss Lee. She placed an assignment on the table in front of him, inviting him to examine it. Leon read that the Order's mission was to destroy the living armor in an abandoned house. Miss Lee explained that this assignment had been lying with them for a very long time. The decorative armor lying around in the abandoned house had turned into a monster, a living armor. The girl said that although the reward was small, just a couple of people in this city could destroy this monster. The guy thought that he had a holy sword and it wouldn't be a big problem for him. The decisive factor was that the girl had specified that the mansion was near the slums. This information should help him get around that area. Leon has made a final decision. Thanks to this assignment, he will be able to enter the slums. And even if the power of the slums is strong, they won't clash with the Adventurer Guild. Leon decided that if someone from those places attacked a weak adventurer, higher-ranked adventurers would surely come. Guy thanked Miss Lee for the assignment he found and said he owed her a favor. The girl smiled back and said it was her job. It felt good to help the guy. After a few minutes, she handed him a pouch of money. It was payment for clearing the fortress of stone slimes. The amount was not small as the platoon commander decided to increase the fee a bit for a job well done. At last, Leon turned to the red-haired girl with a question. She looked up with interest. The guy asked her to tell him where Blaine's church was located. The question took the girl by surprise. She widened her eyes in fear. She asked the guy exactly what he meant. Leon waved it off, saying he had something to look at. Miss Lee was clearly taken aback by the question the boy asked. Leon squinted, watching the girl. If Elsid was right and she really did think he was a new hero, he would need the help of the Holy Order. There are exceptions when an ordinary church can be used, and no one has the right to desecrate this cloister. Regardless of a person's background, 
The rules will be the same for everyone. The Knights of the Iron Chain live by the same rules. Miss Lee responded that the church is in the Prima neighborhood to the northeast. The building is number 13. Leon thanked and left. The girl was still in shock. She realized that if the hero was looking for a denomination, it meant that a stronger enemy had appeared somewhere. Her nerves literally made her fall off her feet. She lamented that she had been stupid because being a guild worker, she hadn't realized it right away. Walking through the city, the boy listened to Elseed's musings on how this was the most effective way to not reveal identities. Rank D hero. Now a rank C adventurer, that would arouse suspicion. From this monologue, Leon realized that he needed to hide his identity right now. If the guild found out anything about him, he would be in trouble. So the guy decided that his mentor was right and he should go to church for the sake of appearances. Only in extreme cases he could use some of his abilities. In addition, Elsid's seal has yet to be fully revealed. So in order to claim the title of Holy Sword Wielder, Leon needs to hone his skills and abilities. The guy asked the mentor, Is living armor a monster in armor that can move? The mentor replied that it wasn't exactly like that. He explained that living armor was a rare natural phenomenon. It contained the power of magic or sorcery, or they had been led to believe that they could move. They can't think for themselves, it's just a piece of hardware that does someone else's bidding. Leon suggested that in that case, the creator could simply remove his spell. Elsid replied that it wouldn't make any sense. After all, removing the spell was the same as destroying his creation. It was simply unprofitable. Leon sighed, saying that wizards were useless, but right now he didn't care who was behind it. He glanced at the assignment sheet Miss Lee had given him and read that the armor was silver-plated. Elseed said that if the task was so simple, it would have been neutralized long ago. The problem would have been solved sooner if the armor had been simple. The guy anxiously realized that this meant that the armor regeneration ability was high. The guy imagined that if you broke him from helmet to gaiters, he'd recover in ten minutes. He continued the battle unharmed. Leon concluded that mere weapons would not defeat this foe. Elsid nodded in agreement, asking the guy if he really thought the armor was made of ordinary metal. The guy said irritably that they wouldn't know until they reached the target, so moving out was necessary now. When it was already dark, Leon and Elsid came to the slum. It was a busier place than the guy thought. There were all sorts of people here. Leon said that upon entering this street, he felt an unpleasant sensation. He asked the spirit if there were enemies following him. Elsid replied that if his detractors were around, he would have said so right away, though he had some guesses as to why the boy felt it. Alcide said it was because of Ossens. Solar Aura is more sensitive to the Dark Aura, and since Leon is too young-looking, everyone is looking at him and exploring. The evil aura of these people envelops the guy, and it makes him feel strange. Leon shivered and said that now he felt even worse. He explained that he felt like he had small needles all over his body. The mentor advised him to be careful. Elsid explained that all those evil auras wouldn't hurt the guy, but some of them could be dangerous. In these places, people are wary of strangers. For now, Leon just needs to focus on the task at hand and pay attention. Leon stopped in front of a dark, gloomy building with black crows circling above it. This was their destination. Not a sound could be heard through the blown-out windows. That's where the living armor lived. The armor stood, covered in dust. They sensed that someone was approaching, so they waited for the uninvited guest to appear. He entered the building but saw nothing but desolation. It was gloomy and covered in dust and cobwebs. It was dark all around, so the holy sword came in handy as it shone with a bright light. Leon thanked Elsid enthusiastically and said that it was very handy. The spirit did not appreciate the boy's joy and advised him to take a flashlight next time because people should not see his sword. Leon promised that next time he would pack his things more carefully and be sure to take a flashlight. Suddenly, the first living armor emerged from the darkness and viciously pointed their weapons at Leon. The eyes of this monster glittered brightly, marking the one who would be its new victim. Leon assessed his opponent with a glance and noticed that he was holding a halberd. It was his first time facing an opponent who used such a weapon. Swinging in, Leon's opponent can deliver slashing blows, stab through, or simply chop from the shoulder. But a far more important factor was that they were separated by a distance of two meters. To cover that distance, Leon needs to step a few steps while his enemy fills it only with the length of his weapon. The monster lunged, swung his weapon, and attacked the guy. With the help of the Holy Sword, Leon managed to repel the attack. He realized that such advantages could only work if the monster had a wielder. Leon struck and crushed his opponent's weapon. He realized that with hollow armor weighing 20, 30 kilograms, no matter how powerful the halberd was, the enemy would not be able to crush the guy. 
The guy was content to make this pile of armor pay for shortening the distance with his own feet. Leon struck again and clipped the halberd's handle. Next, the guy threw a series of blows to different places. After that, the armor started falling off like a child's toy. Elsid was also impressed with the work he had done. He wondered if the guy had used acceleration. After all, aside from the chaotic motion of the sword, it was pretty good. Leon said that, however, he had taken down his opponent in just a couple of seconds. And it was all thanks to the fact that he had mastered his aura and was now able to wield his sword more freely. Looking at the pile of lying armor, the guy remembered that the report said that even if you shattered the armor, it would revive. Leon recalled that he had heard that such individuals had a high regeneration ability, but so far, he had not observed this monster's regeneration. Alcide suggested that maybe the information was wrong. The boy shouted that it couldn't be, because false reporting was considered a second-degree felony by the Guild. If there are fatalities due to untruthful information, the Guild will be the first to set a reward for catching the person who gave incorrect information. Something was bothering Leon. He wondered if there was anyone who would take such a risk just to avoid disciplinary action. The guy analyzed the situation and realized that it seemed strange to him from the very beginning. Let the living armor is an unpleasant opponent, but if the team will act correctly, it will destroy it. Elsid was going over all of this in his head and nothing came to mind. He thought that maybe there were some special differences between the species. Leon offered to catch a few more to check. Alcide remarked that there was no need to go far, for the enemies seemed to be advancing on their own. As he peered into the darkness, the boy did indeed see several pairs of glowing eyes. The monsters were approaching with purpose. It was hard to recognize anything in such darkness, so Leon asked Elcide to add some light. He resented it, saying that a holy sword was not a torch. The sword shone even brighter, but not a blinding light, but a noble light that doesn't cut the eyes. The glow made the living armor begin to scream and cover their eyes in an attempt to avoid the light. Leon watched in bewilderment as his enemies squirmed at the sight of his holy sword. He wondered what was wrong with them, but after a moment, gathering their strength, the living armor once again made an attempt to attack the guy. This time, the monsters attacked Leon with the whole crowd, forcing Leon to fend off the blows one by one. Though he could guess the direction of their blows, the attacks themselves were perfectly executed. But the guy successfully chopped down one armor after another. It wasn't real military might, for their blows were executed as if by textbook. Leon performed blow after blow, reducing the numbers of these monsters. As suddenly, Elsid distracted him and told him that the creatures coming at him were not living armor. There were several living armors looming, but they were unusual. There was a strange otherworldly glow emanating from them. Mentor said to use the essence contemplation technique to realize who was in front of him. Now he could see him through the eyes of these monsters and everything would become clear to him. Just as Elsid said, it wasn't just armor. Inside it were intimidating skeletons that seemed to be burning from within with red flames. The boy didn't understand what kind of smoke was coming from them. Elsid explained that this smoke is a kind of death breath that sucks out life energy if it touches the body. Mentor said that the solar aura could withstand but one shouldn't expect anything good from coming into contact with these monsters. Leon asked if that was why those things had such a reaction to his sword. Elsid said he was only half right. After all, if they encountered the normal death breath inside the armor, the light of the holy sword would brush it away without leaving a trace. But only demonic creatures could have such an aversion to the holy sword. The sword spirit announced that something called phantom armor was in front of them. The number of them makes the guy's position difficult. The armor is haunted by spirits that have lost their peace, and their emptiness has turned to anger toward the living. Leon realized that this armor would be difficult to break. It was invulnerable until the malice of the evil spirit inside it wore off. Even if you forcefully destroy its shell, it will be reborn again and again. The only way to subdue the phantom armor completely is to break the connection between the spirits and the armor with the power of the aura. Fortunately, Leon possessed the ultimate holy weapon, the holy sword. But the amount of phantom armor was putting the guy in a quandary. So if it really was armor imbued with evil spirits, it would be more advantageous to retreat and continue the battle during the day. Alcide was confused by the number of these creatures. They could not have appeared in such a cluster by chance, he thought. Since they were dealing with phantom armor, defective items could appear even if they used the correct magic formula. Mentor said that the fact that so many creatures that had successfully completed their reincarnation had formed due to numerous failures meant that hundreds of evil spirits had flocked to the mansion, Leon asked in horror. 
Wondering if so many people had lost their lives in the city, Elseed said that the activity level of evil spirits is low. They can't travel long distances or even live. Accordingly, they can't move from district to district. They can only live in a slum, in a neighborhood separated from law and authority. In it, you can get anything you want with money and violence. Leon didn't want to leave it all like that, but he realized he couldn't handle his current experience. Even a holy sword that can be used to make the whole church move is useless if the guy doesn't figure out the purpose of the secret organization. Leon decided that he should think about it in the morning after he returned. After all, fighting strong enemies would help him become stronger himself. Leon shattered the armor of the first monster in his path with his sword, causing it to shatter into pieces. Next, with precise blows, he dealt numerous damage to all the other armor. When the dawn sun was already visible through the window, the boy looked at the results of his work. There were remnants of armor lying all over the corridor. Elsid said that they had more or less disposed of some of their opponents. Leon tensely said that fighting while surrounded wasn't easy. The spirit suggested it was because of the boy's blind spots. Leon nodded affirmatively. The guy explained that his level of vision was pretty high, but humans have a limit. It doesn't matter how he rolls his eyes, he still won't see anything behind his back. Fighting standing against the wall is not an option, as he won't be given that convenient opportunity. Elseed said that third-rate people are controlled by conditions, while second-rate people adapt to conditions. And only the first-rate ones turn conditions into their strength and turn them to their advantage. Leon replied that this was something he would have to learn if he wanted to fight in the slums, because the danger level is very high out there. Just in the middle of the path, there may be a trap, and the people who set them will aim exactly at the guy's blind spots. Leon realized that if he continued to rely only on his vision, he might fall into a trap from which it would be difficult to escape. It was morning, but the slum was still dark. A child's cry broke the ominous silence. Suddenly, the baby stopped crying, staring at whoever was in front of him. Realizing that he might bring trouble upon himself, the little boy covered his mouth with the palms of his hands so as not to utter a sound. In front of the child stood a huge, dark-haired man who was scaring away the people around him with his grim stare. It was Khan and his minions. He was the head of the Bastards, the strongest gang in Blaine. His men reported that they had surveyed the 23rd and 25th districts as he had asked them to do. But they had not seen any of the slaves return after getting there. One of the gang members said that the people around the estate were dangerous so they didn't get close. He checked with the head to see if it was worth getting closer. Khan spread out in his chair like a king and mouthed for them to continue watching from this distance, for otherwise they might attract attention. He summoned the next gang members who knelt down to report that they had analyzed the water flowing out of districts 23 and 25. They said that in addition to the sewage, they managed to find blood, organs, and the like. There were so many human remains that they thought that about 30 people had died in one day. Khan asked about what the magician had said. The henchman replied that he had said some bullshit. Even a black magic ritual would be less wasteful. The leader told them to compile all this information and put it into one report. He also said to attach any evidence that would be enough to force the guild or church to act. The henchmen took umbrage, saying that although they don't know what they're doing there, the commissions they get from the slave traders will drop if they pull this thing now. Blood spurted in all directions, splattering the man standing next to the talking gang member. The guy who dared to cross Khan was already dead. Khan laughed evilly, saying that if you don't know when to stop, you die. All the members of the bastard gang began to marvel at what a great technique their head had. After all, he had just shaken his hand, and the man was already dead. Khan said that those bastards weren't like the others. You shouldn't even try to use them, because it would only hurt them. Whoever they are, cult fanatics or spies from the other side, there is no reason to mess with them. Those who wish to contact them will be finished if the church takes direct action. They will corner the continent of anyone who shares even a dime with them, and it will be the church's own execution squad, the Knights of the Sacred Iron Chain. So the leader said they would retreat. He asked if there was any more news. One of the gang members said he had heard that an adventurer had come to an abandoned estate at the entrance to the neighborhood on orders. Hearing this, Khan squinted angrily. The gang member said it had been more than a week. The ringleader was told that the guy made his name destroying different monsters. First he was the cat. Now he's the janitor. Maybe he's nicknamed that because he's taking orders the others left behind. Khan listened carefully and decided that this guy was a pretty interesting character. The gang leader wondered what kind of adventurer he was, taking cheap orders. Maybe he could use this guy. It was a dark night, but in one of the windows of the house, the light shone brighter than in all the others. 
That glow was coming from Leon, who was practicing with his sword and practicing his aura. From the sudden overexertion, the guy fell to his knees and dropped the sword from his hands. Elsid asked if the guy felt the aura moving through his body. Leon said yes, he felt something strange. The spirit said that a sincere, ordinary person was far better than a sloppy genius. He was encouraged by Leon's handling of his training. The boy began to resent the fact that it felt like he was dying and being resurrected with each trial he passed. And because of that, he didn't feel like he was growing at all. Elsid offered Leon a glance at his stats. A glowing screen appeared in front of him. The boy was indignant, asking why his aura was so weak. The spirit said with irony in his voice that the kid is growing up pretty fast. In a short time, he learns things that other people spend hundreds of hours on. Leon asked confusedly, wondering if the seven-star sword had been added to the list. Elsid angrily shouted that he couldn't call himself a swordmaster if he couldn't learn even one technique. He said that the boy had no conscience at all. The seven-star sword was also known as the Great Chariot. It was a secret sword art developed by Emperor Rodrigo in his youth. Only those who can utilize all seven forms of the arcane arts will be called a true master. Leon said that he wanted to learn at least one of them before facing malice. After all, if he combined the seven-star sword and the holy sword, he would be able to destroy any opponent. Elsid confirmed that anyone other than a rank A master would die. Leon decided that would be enough. The guy said that since he can't become stronger than the enemies in the slums in two months, he needs a trump card to use. El Cid listened attentively to the guy's reasoning that even knowing how to manifest an aura weapon, it's useless if you don't know how to use it properly. Leon asked the spirit to start the training, but the spirit suggested that they end the class for the day. The boy was embarrassed and asked his mentor the reason for his decision. El Cid pointed to the window behind where the bastard gang members were standing and told the guy they had company. Leon went to the window and looked with grim interest at the people standing there. El Cid voiced that they were clearly not the occupants of the house. The boy assumed that these men had come for him. The Holy Sword Spirit said that he couldn't sense monsters or anyone stronger than them, and from the looks of it, these men were just ordinary hooligans. Leon asked if it was possible or that they were from the slums. The spirit replied that they were clearly not friendly, but he didn't think they wanted to fight. The guy decided to go out to them and talk. Perhaps they had thoughts about where Malice was. One of the thugs called out to Leon, asking if he was called janitor. The guy said yes. The men apologized for coming unannounced. They said they were following orders from above and hoped the guy would understand. Leon wondered who had sent these men to him and what they wanted. The guy asked who they were. The strange, identically trimmed men replied that they were members of the Bastards Gang. Looking at these strange men, Leon said he heard about them while he was gathering information. Their leader, Khan, had divided the slum into three. The men said their boss was looking for him. They've been warned not to insist if the boy doesn't want to go with them. But they hope Leon will obediently follow them. Leon told them without further ado to lead him to the ringleader. The men themselves were very surprised. But the boy thought that if they wanted to harm him, they would not have called so openly. Leon decided that it was to his advantage. As long as he mentioned the name Khan Fung, people would move out of his way. This was a chance to get into the heart of the slums. Alcide said he could tell by the look on his face what the guy was up to. After thinking about it, the guy decided that the ringleader probably wanted to entrust him with a job they couldn't ask the guild to do. Leon decided that if they wanted to use him, he would use him back. As the men led Leon through the tangled nooks and crannies of the slum, one of the locals accidentally grazed a gang member's shoulder. The bandit's reaction was lightning fast. He kicked the poor man so hard that he flew several meters away. He then approached a local man and started kicking him, yelling that he should watch where he was going. Seeing this behavior, Leon clenched his teeth in anger. He felt he had to intervene. Elseed said the guy should be patient and stay out of it. The guy irritatedly asked why. The spirit said that the boy should be careful with his emotions. After all, if he showed bloodlust in front of Khan, he would get nothing. Leon realized his mentor was right and said he would follow his advice. Once in the bastard's base, the guy was surprised at the horrible mess around him. Elsid asked if they knew what cleaning was. There were mountains of garbage lying around and everything was stained with blood. Leon whispered to Elsid that it looked like the gang wasn't cleaning it all up on purpose. The spirit nodded, saying it was a classic form of intimidation. Kan Feng came out of the darkness and asked the guy in a rough voice. He was the one called the janitor. Sensing the danger, the guy put his hand on the hilt of his sword. Deciding that now was the right moment to attack, Leon swung his sword and struck Khan in the arm. The blow came on the massive bracelet on the ringleader's arm. 
Not only did it completely block the attack, but it didn't even have a scratch on it. This behavior made Khan laugh. With a grim smile, he remarked that Janitor was an inappropriate nickname. Then the man swung his fist at the guy with incredible speed. After estimating the speed and force of the blow, Leon decided that he could die right in this slum. But Khan Feng stopped and his fist froze just a centimeter away from Leon's face. Still, the man grazed Leon's nose, who stood unmoving. Blood ran down the boy's face. When he lowered his gaze, he saw that the carpet was dripping with his own blood. Leon realized with horror that he wouldn't have had time to dodge the blow. Such terrible power was only from the pressure of the wind. If the man had finished the blow, his head would have been gone. Fung said he was surprised at the guy's courage. He thought he was a weakling because he only had a C rank. He kicked the guy lightly in the chest and said he'd already made up his mind about him. Wiping the blood from his nose, Leon inquired exactly what Khan had decided. The ringleader had already turned around and was about to leave. Without turning his head, the man said it was about his assignment to the boy. Khan promised to give Leon whatever he wanted for fulfillment. Smirking, the bandit leader said he'd already found out everything he needed to know about the guy's past. The man said he knew about the academy training and that Leon had been ranked second among the commoners for the past two years. Spreading his arms approvingly, Khan said he was aware that the guy had kicked the ass of the inept nobles and then dropped everything and went into adventuring to gain experience and become stronger. From this monologue, Leon concluded that the slum leader had a full set of information about him. Squinting his eyes, Khan Feng said that he understood why Leon had dropped out of the Imperial Academy. The man said that at one time he too did not want to become a knight and serve the vile nobles. He didn't want to obey anyone. Both Leon and Elsid were very surprised that Khan talked about the academy. Khan said that after defeating the nobles, the boy decided to become an adventurer. This made him different from those who chase money, because he tries to go straight and become stronger. According to the man, that was why the guy was able to increase his rank by completing only two tasks. The ringleader reasoned further, saying that Leon is not stingy with money. That means he has only one goal. Honor. Khan said he thinks the guy wants to prove those nasty aristocrats wrong and to show that there are things above status and rank. The man suggested that Leon ended up in these criminal slums because he followed a call of honor. Smiling sinisterly, he said that if Leon accepted his terms, he would fulfill his fondest wish. Leon was embarrassed because Khan Fung was so persistent. El Cid made a comment saying the proposal sounds bonkers, but he thinks there's some merit to it. Indeed, judging by the tasks Leon had completed, he had no intention of chasing fame, even if he was mistaken for a hero. However, there was no time to explain himself to Khan now. After all, he didn't even know that he was Leon's enemy. So if he thought the guy was threatening him, he could use it to his advantage. So Leon made the most interested expression on his face and said that the offer sounded very interesting. The gang leader mistakenly thought he already had the kid on the hook. Khan uncorked a bottle of some strong liquor and said in a relaxed voice that people in the slums were unfriendly to strangers, so there was no point in refusing his help. He set the bottle down on the table with a loud clatter and said that their weak ones die first. Leon sat across from the gang leader and listened as he said that those who survive try to become one of the strongest. That's how life in the slums works. The man said that a few months ago, as the exiles became more numerous, he didn't pay much attention to them. That was until they started picking up districts 23 and 25 in their neighborhood. Thus, there were about 200 new corpses every night. Leon thought with horror that this was where the evil spirits for the living armor came from. Evil that hadn't been put to rest had taken up residence in the mansion as living armor. Khan carried his conversation further, explaining that three people rule in these slums. The first was a man named Simon, a moneylender who was given the name Golden Pig. The second was an unknown assassin. They called him The Undertaker. And the third man was, of course, him, Khan. The man thought he was on top of it all. Leon thought to himself that when he'd seen him, he'd never recognized him as the man in charge. Khan revealed that the 23rd and 25th districts were Simon's. It so happened that there was a brutal massacre where more than 200 people were killed. Simon suffered huge losses. In the end, he decided to fight back and sent nearly 500 mercenaries from D to B rank. The man was silent for a few seconds. Then he said in a grim voice that every last one of them had been destroyed. This news came as a real shock to Leon. The losses were enormous. The boy asked how such a thing could have happened in the first place, to which Khan tensely replied that he didn't know. Leon pondered that if there was such a force out there that could wipe out a huge number of mercenaries, wasn't that something the Empire should keep an eye on? 
The lawlessness in the slums was beyond reasonable. If Khan's story is to be believed, this explains why all sorts of phantom creatures appear in an abandoned house. Looking into the emptied bottle, the man said that anyone who tried to track down the killers was simply eliminated. Everyone but him. There was no more alcohol in the bottle, so the man crushed it with one hand. He was angry that Simon had been afraid to take any action. Leon listened to the man resent the fact that one of the leaders had decided to stand on the sidelines. If it hadn't been for Khan, there wouldn't have been a wet spot left. Leon asked what was the point of continuing the battle. The man replied that it would be rude of him to stay away. He pointed his finger at the guy and said he'd decided to trust him, an adventurer who was after glory. Khan said that he has learned a lot about the guy. For example, that he is not a downhearted person but goes forward without giving up. The leader said that if he was really like that, he should join him. Leon said that in his opinion, the gang leader can't trust him with some contract killing, which means that through, he wants to involve the guild in the case. Khan smiled evilly, realizing that Leon had figured out his plans. He said it was better to have one from the guild on hand than a hundred stupid subordinates. Leon said he wouldn't take the case. It was clear to the guy that Khan didn't want to give up his position and lose people in the fight against these vagrants. So he was asking for help. That means he wants to use someone who recently joined the guild. Leon wasn't looking for more trouble on his head, but he was sure that this Khan would be a very big threat in the future. When the guy asked why the guild was involved, the man threw some paper on the table and said to look at it. The guy began to read carefully what was written in the document, and the more he read, the more his eyes rounded. The document was proof that the people in the slums had been victimized by evil beasts. Elsid was also struck by the numbers in the document. Hundreds, and in the worst case, thousands of people were affected. Leon felt like he was going to throw up. These people were in the blind spot of the law, so if they disappeared, there would be no particular loss to the country. It was a terrible thing to realize. Seeing the boy clench his fists in anger, Elsid advised him to calm down and control his feelings. Leon asked Khan if it was okay to leave things as they were. The man said no. The district heads know their strengths and positions, and they can't be defeated that easily. Looking carefully at Leon, the man said, If he had doubts about someone, then let him not dare to trust him. Smiling sadly, Leon said he understood why they needed him. Khan replied that that was fine, for the boy had proved his true colors. It will be enough for them to make the authorities believe what atrocities are going on here. All Leon has to do is survive. Leon grinned at that phrase. He said that he needed to survive anyway, because dying wouldn't bring any evidence. Therefore, he could not be doubted. The gang leader laughed extraordinarily at Leon's words. He liked the guy. Khan once again asked if the guy accepts his terms. Leon pounded his fist on the table and said he was accepting. He thought to himself that it was hard to find that kind of information in the slums now anyway. He looked at the rough gang leader and thought that by accepting this assignment, many lives could be saved. Hearing this, Khan threw Leon some kind of pouch and a dagger. Leon looked at the dagger and saw that there was a mark engraved on the blade. Khan said that the mark belonged to his gang. Smiling evilly, the ringleader said that if anyone interfered with Leon, they just had to show that mark. And if necessary, he advised the boy to cut the most precious thing they had. Leon threw that dagger aside and said he was disgusted and didn't want to. Khan shouted that you have to be a man in this business if you want to win. Leon opened the pouch and saw some scrolls. Khan explained that they were magical. If he didn't need them, the boy could just sell them. Smiling broadly, the ringleader said that this could be considered the first advance. The guy frowned at Khan and said he had one more question. When they met, did he think about stopping his fist from the beginning? The man looked at him glumly and said no. Back home, Leon sat on his bed and digested everything that had happened during the evening. He thought about the fact that this Khan is incredibly strong. He would have to train more to become stronger than this man. Leon asked El Cid if he had any guesses about those documents. The spirit replied that he had a few thoughts, but he wished he could be more specific. After all, dark magic is a little out of place in their situation. It's probably more serious than they realize. The boy suggested that he needed to see everything with his own eyes. The mentor nodded affirmatively. Leon knew it wouldn't be easy to infiltrate an area where 500 mercenaries had been killed. He wondered if this wasn't a mission for professional fighters. The guy came to the conclusion that he needed an assistant, someone who wouldn't be obsessed with money, talented, capable, someone who could be his rock. El Cid asked Riley, wasn't the guy putting too many conditions on it? Leon answered without hesitation, no. After all, no one would ask them there. 
The guy was standing outside an old tall building that looked like a church. Leon was surprised that there was a church in the slum. Elcid said it was not strange, for priests had long been sent to such places. The spirit said that those who are blinded by money are easily seduced. Those who are possessed by lust and debauchery are easily manipulated. Priests are different because they do not belong to either party. The only thing they adhere to is their beliefs and the teachings of the goddess. They cannot be seduced by any of these vices. After hearing this, Leon said he would try something. The boy realized that if he revealed his identity, he wouldn't be able to get to the priests, so he had to be quieter than water and lower than grass. Leon looked around and saw ordinary people who live poorly and don't look at your pockets and belongings. He realized that the rumor that there were no normal people in the slums was a myth. Leon looked at these people and realized that there was still trust between them. He thought that perhaps it was the influence of the Holy Church. He wondered who the bishop was in the slums. He went to the door of the church and knocked loudly on the wooden door. From behind the door, he was asked, Who is there? Leon gave his name and said he was an adventurer. He said he had something to say to the bishop. Suddenly, the guy started to feel very strange. He realized it was his aura. She had a very strange reaction to the man at the door. The bishop's light-colored robes appeared from behind the massive door. In front of Leon, half hidden by shadows, stood a tall man in the white robes of a church minister. It was an elf. He said he was the bishop in charge of the place. The man called himself Jazar. Leon was delighted and confused, for he had not expected to see an elf in front of him at all, so he was very surprised. Jazar invited Leon inside and poured him some tea. The man noticed that Leon was a little shocked that he was an elf. The boy tried to convince him otherwise. Jazar smiled good-naturedly and said he understood. Many people are surprised to see an elf in front of them. He said that the goddess loves all races equally. That's why he became a cleric. The bishop said he knew Leon's exploits. After all, he was the one who got rid of the monsters in the sewers and under the castle walls. Leon blinked in surprise. The boy learned from Jazar that his labor had improved people's water and made them less likely to catch infections. The bishop said that the goddess was pleased with him. Leon was extremely embarrassed. Bishop Jazar asked what the boy wanted to talk to him about. Leon placed the papers that Khan had given him on the table in front of him and asked the clergyman to look at them. Jazar's gaze became intense and a vein on his forehead began to pulse nervously. To Leon's delight, he replied that in situations like this, they shouldn't delay. But there was one thing. Jazar thought the document was questionable, as the source of the information was questionable. He promised that he would ask trusted people to investigate again. Therefore, the clergyman's response will be a little delayed. Leon said he understood the reasons. Leon said he is also looking for someone to investigate with him for districts 23 and 25. He asked if the bishop could recommend someone. The bishop hesitated, but then said he had no familiar armed adventurers in mind. He told the guy that he knew people who could be a support or a supporting force, but he didn't think they were capable of much more than that. Leon was very upset, for he had hoped for Jazar's advice. The last hope seemed to be gone, but suddenly the bishop said he could go himself. This suggestion stunned the lad and pleased him at the same time. Jazar said that he would entrust his work to someone else and go with him. A bishop's position is not meant to avoid dark forces. Leon had expected adventurers equal to him, but not the bishop, so he hoped the elf at least knew how to fight. He asked Jazar if he was sure of his intention. The man wondered if Leon didn't trust him. To put the boy's doubts aside, Jazar focused and decided to demonstrate his strength. His hand shone with a red light. A powerful energy was emanating from it in waves. As it turns out, the bishop possessed an aura of fire. When the aura reaches its density limit, it seeps outward and burns the surrounding atmosphere. Jazar possessed a technique that could tear even mithril like a piece of paper. Elsid noticed that judging by the speed of activation, one could assume that he had mastered it through practical experience. Jazar's strength might be equal to Khan's. Smiling, Jazar asked what Leon thought. Did he still think the bishop should cling to him? Leon laughed, saying that the opposite could happen, and it would be him clinging to the bishop's hand. Jazar said he shouldn't praise him. Jazar said that although he was a member of the Holy Iron Castle Knight Order 50 years ago, but now he was only a sick old man. Leon couldn't believe that a former member of the strongest order on the continent was standing in front of him. The boy shook the bishop's hand and said he was sincerely counting on him. Jazar replied that he was the one who was counting on Leon. The man asked to be given a moment to draw his weapon. Leon could wait in the yard for now. Guy was happy to be in alliance with a talented man who had once served in the order. 
He felt like he had gotten a thousand warriors and horses in one fell swoop. Leon thought about what kind of weapon the former order member owned. He must have a marvelous bow like a wood elf. El Cid grinned, calling the boy the most naive. He asked, hadn't he noticed the calluses on the bishop's hands? Leon didn't have time to answer before he was distracted by a loud sound. A massive metal ball with spikes attached to a chain landed on the ground. Jazar was far from wielding a wood elf's bow and arrow. He preferred weapons that required brute force to use. He decided to demonstrate his skills to Leon. There was just the right pile of rocks in front of them. The elf swung with all his might and delivered one accurate blow. The stones shattered in different directions with a crackling sound, completely crushed by the force of the impact. Smiling, Jazar said he hadn't held his favorite weapon in a long time. His blood boiled with memories of the past. He loved smashing the heads of heretics with that mace. The boy listened in confusion about how the bishop liked to root out sin and destroy evil with one blow. Jazar said that the goddess would extend her protection to their temple in the same way. Leon embarrassedly replied that he thought he would. The setting sun colored the sky scarlet, resembling blood. Leon, adopting a carefree look, walked through the busy streets of the slum. He shifted his gaze to El Cid and asked if the bishop was following them. The spirit answered in the affirmative. Since it was not possible to enter a den of criminals dressed as a clergyman, Leon asked Jazar to change into the clothes worn in the slums. But it seemed strange to the guy that although he could sense the bishop's presence with his aura, it was impossible to detect him through his other senses. El Cid confirmed the fact that by using his aura, it was as if Jazar was erasing his presence. The spirit explained that the skill was difficult to use on the move, but the man was experienced enough for such a thing. As he walked by, Jazar caught a glimpse of a man walking down the street beside him. But when the man turned to be indignant, there was no one behind him. Observing this picture, El Cid assumed that the elf had a lot of experience in disguise. Leon asked why, then, he felt his presence. The spirit said it was because of the properties of his aura. Even though he has been erased by the aura skill and no one feels his presence, there are auras that still read people's locations. This was possible because Leon's attribute was the sun, and judging from the guy's reaction to Jazar, his attribute was the moon. El Cid said that the reason why he could sense the elf's presence was because in the eyes of the owner of the sun attribute, hiding skill was a weakness. The guy wondered, sun and moon, whether it was a coincidence. Or is it inevitable fate? When Leon and Jazar came to the building Mark 23, the elf said they had arrived. District 23 started from here. When Leon pulled out the dagger that Khan had given him, Elsid slyly remarked that it had come in handy. The thugs standing nearby turned around to look at those invading their neighborhood. Leon then took Khan's advice and displayed a dagger with the mark of the bastard gang. As soon as they did so, the bandits who met on their way immediately gave way. Jazar said that he had never thought they would pass through the slums with such ease. He remarked that Leon seemed to be as outstanding a person as they say he was. The bishop suggested that likewise their success might be due to the patronage of the goddess. The elf asked if the trial of heretics engaged in sacrilege could be expedited. Both Elsid and Leon were at a loss for an answer to this question. Leon saw a sewer tunnel and opened a passage into it. Khan said it was dangerous to be on the surface, so they would go to where the evil realm begins. Jazar and Leon walked quietly down the long sewer corridor, trying to ignore the stench of sewage. Suddenly, the bishop ordered the boy to be quiet. At that moment, they heard scraps of conversation. A voice came from the hood announcing that one victim had rebelled, so they hadn't met the quota. They had to deal with 12 more. 70 people a day is a lot, though. The conversation continued. Someone said that even if everyone wasn't dealt with by midnight, the ceremony could continue until dawn. Leon clenched his teeth at what he heard. A ceremony. Seventy people. The guy wondered, for how many months had these freaks been killing so many people every day? Jazar was furious too. With a wave of his mace, he told Leon that he would go forward. Jazar's mace plowed through the floor and the man leapt out into the room where these assassins were talking. He swung his weapon and bled the first offender. When Leon followed the bishop upstairs, he saw that the elf had already dealt with all of his opponents alone. He smiled embarrassedly and said they couldn't sneak in now. Before Leon could say a word, he saw the enemy standing behind the bishop. Jazar reacted with lightning speed. He swung his weapon and hit his opponent in the head. But his blow was blocked by some strange force, keeping the weapon away from the face of the cloaked and masked man. An evil laugh came from behind the mask. The man behind it said that the blows didn't work against his armored sword. The enemy said that those who dared to attack him 
must have wanted death. He added that everything worked out wonderfully, as they were just short of casualties. As soon as that masked man spoke, his head immediately separated from his body. Through Leon's efforts, the man's pointless monologue came to an end. Leon heard an angry shout from another of the criminals, who asked the guy in horror if he knew who he dared to disturb. But then Jazar arrived and quickly dealt with the new enemy. While Leon took the head off one enemy, Jazar twisted the neck of another. They seemed to be working well together. The elf asked if Leon had already dealt with everyone. The boy asked, with irony in his voice, if that was something that should be said to the bishop. Leon noticed that their enemies possessed some pretty good weapons. The elf was surprised that the boy had time to pick up the sword. He thought that this was probably how Leon was able to ignore the enemy's sorcerous tricks. In fact, Leon was holding a holy sword. It was just that Elseed had cast a special spell on his appearance, so instead of a sacred weapon, other people saw an ordinary sword, so the one used by those bastards. The Holy Sword was too recognizable, so anyone familiar with the Holy Order or Emperor Rodrigo would be able to recognize it. Through this trick, they were able to reveal the true nature of the enemy. But there is no clearer proof than the use of witchcraft, which is forbidden by the Church. Bishop said that despite this fight, he does not believe that the secret infiltration into the enemy's lair has failed. The bishop laughed and said that if there were no witnesses, there was nothing to worry about. He asked, if they exterminated all the witnesses. Couldn't they call it a secret infiltration? Such logic confused Leon a bit, but he didn't say anything back. Leon motioned for the bishop to open the only door that was in the room. When they looked inside, the picture before them made them horrified. There were skulls, bloody weapons, and fresh corpses everywhere. The floor of this torture room was covered in blood. Nausea came to Leon's throat. This sight was the image of a nightmare. He couldn't believe how many people had been sacrificed in this place. Alcidi told the boy to hold on. After all, you can't get used to such horror. But you can't turn your back on tragedy. You have to accept it. The spirit said that even if everyone forgot, the hero should remember that this tragedy was an enemy he would have to fight for the rest of his life. Leon asked, wasn't his enemy rubbing the demon king? The mentor replied that he would have more than one single enemy, for this world was not easy to save. Leon realized with horror that killing one villain would not be enough. He tied his life to the bloody business. Elsid said that the Demon King creates many problems. Poverty for the poor, disease for the sick. He asked Leon, is there a reasonable solution to this misery? The spirit asked if poverty could be destroyed with the Holy Sword, or if diseases could be stopped with it. Compared to these problems, the Demon King is nothing. Elsid explained that a hero is someone who tries to make tomorrow a little better than today. That's why they fight forever. The spirit told Leon not to look away, no matter how horrible it was. After all, only by looking at such horrors would the boy be able to cut off the root of the evil. Looking at Jazar, Leon marveled at how, after seeing such a horrible sight, he was able to make a decision in a matter of seconds. The elf had amazing willpower. Leon told the bishop that they were in the room where the corpses were being disposed of, and this was where the really fortified area began. The boy noted that there were at least two enemies ahead. If they went in blind, they could be in big trouble. Leon remembered the magic scrolls of Khan and the fact that if possible, he didn't want to use them. But it looks like we'll have to do something we don't want to do. Therefore, Leon opened the magic scroll and began to scrutinize it, watching as a symbol formed on the paper in the boy's hands, burning with a bright light. The bishop asked if this item had magical power. Leon didn't answer anything. Streams of light from the scroll channeled their energy into his body. The boy drew in air with force. His body seemed to be filled with some foreign power. The scroll gave Leon the power of clairvoyance. Elseed said excitedly that the magic gives the user the temporary ability to see through space. That way, Leon can see the underbelly of the place. The boy looked around and realized that he could now see through walls. He had no trouble finding the exact location of their enemies. Leon surveyed the area until his head began to spin and drops of blood began to drip onto the floor. The bishop watched anxiously as the boy's nose began to bleed. He moved closer, wanting to help, but Leon said he was fine. Leon told me that the underground layout itself was not too spacious. He managed to count about 24 enemies. In the center of the structure was an impenetrable room. The entrance to it was on the east. Wiping the blood from his nose, the boy asked, Does Jazar think the core is in that room? Jazar replied that perhaps the boy was right. However, it should not be ruled out that it could be a trap. After all, the basics of strategy are to outsmart the enemy. Nothing is more common than the logarithm of inverse. 
What was thought to be a weakness is actually a strength. Or maybe it's an empty shell used to dispose of bodies. This could be the entire 25th district. Leon said that although the bishop's words might be true, he still wanted to check out that place. The boy thought that the next time they came, maybe the borders wouldn't be as free as they were now. So now was an opportunity to explore the area. Jazar said that now that the goal was set, they needed to do everything as quietly and quickly as possible. The two thugs stood talking quietly, unaware of the danger. Just as suddenly a heavy steel chain encircled the throat of the two, Bishop held the thugs in the embrace of his weapon until they fell dead. Embarrassed, Jazar said that due to his age, he was no longer as impetuous as he used to be. At last they came to a blank wall where the outline of a door was barely visible. Leon asked if the elf had any idea how it opened. The guy tried to move it, but nothing worked. There was no doorknob, no hole to hit. But then Jazar and Leon noticed strange, unidentified writings of a dark red color, similar to the blood flowing from a wound. The elf immediately asked Leon to step aside. The man swung harder and struck the mace right in the center of the door. Leon was surprised. There wasn't a scratch on the door and the mace bounced off it like a ball. Jazar didn't understand how that was possible either. It was not long ago that he had turned a pile of stones into dust with a single movement. Alcide assumed the door was made of a non-standard matter, a material from the netherworld. This substance is based on laws that do not exist in this world. The spirit had said that there were exhibits that froze when heated and burned when exposed to cold. Perhaps the door could have rejected any physical interference. Leon thought that it wasn't just a matter of opposing physical force. After all, using the scroll, he couldn't see what was inside. So the door was also rejecting magic. Leon couldn't figure out how to get inside without using magic or physical powers. Suddenly, Jazar started praying to the goddess. The bishop asked her to put her purifying light into his hands. And his hands did indeed shine with a bright light. Leon asked Elsid in bewilderment if this was a sacred technique. The spirit answered in the affirmative, adding that this power could not be trained like the aura. This power is not as researched as magic. However, it has been proven that it is formed through the accumulation of pious devotion and good deeds. Seeing the door go cracking, Elsid realized that heretical tricks could not stand up to holiness after all. Leon shouted in delight as the door couldn't withstand the elf's strength and began to collapse. But suddenly everything stopped and the light went out without destroying the door. Leon asked Elsid in bewilderment what had happened, but he had no answer. The spirit said that since this door had withstood the bishop's holy reception, it was incredibly secure. Therefore, it had not been used as a trap. The mentor hinted to Leon that he should try using the power of the holy sword. The boy nodded in agreement. Leon concentrated and began to summon the power of his aura. The air around him became electrified. The boy felt his power and directed it straight at the door. Lightning flashed and struck the impenetrable door. A moment later, the door was empty. The boy glanced at Alcide and wondered if it had just disappeared. Jazar was shocked by Leon's strength. He said he might have underestimated his abilities, but that punch was amazing. Leon was embarrassed and said that the bishop flattered him, for it was he who did most of the work. The man and the boy looked inside. Jazar said he didn't sense anyone's presence. He assumed that their enemies left the space empty and then performed rituals in it. When they entered the room, Leon thought he couldn't see anything in the pitch darkness but he could smell the steady odor of blood. Jazar used woos of power and lighted the way amidst this darkness. But what they saw was beyond all common sense. At first, Leon thought they were just a mountain of human remains in front of them. But when it came to his mind what was before them, he cried out in horror. It was the most terrifying sight he had ever seen. They were in front of a single substance composed of flesh, meat, teeth, and eyes. One such creature crawled leisurely toward Leon, fumbling with its small hands. Leon's breath caught with tears. He realized that all these creatures were alive. Every single one of them was breathing. Elsid was the first to realize what was going on here. He explained that their enemies were stripping the flesh and extracting blood from sentient species, and then processing them into chunks of meat, infusing them with the essence of life force. Considering how much they had already gathered, their goal was clear. They were practicing the satanic art of summoning a monster. It requires bait in the form of a huge number of sacrifices. Elsid said that since it was known that this monster could swallow an entire city just by opening and closing its mouth, it was called the City Devourer. Leon listened in horror as his mentor talked about how it would take a lot of time and labor to summon the monster. But once it got going, there would be no stopping it. It was an extra-dimensional creature that even the best warrior wouldn't dare to face. 
It would devour the city in one bite and return to another dimension. Leon didn't even want to think about the fact that the free city of Blaine could be fodder for such a thing. El Cid reassured him a little, saying that although the ritual attracted the attention of heretics, 99 attempts out of 100 would fail. However, if one succeeds, disaster cannot be avoided. Leon asked if such a ritual had been successfully completed. El Cid replied that if the records in the Chronicles had survived, it was likely that something like this had already happened. The peculiarity of satanic arts was that no one knows what phenomenon they will bring until they are activated. Most of the countermeasures were created already after what happened. Leon asked fearfully, what countermeasures against the city devourer? He didn't want to face him without a plan. Still, El Cid thought this story was strange. This place was nothing more than where the victims for the monster are processed. But the volume was insufficient and the security level low. Perhaps they have already collected most of the sacrifices and all that remains is to begin the ritual. Most likely, if you start evacuating the townspeople, they will immediately start summoning the city devourer. The spirit suggested to Leon that he should go ahead. The boy looked at his mentor in bewilderment. El Cid explained that they would gather all the armed forces in the city to conquer District 25. Summoning the monster would require a massive ritual. The problem would be solved by destroying them early. Leon realized that the spirit was hinting at all-out war. El Cid nodded, saying that if you corner your enemies, they will cling to the last resort. El Cid told me that the scary characteristic of the satanic arts is their defenses. They have any power other than sacred power. The spirit said Leon could care less, for he has the holy sword. Together, they will reduce their forces through total war. After that, they can wipe out the remaining depleted elite. The spirit said that as long as they were unaware of the proximity of the holy sword, they would be given a mat from which they could not escape. Leon realized that it seemed the spirit was suggesting the best way, but their enemies were not idiots, and most likely realized that their plans had been exposed during the attack. Leon smirked, deciding that now they should also place a bet. Jazar pulled the boy out of his musings, telling him it was time for them to get out of here. After all, it seems their enemies were aware that someone had invaded their territory. Before leaving this creepy place, the guy picked up a piece of this living flesh. He wondered what the point of leaving this something alive in this form was. Jazar swung his mace at this mountain of remains and took aim right in the middle. Pieces of flesh, shattered by the elf's weapons, scattered in all directions of that eerie room. Jazar and Leon finished what they had planned and rushed away. Their enemies had already arrived. When they entered the room with the victims, they began to panic and yell about how much effort and time had been wasted. After that, the whole group chased after the boys. While the boys were running away, the order came to stop the pursuit. Once this place was discovered, it had to be locked down. When Leon and Jazar had run a decent distance, they stopped to catch their breath. They were surprised that the energy of the pursuers was receding and they were not being chased. The elf said the situation reminded him of when he disturbed a hornet's nest as a child. At that point, he just jumped into the pond. But in this situation, there is no body of water nearby in which to take refuge from the looming threat. And that place was no match for a hornet's nest of nasty creatures. Jazar said he had a feeling if they asked for reinforcements from the church, they'd be late. Leon pondered the realization of El Cide's plan. The boy needed to find a consummate orator. Leon planned to show the holy sword only as a last resort. Such an occasion had come. Jazar opened his mouth in amazement, but he wanted no one else to know about his weapon. Leon told the shocked bishop that he had a plan to stop their enemies. They had already arrived at the church and were sitting at the table with cups of tea, looking at the created monster lying before them. Leon shared his plan. After listening carefully, Jazar said that he did not understand many nuances. It was worth the risk. After all, they had nothing else to try. The guy decided that hearing Elsid's plan would have made any strategist laugh, since the information about the city devourer was classified. He had to pretend that the conclusion was drawn by deduction in order not to arouse suspicion. Leon also brought up the fact that his solar aura was much more effective against satanic tricks. Jazar fell for it saying that solar aura is even recognized in the church as the number one thing when it comes to attacking. The elf added that such an aura was so rare that the boy was the first person he'd ever seen it in. Leon said, then the decision is made. They will mobilize the guilds and the army to force the enemies to lock themselves in the lair and then infiltrate and destroy them. Jazar clarified that there were two prerequisites, the involvement of the guild and army and the infiltration of the enemy base by this team. 
The first one was easy to fulfill. The problem was that they needed people who could stand up to the elite satanic warriors. The team should consist of at least A rank fighters. Leon wondered where they would recruit so many people of such high rank. Suddenly, it hit him. He suggested that the bishop recruit strong men from the slums. After all, there were a couple of strong men there who would not be inferior to a rank warriors. Leon thought that Confan and Coffin Man would be a great addition to the team. Jazar said it was worth putting aside reasoning about their strength and thinking about whether they would enter the war. The boy said that if the bishop ordered it, they would have no choice. The elf's eyes lit up, and he asked excitedly if this was a conscription. Leon smiled back, saying that everyone would follow the bishop if only he were to show the stamp of the Holy Iron Castle. Alcide ominously remarked that if the people they were talking about had heard them, they would have been impaled on a sword or two by now. Chuckling, Leon sarcastically pointed out that he wasn't going to avenge Khan's nosebleed at all. It was early morning and the sun was shining brightly over the adventurers' guild building. The warriors gathered there were confused. Some looked at them with delight, some with apprehension, but all were confused. Miss Lee was also extremely discouraged. She greeted Leon and the person who came with him. Jazar wore the uniform of a knight of the Order of the Iron Castle and names quite an imposing appearance. Looking at him, everyone around him whispered about what business he had come to the guild for. Leon turned to Lee, saying that he was not here today to make a request, but to ask for cooperation. Jazar removed his helmet and introduced himself by name. He said he was requesting the full support of the guild in the name of Holy Iron and Chain. Miss Lee took them to see Guildmaster Bernard of the Blaine Branch. The man said he would listen and calculate them. Sitting across from him, Leon thought he was even more enormous than Khan. The man had once held an A rank, but had retired due to a leg injury. The Guildmaster said that he realized the gravity of the situation. After all, she had made a retired member of the Order request a meeting with him. After Leon provided the evidence, the discussion of countermeasures went smoothly. Bernard's face darkened when he heard how little time they had and the estimated damage. According to the Guildmaster's information summary, there is only one free adventurer out of the four rank A people who is currently in Blaine. Leaving the decision with that adventurer to the Guildmaster, Leon and Jazar traveled to the slums to recruit Khan. The meeting between the bishop and Khan wasn't so bad. Khan had no choice but to agree. All the more reason for the bishop to threaten to put the bandit and his gang on the list of heretics, and they would have no choice but to flee the city away. Khan sighed, grumbling that he had fallen into his own trap. He'd thought he'd be able to slay his enemies and mess up the guild at the same time, but he had. Jazar said that his threat also applies to the Coffin Man, so Khan can give him the bishop's message. Khan was surprised that only he and Coffin Man would be enticed. Jazar said that two would be enough to form a core group. Other than that, it would just be a matter of evacuating the city before starting to conquer District 25. Smirking, Khan asked if they were going to cut off the head of a snake with a small number of warriors. Jazar replied that for a cutthroat, he didn't have a bad walk brewing. Looking at the two of them, Leon thought that Kane couldn't be excluded from this mess anyway. They'd all have to unite if they didn't want to die. Leon looked in front of him and couldn't believe his eyes. He realized how dangerous the situation was, but he hadn't expected to see such a result. It was hard to believe that so many warriors and weapons could be gathered in two days. Miss Lee ran up and announced that an urgent request had been delivered to all C-ranked guild members, but most of them are adventurers. Guildmaster Bernard said that there are about 1,500 people here, so they will witness and participate in a real battle. Thanks to the physical evidence provided, the Guildmaster managed to convince his lordship to intervene. Master Bernard thinks the garrison is already besieging District 25. Close combat will be fought mostly by adventurers and mercenaries and troops with insufficient individual abilities will be responsible for rear support, making attacks from further away. El Cid appreciated this approach, saying that if the attacker was too inexperienced, he would only fall victim to Satan's techniques. Leon smiled, hearing that it would be far better to constantly get on the enemy's nerves, albeit in a passive form. Standing in front of the two most dangerous warriors, the lad realized that the main forces in this battle were them. Lord Blaine also sent his senior knight, he introduced himself by the name of Kondrat. Kondrat, still only a free knight, had already gained fame for his martial arts. The man immediately found common ground with the bishop. The boss of the slum dwellers, on the contrary, felt out of place. Suddenly, Leon felt something strange behind him. There was a squeaky voice behind him asking if he was late. Kondrat and Jazar immediately tensed up, asking the strange creature who he was. 
Walking up close to Leon, the strange ally said that they had summoned himself and him, and now they were asking who he was. Khan was the first to realize that the coffin man was in front of them, so he said that they were now in the same boat and needed to be responsible and not disobey orders. The undertaker said he would use his discretion. After all, he is a murderer and their approaches to the case may differ. Jazar said that if this assassin fulfills his role properly, he won't get in the way. However, if he follows along with them with faith in this secret sorcery, the bishop will make him realize that there is nowhere to hide before the radiance of the goddess. Laughing, the undertaker told Jazar that his words were a little scary. Leon was intimidated by the newly arrived ally. The guy had the ability to sense aura and use visionary techniques, but even using them, it was impossible to detect the presence of the mortician. Just when Leon thought they only had one team member left to wait for from the guild, some girl called out to see if she was late. A gorgeous blue-eyed blonde stood in front of them. The girl introduced herself as Karen. She said she didn't know anything about the operation, so some preparations had to be made. All the team members were clearly impressed by this person. Leon thought, how could they all be so different? Among them were one gangster and two adventurers, also a retired knight of the Holy Iron Castle, the senior knight of the Earl's house, and an assassin. It was foolish to hope for a spirit of unity in this collective, but it couldn't be helped. After all, they were united on the basis of individual skills. When all the team members were assembled, Leon announced that the operation could begin. The 25th block was burning and exploding. The war over its ownership had begun. Satanists in cloaks and masks scattered from the sudden attack on their abode of evil. Shelling was taking place every minute while the infantry got closer to the building. The bastards who sacrificed innocent people to summon the devourer of cities were getting what they deserved. One of the Satanists said we should print the abomination sooner rather than later. At that very moment, what they called an abomination appeared on the battlefield, a huge monster made of sacrifices. The archers began firing flaming arrows at him, but the monster waved its huge paw and all those people scattered like ragdolls. The bloodied warriors realized that arrows don't work against this creature. As the archers recovered from the attack, the mercenaries ran forward. They shouted, relaying orders to destroy everything in their path. The team watched the progress of the battle. Jazar noticed that the front line was dead center. Elsid said that the countermeasure was executed brilliantly, but the abomination is a difficult opponent. The beast will be able to resist the attacks for some time to come. Spirit said that according to his strategy, those who don't benefit from an all-out war will try to hide in their shell. Suddenly, a huge tornado began to grow over the 25th district right before our eyes. Alcide said it didn't look like a natural phenomenon. Leon suggested that it was the work of an enemy. Stepping forward, Jazar said it was their turn. Before Leon knew it, his allies were rushing into action. They all slowed down, finding themselves directly in front of an unnatural tornado. Leon could barely keep up with his team. When he caught up with them, he couldn't catch his breath. Kondrat stepped forward, saying that he was interested in testing how strong the barrier created by Satan's techniques was. Seeing the knight's sword burning with fire, Leon realized that he had a fiery aura. The boy expected nothing else from this strongest warrior. But the tornado barrier was not so easy to overcome. Khan patted Kondrat on the shoulder and said with a smirk that the weaklings had better get out of the way. Khan Feng's eyes lit up and he concentrated his strength to strike. He directed his energy straight into the epicenter of the tornado, but nothing happened. Kondrat said with a wry chuckle that the bandit had struck a magnificent blow. While the men argued, the bishop said he could break the barrier with a holy hold, but he needed to guard the holy power as there was no telling what lay ahead of them. Leon stepped forward, kneading his arm. He decided he'd seen enough of the failed attempts at attack. The rest of the team stared at the guy in surprise. Guy asked Elcide if he had accumulated enough power. The spirit replied that his energy was whipping over the top. He was brimming with power because of the enemies he had destroyed earlier. Smiling sinisterly, the spirit said that it turned out that one heretic could do far more good than a thousand demonic creatures. So the guy could hit with all his might. Leon agreed but asked that Elcide not destroy the disguise due to his overexcited state. The guy summoned his aura and began to save up his strength for a powerful attack. Such power shocked his team members. Leon dealt a crushing blow to Satan's barrier and it was successfully destroyed. In its place was a huge hole in the ground. The whole team immediately rushed there. They went down inside, straight into the void and the unknown. Neither of them knew what to expect. The team found themselves in a dark, damp dungeon. Only Jazar's strength lit the way. The elf asked if the Undertaker was among them. Their grim ally, who was almost blending in with the shadows of the dungeon, replied that he was here. 
so all six members of the squad were safely inside. Leon was surprised to note that although Jazar and Kondrat were in armor, no sound was heard from them as they walked. El Cid's explanation was that their basic movements were at a high level. The boy is still growing up to him. Suddenly, Karen ordered everyone to stop. She noticed a door that led downstairs. Looking at that door, almost all the team members decided it was a trap. Kondrat suggested going past it, but Karen said enthusiastically that it was the only door leading to the lower tier, so they'd have to try going down. Since the guildmaster said Karen was a pathfinder, Jazar asked if she could tell if a trap was set downstairs or not. The girl looked at the passage and said that it was quite difficult to do so, so she needs to get inside to explore it. The elf said that in that case, we should go down. If they dragged on, the situation might get worse. Kondrat nodded in agreement and added that we should hurry. The team moved down the stairs. It was less damp, but still dark. Leon realized that he still didn't feel the Undertaker's presence. He had no idea if he was following them. When the guy stepped on one of the steps, it lit up with a bright red light, activating some kind of spell. After a second, the guy started to fall through some unknown space. When Leon opened his eyes again, he was alone in a corridor. He didn't understand where he'd been transported. His aura sense didn't sense anyone else's presence. Else it assumed it was a classic labyrinth deception technique. The spirit explained that there had been an expansion and distortion of the space to make it larger. The others had been thrown to other ends of the labyrinth, and with any luck, they would meet soon. Luck was on their side as Karen's voice was heard a moment later. She said that as soon as she'd fallen down, she'd run right into Leon. The girl ran up to Leon and said that he must have been disturbed to find himself all alone in such a gloomy place. The guy said he was fine. He asked Karen if she had met anyone from the team. The blonde said she'd been followed by that vile bastard. Leon looked at the girl, wondering who she meant. Behind Karen, the coffin man appeared out of the shadows, asking, Who's the nefarious own here? The girl said defiantly that if he did not like such treatment, let him get out of her shadow. She resented him for annoying her with his slow speech. Leon looked at the girl and realized that he was glad he had met her. He had no need to worry about the bishop, Khan, or Kondrat. Leon suggested moving forward. The girl liked his confident tone. She asked if he was trustworthy. Smiling, Leon replied that he wouldn't disappoint her. Leon and Karen walked a few meters as they found themselves in front of five passageways. The girl decided in a flash which door they should go to. Even though she was a tracker, Leon found it strange how quickly she picked a passage. He wondered if it was normal for him to follow her blindly. Else had said she's never once been wrong, so the guy should follow her. The spirit added that the tracking abilities of this adventurous, Karen, surpassed those of the wood elves. The boy asked Elcide if she was really that gifted. The spirit replied that it was most likely because of her aura. The dark place is an advantage for her. Suddenly, Karen raised her hand and told Leon to stop, for she sensed the presence of enemies. Indeed, a little farther down the corridor stood three men in robes and masks. There was no way around them. The girl looked at Leon interestedly and asked how they should proceed. The guy used his aura to sense a stronger energy than those freaks from District 23. They were at that level where even with a holy sword it would be difficult to win. Leon firmly said that we need to get rid of these people. Karen noticed that the guy was very brave for a rank C. She said it wouldn't be shameful to ask for help. Smirking, the guy said that the girl would probably burn with shame if she lost to him. The girl summoned her aura and suggested a small competition. Leon was surprised to see a green-colored aura. Karen jumped and was near the wall in a flash. After a moment, she was already on the ceiling. Leon asked Elsid, Is this an aura skill? The spirit answered in the affirmative. Seeing the way she glued her body to the wall, one could tell that she had undergone heavy training. Elsid prompted the boy that if he was going to keep up with her speed, he needed to focus on his feet. At this time, their enemies heard extraneous footsteps in the corridors of the dungeon. When the cloaked men raised their heads, they saw Karen glued to the ceiling. The girl put her three daggers into action, and each of them found their target. Leon watched it and marveled at how she threw the daggers with incredible speed. But the Satanists were not dead. They took off their masks and revealed their terrifying nature. The thugs asked if they knew where they were now. This question seemed very stupid to the girl. She replied that they were in a slum without a master. After that, she threw her daggers once more. One of the bandits wrestled the dagger away and said they couldn't be harmed by such trinkets. But Karen only used the daggers as a distraction. She knocked her opponent to the ground with the whip. At that time, the coffin maker came up and decapitated one of the enemies. Leon thought he was lucky these two were on the same page with him. No one wants to have such powerful enemies. The guy, just wondering what kind of enemy he'd gotten, 
when suddenly his cheek was slashed by an invisible blade. He was a bit unlucky, as he had gotten the strongest bastard of the three. Leon decided to use the Providence technique and hit full force. But then he remembered that his enemy had thrown something at him. In response, his opponent grinned and looked even more sinister. Leon began to think back and realized that he had faced this kind of attack before. He was sure it was when he was fighting the stone slime. The attacks were indeed similar, but if slugs shot rocks, this monster shot spikes. Leon turned on his instincts and chopped down every spike that was aimed at him. His enemy was stunned. He couldn't believe that this boy could handle all the spikes. But before he could say it out loud, Leon came closer and used his holy sword to cut the enemy in half. The guy realized if he didn't have the anticipation skill, he wouldn't have been able to react properly. And without the holy sword, he wouldn't be able to cut this heretic in half. Alcide disagreed. He said it was all due to the effort Leon had put into dealing with this power. Holding the enemy's tentacle on her dagger, Karen approached. She wondered if the boy had dispatched the heretic so quickly. The girl said that even though he took down the enemy a few seconds later than her, the guy still did well. Even though he was a C rank, he was able to deal with the enemy alone. Karen assumed that Leon was one of those who lacked accomplishments compared to skills, a so-called beginner. The boy embarrassedly replied that she could think as she pleased. A second later, Leon noticed something strange. The sword marks left by two people who had nothing in common looked too similar. If you looked closely, you could see that the cross-section and depth of the wounds were very similar on the corpses. The boy began to ponder what this meant. It looked like the same person had killed the enemies. Elsid squinted slyly and said the boy was right in his guess. He looked at the lovely Karen, who winked at him and told him it would be harder to deal with this gang without him. She looked back at the shadow behind her and said she wasn't sure about that vile scumbag. But she thought Leon could definitely keep up with her. Karen smiled coquettishly and said she wasn't wrong about the guy. Leon silently analyzed what was happening. He asked Elsid to show him Karen's stats plate. A blue glowing screen appeared, showing the girl's high level and excellent skills, but also it said her rank, Mortician Assassin. Leon was simply shocked by such information. He had never imagined that this sweet girl was a brutal killer. Smiling sweetly, Karen asked if they could continue on their way. Speaking, she completely copied the Undertaker's slow manner of speech. Thanks to this, the boy was finally convinced of the truth of his guess. He replied that they could go on their way. Leon realized that in the sun, the girl was a rank A adventurer named Karen, and in the shadows, an elite assassin nicknamed Coffin Man. It was eerie for the guy to realize that he was now exploring a maze with one of the three great evils of the slums. It was very risky. Leon had a hard time accepting the fact that the beautiful girl creating a cheerful atmosphere around her was actually one of the ringleaders of the slum. It felt like Khan wasn't aware of this fact at all, and the guildmaster would have told him if he knew about it too. Okay him, but if the bishop discovers this deception, the girl is unlikely to be able to deal with the consequences. Leon was the only one who knew the secret of Karen's true identity. In a situation like this, there's no way she'd leave him alone. For the killer, his identity is the best kept secret. It is likely that any means will be used to silence anyone who knows the girl's secret. Leon realized that he had to be extremely cautious now. He must watch every slight change in his facial expression. After all, the killer was watching him closely. Karen had no idea yet that the guy knew. She stopped him again telling him that here they were left and there were enemies ahead again. A monster that resembled a huge four-eyed dog emerged from the shadows. When this monster's saliva hit the stone floor, it burned holes in it. Karen said with disgust that the monster was ugly and that its appearance made her not want to fight. Leon laughed because he knew it wasn't just a matter of aesthetic taste. Elsid said that it would be difficult for the girl to resist it by just throwing daggers, especially if the monster was created by satanic technique it would have the ability to regenerate. The guy asked if there was any way to get around this dog. Karen replied that it would take another 30 minutes from the top. She also said that she couldn't claim that they wouldn't encounter the same monster on their way around. Looks like they'll have to fight it after all. Leon realized that these bastards would stall until the city devourer was activated. The boy decided that in that case he should use the services of the Undertaker. He asked the Shadow if it could give the creature a mortal wound. The Undertaker replied that he could do it. Leon then said that he and Karen would tie up the dog and he should be ready to assist. Like him or not, they're all in the same boat. Karen watched this conversation intently and didn't even blink an eye when the coffin man agreed. Leon listened to himself and realized that almost all of the stamina spent on getting this far had been regained. Dot. Now he could try his best. 
Without thinking long, Leon jumped in an attempt to land the first blow on the demonic dog. The monster began to spew its toxic saliva. The deadly spray flew in different directions, but Leon was ready for it and immediately drew his holy sword, blinding his opponent with it. It was a proven method ever since the encounter with the phantom armor. The dog howled. After all, one of the main functions of the holy sword was to destroy any force and substance dangerous to life. Leon took aim and stabbed his sword straight into his opponent's neck, intending to sever an artery. But unfortunately, the guy's wound was too superficial. The demonic dog began to spit his saliva even more vigorously. The boy must have really pissed him off. Leon realized that he needed to make better use of his acumen, because next time he might not get to dodge the attack. The boy concentrated, for he needed to fend off the enemy's attack at least one more time. But then, Karen flew up and told him to hit that thing again right now. The boy exchanged glances with the girl and wondered if he should confide in her. He made the decision to team up with Karen, so he went on the attack. With his side vision, Leon saw the girl's daggers flying right beside him in the direction of the enemy. They hit the demonic dog from both sides. This attack was going to succeed. Leon tried to slit his foe's throat again, but again it barely grazed him. He realized he needed to move even faster and put more force into the blow. Even after such a powerful attack, the demonic dog looked like nothing had happened but suddenly the creature howled in pain and stopped moving, frozen in place. The demon dog's movements were stopped by the Undertaker's daggers, which pinned the creature's shadow and prevented it from moving. The sinister killer stepped out of the shadows and ordered the dog to die. Dozens of daggers pierced through the monster. He howled in pain and despair. A second later, the creature dropped dead to the floor of the underground corridor. Leon was shocked. He asked Elsied if this was the A-rank ability. The spirit noticed that the creature's wound was not regenerating. This meant that the attack had stopped that process. It was a deadly lunge to defeat the only opponent once and for all. This kind of action really fits the image of an assassin. Karen stealthily walked over to the guy and clapped him on the shoulder and said that for a hastily assembled group, they were doing a pretty good job of teamwork. Leon agreed with the girl, saying that her throwing daggers at the creature's tails was unimaginably cool. The girl replied that compared to the vile scum's lunge, it was nothing. She added that she had no idea the assassin could use such a grandiose martial art. She continued to praise Coffin Man, saying that he probably wasn't aiming for the Slum King seat for nothing after all. After that, she offered to move on as they didn't have a second to pause. The boy agreed, telling them to move out immediately. He realized that at the heart of this cleanup operation was a battle against time. They had to arrive before the ritual was over. The boys advanced further and further, but suddenly Karen froze against the wall calculating the number of opponents in front of them. Not far from them, she counted eight heretics. The girl concluded that she and Leon were moving too fast, which meant they would have to sweat this time. Looking at Karen, Leon realized that when it came to being able to assess the power of their enemies, there was no one better than her on their team. Each of the heretics was so strong that it involuntarily made one's body shudder in fear. The enemies were too dangerous, so the guys have no choice but to wait for their mission mates to join them or they will have to go in search of them. But the second option was problematic, because if they arrived too late, or they missed each other on the way, it would be over. Karen said disappointedly that they had overcome so much and had to rely on luck again. Leon was embarrassed that he knew her true nature, for from the outside she was just an ordinary adventurer. Out of nowhere, the floor of the hallway began to shake enough to knock Leon to the ground. The boy realized that it was a shockwave caused by the collision of enormous forces, and it was very close. Karen and Leon glanced over, realizing that someone on their team was now fighting. The heretics also heard the sound, and four of them went to where the fight was taking place. Leon realized that this was only to their advantage, for with this arrangement they had more options. The guys faced a difficult choice, to go to the rescue of their comrades who are now fighting, or to attack the enemies, who are many times less and break through. Leon suggested that Karen team up with the others. After all, if the separated group of enemies gains the upper hand and returns, they will have to fight on two fronts. The guy said they should try to maximize their strength. The girl nodded, saying that his argument was valid. The remaining four heretics didn't look like easy targets either. Karen said there was something she needed to do before moving out. After those words, she lay down on the floor, making the boy wonder what was going on. As it turned out, she was doing this to hear if there were any enemies nearby and to choose the safest path. When she dealt with it, she unmistakably chose the right path. Guy looked at Karen with admiration and thought about how her level of psychic ability was beyond human capabilities. As the boys moved forward, drops of blood splattered from behind the wall. 
This sight surprised them, for they had not suspected danger in the vicinity. A man appeared from behind the wall. His body was pierced by some strange roots and his blood poured onto the stone floor of the underground corridor. When Karen and Leon got a little closer, they saw that it was Kondrat's body. The man was coughing and spitting up blood, at least he was still alive. Leon rushed to his ally's aid without a second thought. He wanted to at least try to help the dying man. A dark aura surrounded the guy from all sides. He realized that there were two enemies. The heretic who had an ominous red aura told his companions to leave Leon to him. He glanced toward Karen and saw that there were two heretics attacking her. While he was only dealing with one, there were several bodies of other Satanists lying on the floor. It looked like they had been killed by Sir Kondrat. Elsid said that the guy didn't need to worry about the girl at all. A far more important problem was his opponent, who was extremely powerful. The spirit advised him to let go of all extraneous thoughts and concentrate fully on who was standing in front of him. The heretic concentrated and muttering some words began to summon his power. The space was filled with the strongest dark magic that was difficult to resist. Leon was surprised when he realized his opponent was using blue mist. The heretic shouted that the guy would turn to dust just by touching the darkness. He said that to use a wandering ghost on a lowlife like Leon would mean a luxurious death. Elsid realized that their enemy was a caller. Leon asked what that meant. The spirit explained that heretics fall into two categories. Mutants, who use satanic techniques on their bodies, and summoners, who summon beings from other dimensions. Leon realized that his enemy was a very strong opponent, so he clutched the holy sword in his hands and prepared for a serious battle. Immediately, he began to cut through the blue mist with his sword. The phenomenon was visibly receding from Leon. At first, the heretic chuckled, saying that the sword would not work on spiritual forces, but the mist cut through as if it were something tangible. Looking at this, heretic was speechless. He had never seen anyone fight a wandering ghost like that before. As he continued to cut through the fog, Leon said that there are always exceptions. As long as the holy sword was in his hands, he could cut through anything. The heretic couldn't believe what he was seeing. He thought that no matter how much aura power was put into the weapon, it was impossible for it to destroy his satanic technique. He summoned all his remaining powers and they manifested in the form of a red monster. As the monster flew towards Leon, he threw himself forward and ran straight to where the heretic was standing. The moment of surprise was used to good effect, and the guy managed to pierce through the enemy's body with his sword. The heretic grabbed his sword and asked ironically if the guy thought his attack would have any effect on him. But a second later, he realized that his wounds were not healing and Leon had managed to seriously wound him. The sword had turned Satan's art into nothing. Leon said nothing to his opponent. He grinned and thrust his sword in deeper. The heretic said nothing more. He only grunted in pain, bleeding, leaving his enemy's breathless body on the stone floor. Leon set out to exterminate the rest of the heretics. Looking at the fact that Leon had dealt with his enemy faster than her, Karen said it was a real shame on her head. Smiling, Leon replied that actually she had more opponents. Yes, and his enemy was quite squishy, but what was more important now was what was wrong with Sir Kondrat. Bleeding, he apologized for being in such a state. There was a hole in his chest and he told them to leave him alone. The man said his body will recover. It may be delayed, but it will happen. Karen guessed that things were much worse than they seemed. She interrupted the man, asking how much time he had left. Sir Kondrat grinned, wondering if the girl already knew how serious it was. Leon was shocked by Karen's next sentence. She asked the man if his condition meant that his strength was so low that he was unable to stop the bleeding. The man pressed his palm against the bleeding wound and said he could hold out for at least another hour. But he had no idea what would happen next. Leon began to analyze the situation and wondered if they would be able to clear the city of evil in just one hour and whether it would be possible to heal Kondrat immediately after the battle. If Leon hadn't been in a position to do something, he wouldn't have even wasted time thinking about it. But now he had the holy sword, and he knew how to use it. He glanced over to Elcide and he knew at once what the boy wanted. The spirit nodded in agreement. Leon touched Kondrat's arm and listened to Elcide's instructions. The spirit said that if he repeated it word for word, the holy healing arts would be activated and the wound would heal. Karen watched the boy's actions with surprise and curiosity. Leon bowed his head and began to offer a prayer to the goddess, repeating after El Cid. When the boy said those words, his hands glowed with a warm light. Kondrat couldn't believe that he would ever see such a thing in person. The glow grew brighter and the man felt the pain in his chest become less acute thanks to Leon. Karen was surprised to realize that such an ability was commensurate with the bishop's sacred reception. 
A couple seconds later, Kondrat's wound had completely healed and the gaping hole was replaced by tender, renewed skin. Kondrat jumped up and gratefully grabbed Leon's hands. He said that he had heard that Leon had planned the attack on District 25. Now the man understood why the boy was the leader. Leon listened with embarrassment to the man's question about whether he was a candidate for Cardinal of the Holy Order. Kondrat coughed and said he was too tactless for a man who owed the lad his life. And though he could not fight, he had strength enough to heal himself. Leon tensed at the man's phrase that he didn't think revealing his identity was what he wanted. But with a thumbs up, Kondrat reassured him, telling him that until Leon took a high spiritual rank in the future, he would remain silent. Leon tried to smile sincerely, but it was hindered by El Cid's remark that misunderstandings accumulate like a snowball. Karen gave Kondrat a healing elixir and told him to stay put. They need to get back to the original mission. When Leon and Karen were alone in the deserted hallways, the guy noticed the blonde was looking at him strangely. Suddenly, she pinned him against the wall, making him blush like a little boy. The girl asked with delight in her eyes if what Sir Kondrat said was true. If he is really a candidate for Cardinal, in his years, it is simply an unprecedented case. Leon was beginning to tense up at this conversation, but Karen continued. She admired his sunny aura and the fact that he had mastered the sacred healing technique. She looked at his sword and wondered who had taught him how to use aura weapons. After all, the boy was very good at it. Leon coldly replied that he was not a candidate for the cardinal's office. But Karen didn't stop. She assumed the guy was an apprentice of the Order of the Holy Iron Castle. The blonde asked him to teach her too, for she was tanning with curiosity. Leon walked past her and told her that in the future, if they became friends, he would share a few secrets with her. He thought to himself that if he hadn't known her true nature, he would have succumbed to those entreaties. The boy turned around when he heard the girl's words about how, contrary to her expectations, he had proved to be an impregnable wall. Karen was surprised that he didn't give in to her entreaties. Karen said that usually the men always honored her requests. In his head, Leon thought it was impossible to remain indifferent to such seduction, but he said aloud that they needed to move on. He asked the girl, would they look for other team members or would they try to break through alone? Tying her ponytail, the girl nonchalantly replied that they wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. Leon asked in bewilderment as to why. Karen cryptically said that once they were in place, he would understand. They walked down the long corridors in absolute silence. Suddenly, a heretic's trumpet fell from around the corner. As it turned out, they found Jazar and Khan. The men had managed to take out several enemies. Looking at the state of the corpses, Leon thought he felt sorry for the heretics. Jazar said he was glad to see the boys unharmed. When he heard this, the undertaker came out of the shadows. He asked the bishop if he was glad to see him. The man turned his back to him and said he had no idea he was there. Leon spoke about what had happened to Sir Kondrat. He also added that they had no time to wait for him to recover. The bishop was in agreement with this, so he said they would go with the five of them. Khan called out to Karen saying that if she was an adventurer, she must have a useful artifact to share. The girl nonchalantly replied that she wasn't going to talk to a bloodsucker who siphons blood from the common people. Khan was very angry at the girl's words, but Jazar stopped their argument and said he would now announce their plan of action. Since Bishop had a resistance to satanic techniques, he would be in the vanguard. Khan and Karen would move to the middle of the line. Leon would protect the rear of the team by being at the end of their procession. The guy was a trump card and he needed to be protected. Khan chuckled at the fact that this rookie adventurer was going to be used as a bargaining chip. Next, the gang leader asked what Jazar would say about the Undertaker. Leon said that if no one minded, let him join him. After all, the Undertaker had already helped him once. Karen confirmed that he had contributed to their successful reunion. Guy noticed that the blonde was desperate. Khan indifferently said that they could take the Undertaker for themselves. After all, he wasn't listening to anyone anyway. In the darkness of the corridor, the team saw an otherworldly blue glow. As they got closer, Jazar said that this light looked like a space created with satanic techniques. The bishop focused and summoned his power to deal with the problem. He ran forward and, telling the team to follow him, rushed straight into this strange tunnel. Each of the team members obediently followed him. They all found themselves in an unpleasant darkness. Leon realized that, aura sense aside, he could hear and see absolutely nothing. Leon got out of the tunnel as quickly as he entered it. When the entire team made it out of the otherworldly tunnel, they noticed that they were surrounded by enemies. It looks like the heretics knew in advance that this is where they were coming from and were waiting for them. One of the chief heretics said he didn't think to wait so long for guests. He said the team was very slow. 
With irony in his voice, the ringleader said he was heartily grateful for their presence. When Jazar saw the mark on this heretic's forehead, he realized that a preacher stood before them. Leon asked El Cid if the man standing before them was the leader of the ranks of the heretics. The spirit said he was. The mentor explained that there are devotees. They use a satanic technique received from someone. There are also believers. They, in the course of their independent study of satanic techniques, have become absorbed in this power. Finally, the leaders are the preachers. When compared to the church, they are high-ranking bishops. The so-called bishop said that today is a truly wonderful day. After all, the ritual had been successful and the lives taken had borne fruit. He exclaimed that he didn't think he would get to demonstrate the teachings of the true God in front of a narrow-minded servant of the goddess. All the team members listened to the preacher in disgust. Khan asked if the ritual was successful, why nothing happened. The preacher said ominously that the process had already started and there was nothing they could do to fix it. They were seconds away from finishing. Leon feared that if the ritual was successful, their plan would go to hell. But Elsied reassured him that there was still time. The spirit said that the principle of summoning a city devourer was like fishing. Using the life force essence, the monster is lured out of the otherworldly dimension. In short, until the monster fish bit, they still had time. Leon clarified that it comes out unknown when the monster will find the bait and take the bait. The spirit said it did, so they could have a whole hour to spare, or just a few seconds. It was a race against time. The bishop began to pray, asking the goddess to send her light upon them so that they would not be lost in the darkness. The answer to the prayer was a bright light that was approaching the enemies. Those creepy monsters couldn't bear to look at that light for a second. They clenched their teeth and closed their eyes. El Cid told Leon that this technique combines aura and holy technique. This light would be enough to hold back the satanic summoning technique. The spirit suggested that using his light would be much more effective. But in any case, it would stop the satanic ritual for a while. Karen joined the battle. She summoned an aura and used it to throw her daggers at the enemies. Without blinking an eye, the preacher grabbed one of his allies and put him under the daggers, covering himself with it. A heated battle began. Blood spattered around and body parts flew around. Leon decided that if the preacher still hadn't entered the fray, it meant that the place he was defending was the core of the ritual. The guy realized that as long as these bastards were unable to use their satanic techniques, the circle had to be broken. As if reading the guy's mind, the preacher said that breaking the circle would not seal the spell. Leon stood and mentally came up with a plan of further action. The preacher waved his hand and a variety of monsters began to emerge from the portals. Leon stood in front of a pack of huge creatures with red glowing eyes. Leon asked El Cid why all these monsters looked like dogs. The spirit replied that the summoning technique had been broken. He said that it must have been through an inferior satanic technique that the heretic had created the chimera. It was an imperfect creature, which meant it would destroy itself. The boy thought that even such an imperfect creature was enough to buy some time. Perhaps the activation of the ritual was really inevitable. Seeing a huge number of otherworldly monsters, Khan said he would point them to their place. Without further thought, the man rushed into action and pounced on the first monster. He stabbed his body in two, splattering green blood everywhere. But when the green liquid came in contact with Khan's bare skin, it began to sting like it was acid. The next monster was attacked by Karen. The girl's sharp daggers flew at it, but they did absolutely no damage at all because they didn't go through the poison armor. Perhaps the monsters had no pain reflexes to begin with. Jazar shouted that at this rate they were in for an endless battle until their strength ran out. The danger above them only increased. Leon clutched the holy sword tighter and decided that he needed to make his way to the core of the ritual as soon as possible. The situation was complicated by the fact that he couldn't use the sword's power to its fullest extent. Else had warned that if those creatures noticed the hero's existence, things would become even more difficult. But if you take the enemies by surprise, the situation can be improved. Leon was aware of the fact that his role at the moment was to deliver the final blow. The whole team must do their best to stop the mad heretics. The preacher spread his arms out to the sides, and the portal glowed brighter. The heretic said with awe in his voice that the devourer of cities had finally answered their call. The portal turned into a crazy red tornado. Leon could feel his heart pounding frantically in his chest. The lad realized that an all-consuming terror was approaching that he had never experienced before. Leon wanted to use his sword, but Elsid said he was still not allowed to do so. But he advised him to use a sacred technique, using half of his accumulated power. The guy doubted it would work, but the spirit said, it would be hard, but effective. 
Elsid said that thanks to the moon that Jazar created, he had an idea. To fully reproduce the goddess symbol, you need both the sun and the moon. And just here, people with the auras of the sun and moon were gathered, and the combination of bishop and hero allowed for a complex sacred technique. Elsid displayed the spell in front of Leon and ordered him to read it. As soon as the guy started saying those words out loud, the space around him flashed with a bright light. The bishop recognized in these words the writing of the first song of the goddess. Khan noticed that another sphere had formed overhead. And so it was. The sun was also formed near the moon. Karen stood near the two spheres and felt the warmth emanating from them. Leon concentrated on continuing to recite the spell. He didn't pay attention to any changes around him. He spat out the rest of his energy and the spheres that were on top of him began to spin. The monsters couldn't contain their screams as they came under the rays of this light. Elsid said the sanctuary is the perfect counter to satanic techniques. The space that emerges rejects all foreign beings and principles. Taking advantage of the opportune moment, the team began to massacre the confused monsters. The heretic preacher couldn't believe that the goddess's henchmen could pull such a thing off. Snapping his fingers, he said he would destroy every one of them. After that, something strange began to happen to the bodies of his minions. They were breaking apart as if in convulsions. After a couple seconds, their insides flew apart. The preacher shouted that he was sorry that valuable heretic lives had to be sacrificed to stop this bunch of enemies. Holding the heart of one of the heretics in his hands, he shouted that this is what real God's favor looks like. After these words, strange reddish shadows began to hover around the preacher's body. They formed what looked like a cocoon with a man inside. The body of the head of the heretics began to transform. Muscles and red horns began to appear. Leon and Jazar watched this frightening transformation anxiously. The heretic, who no longer resembled a man at all, said he would prove the truth of their god who had granted him such power. He looked like a demon from the underworld. He had horns, spider-like legs, and clawed hands. Else it said that the effect of the sanctuary technique is not very long. When the effect of it wears off, this monster will be impossible to resist. Leon decided that now was the time to act. He grabbed his sword and prepared to fight. Khan and the rest of the team followed the guy's example. They began to attack this satanic monster, but the blows had little effect. Smiling ominously, the preacher said it was now his turn to attack. He used his power and the entire space around him began to shake. From this attack, Leon was thrown back several meters. When the guy landed, he realized that he and his opponent had too much size difference. Also, the monster had tremendous strength and amazing regeneration. The holy sword seemed to be the only effective tool. But could the boy defeat him with a single blow? Looking at this spawn of hell, Leon realized that if he failed, they might lose their only chance to stop this freak. Leon listened as the monster mocked them, saying that they were like bugs while he was overflowing with power. Guy turned his head and saw Jazar and the rest of the crew lying on piles of rocks in a semi-conscious state. Leon had a hard time imagining a way out of this situation. After all, the heretics had knocked everyone out with just one blow. He saw Karen crawl out from under the rubble. Rubbing her head, she tried to regain consciousness. Leon immediately rushed over to the girl, asking if she was okay. Karen said she seemed fine. Blood was flowing from her temple and lips. She said that neither her attack nor the Undertaker's attack had any effect on this monster preacher. Looking back at the girl's ability stats, Leon remembered that she, like the Coffin Man, possessed a shadowy gate and an idea popped into his head. He asked the blonde to help him, and Karen realized that Leon had some sort of plan of action. The boy briefly outlined the plan. He would come up from behind and, after destroying the magic circle, interrupt the ritual. The priority was not defeating the monster. Karen said it was impossible. She wouldn't be able to break through the enemy's defenses and get behind him. Leon shouted irritably that it was possible to make a jump through space. But the blonde pretended not to understand what the guy was talking about. Leon became angry at the girl's pretense, so he shouted that he would not reveal the secret of the Undertaker's identity, but she must help him. Those words made Karen nervous. She didn't think the boy could guess her secret. Leon said he didn't know the reasons for the girl's double life, but if they failed the mission now, everyone would die, including the two of them. You could see the struggle going on inside Karen between survival and the fear of revealing her secret. In the end, she agreed, saying it wasn't hard for her to help. But there was a but. The girl asked, since when did he know who she was? Karen said that he could have said he knew about her right away. She covered her face with her hands, saying she was about to burn with shame. Leon replied that if he had spoken up right away, she would have put a dagger in his throat. Karen put the dagger to his throat and said he was right. After all, a woman's secrets are too valuable. 
At this time, Khan approached the bishop and asked him how long he would be laid up. Khan had blood running down his face, but still he grinned and said that Jazar was weak. Jazar opened his eyes and despite the pain all over his body, asked if the man was tired of living. While the men argued, Leon and Karen decided to start putting their plan into action. They ran together for a few meters, and then the girl stopped and said she shouldn't go any further. She reasoned that if she followed the guy further, the heretic monster might figure out their plan. Leon looked at the girl and wished her not to die in the fulfillment of her plan. She was touched by this phrase. But she pretended not to care, saying that many priests were concerned about her fate. As Leon ran, he remembered that shadow walk allows you to cross space. Karen most likely used small crossings for the murders. So the guy assumed that such a flip would be enough to get behind that bastard's back. The boy felt himself being swallowed up and dragged down by the shadows. A short time later, Leon was already standing in front of the core of the urban devourer summoning ritual. In the middle of this portal, the guy saw something that looked like a blob of life force. Else it allowed that this could be the result of more than 10,000 lives being sacrificed. Leon clenched his sword tightly and said resolutely that he would never forgive something like this. Seeing that the boy was about to go into the thick of it, Jazar cautiously called out to Leon, but it was too late. The heretic monster had him on one of its sharp paws. Leon couldn't fully comprehend what was happening as blood gushed from his mouth. El Cid started to call out to the guy in horror, hoping it wasn't as serious as it seemed. The heretic was smiling with his mouth full. He called the boy a mud of the goddess and ordered him to surrender. He raised his paw higher and the boy's feet lifted off the ground. The heretic said that Leon had lost his last chance. The monster began to pray to his god, asking him to accept Leon's imminent death. Khan and Jazar rushed towards them, pondering what could be done in this situation. The monster used its power again and scattered the men in different directions. The chief heretic told the men not to worry, for their turn would come. He looked at Leon's motionless body and assumed the guy was already dead. Leon was still alive, but he saw no point in fighting. He wondered if he was destined to die like this. He had not yet become a worthy hero, had he? El Cid shouted something, but Leon heard absolutely nothing. The boy remembered how he and the spirit had agreed to go to the Titan Mountains together. Leon realized that he would most likely not be able to keep that promise. For some reason, the image of Lion popped into his head, saying that he believed in his promises and that he would fulfill them no matter what the cost. This memory gave Leon strength. After all, he was the one who always kept his promises, and to do that, he had to survive. Leon managed to snatch his sword and cut off the vile monster's paw. Thanks to this, he was able to free himself from the heretic's grip. The monster was infuriated by this action, for he thought the guy was living out his last minutes. Leon landed heavily on the ground, leaving pools of blood on the stone floor. He tried to rise to his feet, but his body trembled and refused to obey. There seemed to be no chance of success. Nevertheless, a warrior's destiny is to strive for victory. So the guy gathered the rest of his strength and slowly rose to his knees, meeting the gaze of his enemy. Elsid marveled at his ward's willpower. He was very proud of him at this moment. Leon was able to get to his feet. As he pointed his sword at the enemy, he thought that being a hero, he should defeat this thing and save everyone. The heretic laughed loudly, saying he recognized the boy's willpower. He liked it when his opponent, even in death, would not let go of his sword. Monster said if the guy was so tough, let him try his next move. But then the shape of the dead Emperor Rodrigo appeared and said that he was left with no choice but to intervene. Leon felt someone's presence and heard a voice saying that he had already done his best so he would help him. The spirit of Emperor Rodrigo told his disciple to watch carefully. Leon smiled as he realized that something interesting was about to happen. After all, Rodrigo was going to use the Big Bear Sword technique. The guy's sword lit up with a bright flame. It looked like it was going to scorch all the impurities in the room. The monster-turned-heretic didn't realize what was going on or how the guy managed to get past him. With just one swing of his sword, Leon was able to chop off the monster's head without any problems. The severed head continued to chortle ominously. The monster asked if the guy really thought it would be over if his head flew off his shoulders. But when the heretic tried to use regeneration and patch up his body, he realized that this skill didn't work. Leon looked on in disgust when even with his head cut off, the heretic was still alive. The guy started taunting the monster, saying that he could function just fine without his head. The headless body roared, screaming that such disrespect would not be enough to simply wash away with blood. Leon looked at his trembling hands and realized that the injury had made the power of the destructive force insufficient. He wasn't sure if his body could withstand a second blow. But then he heard the voice of Emperor Rodrigo saying that he would give him a great lesson. Rodrigo assisted Leon's second strike with a great chariot hold. The heretic's body was chopped in two. 
The beast didn't understand why it couldn't regenerate. What was left of the heretic began to curl up into a cocoon, saying that in that case, he'd have to drag them all with him. It began to spin around rapidly, seemingly sucking in the air from this hall. The monster was screaming that he wanted all his enemies dead. Leon knew this would happen, so he didn't attack at full strength. The guy smiled wickedly and said that last he wanted to give him a good kick in the ass. The image of Emperor Rodrigo smiled and told Leon to watch carefully and not to overlook anything. The whole point of the technique was based on the connection between the stars. The Emperor Spirit explained that Leon, as an inexperienced warrior, might find it difficult to handle even the first stage. But you could redirect the power to the sword and then everything would work out. The boy tried to do exactly what the Spirit said. The space around him glowed and the monster's single eye widened in horror. Leon attacked again, but this time he wasn't aiming at the monster anymore. His target was the core of the ritual, which had safely shattered into small pieces. What was left of the heretic monster screeched and ran away. The creature didn't understand why it couldn't self-destruct and take its enemies with it. After a couple seconds, this monster began to be sucked into the portal, but the city devourer began to emerge from the portal, so the former heretic went straight into its jaws. The monster they had been trying to summon for so long appeared, shattering the stone floor of the hall. But just as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished, leaving Leon standing in bewilderment. The portal must have closed in time for the creature to escape. When Leon asked if it was really the city devourer, El Cid said they were on edge. The spirit said that if they were even a second late, they could become an appetizer for the monster. At this time, the rest of the team began to slowly come to their senses. Only El Cid wanted to praise the guy for a job well done when suddenly Leon started coughing up blood. The bishop flashed over to him, saying there was no need to waste energy talking. Jazar wanted to start treating the boy immediately. He used his healing skills and began working on Leon's wound. The bishop lamented that a great misfortune had almost happened. The elf said that they were very lucky that they were able to get completely sorted out in time. Leon wanted to ask the man to look over the other members of the team, but the object of his worries was already standing in front of them. Karen wondered if they had one. For when she came to her senses, all she saw was a bright flash and the death of a heretic. Here, Khan joined the conversation and shouted and asked what had happened to the ritual. The man wanted an explanation. Leon said that the activation of the urban devourer had been stopped. The preacher was pulled into his own portal where he died. Leon called for the bishop and said that if he wasn't taken care of now, he would pass out. A second later, Leon was already lying unconscious. Leon lay smiling, for he was pleased with the work he had done. El Cid was proud of him, so he said he was doing a great job. Suddenly, the whole room began to shake and collapse. Jazar explained that the creator of the space had died. The dawn sun rose over the 25th district. The battle was over with a win. Emperor Rodrigo's spirit summarized the results. It was quite dangerous this time because the enemy was serious, and the guy hadn't even learned how to form an aura properly. He decided that the spirit of the sword should protect the boy better. After all, what good is a dead hero? The spirit of Emperor Rodrigo decided that whatever the case, the crisis had been overcome, and what had happened would be a good lesson for Leon. But there was a catch. We had to use the power without breaking the seal. But if the guy keeps practicing hard, he can reach higher ranks faster. Leon should be able to take care of himself before heading to the Titan Mountains. It was a serene, peaceful morning in Blaine. Leon was resting after the battle in the room of the Adventurer's Building. When he woke up, he was in a panic trying to figure out where he was. As soon as the boy got out of bed, an unbearable pain pierced his body. He screamed, unable to cope with those painful electric shocks all over his body. Leon scrutinized his entire body and noticed that he was almost completely wrapped in bandages. Suddenly, memories of the hard-fought battle he and the team had managed to win came flooding back to him. He seemed to pass out immediately after defeating the enemy. Leon looked around and realized he was in the Guild Infirmary. He was in a rather luxurious hospital room. The guy was surprised that there wasn't a sacred sword spirit around. So he called out to El Cid. The spirit's appearance was strange, different from the usual, which alerted Leon quite a bit. The spirit that appeared didn't look as clear as usual. His image told Leon to listen carefully. First of all, he congratulated the guy on his recovery. He did not congratulate him on the victory because according to him, it was won thanks to him. He then got straight to the point and said that he would not be able to talk to the guy for one month. Leon was shocked by such news. He didn't think that Elsid could leave him even for a while. The spirit noticed that the boy was upset by this news, but nothing could be done. Elsid appeared, breaking all prohibitions, 
so the power of the sword limited his consciousness. Leon asked if it was all because he used his body during the battle. Elsid said it was because he was too good-looking. The spirit told the boy not to worry. He would only be gone for one month. Also, he added that the next time they met, he hoped that the guy would be able to demonstrate a perfect aura formation. Elsid said that he had shown him the use of the great bear sword technique. Now Leon would have to practice what he had seen on his own. Leon thought about the fact that he would like to see with his own eyes how Rodrigo had personally used the technique in the past. El Cid finished his message by saying that the boy had worked hard. Now he has to train hard. Leon replied with confidence that he could handle the task. El Cid's image vanished, leaving the boy alone with his thoughts. Leon thought that the great chariot was really an amazing technique. When El Cid controlled his body, Leon had a different view of the situation before him. His mind went blank and his eyes became as clear as glass. At that moment, a completely different world appeared before his eyes. Another was even the flow of atmospheric air and the wavelength of the oscillations. The guy even developed the ability to see through the distortion of space. Leon wanted to reach a similar level of vision art, as well as develop his aura enough to master the Big Bear Sword technique. The boy couldn't say his mood was irrevocably ruined, but for some reason the spirit's words gave off a muffled ache in his head. Leon was distracted from these thoughts by a knock on the door. Jazar entered the room and was very happy to see Leonov conscious. The boy asked the bishop how many days it had been since he had passed out. The bishop said that their battle with the heretics ended three days ago. The moment the five members of the advance team broke out of the maze, it collapsed and the entire abomination disappeared. Perhaps some unknown satanic technique had been used. Fifty-six people died and 107 were seriously injured. It took many sacrifices to successfully complete the operation. Jazar said that this result could be called a victory. It was a victory because evil had not succeeded in realizing its insidious plans. The bishop said he had made inquiries about the city devourer. It was a terrible thing. So Leon averted a terrible tragedy. The boy disagreed with the bishop. He said it was not his merit. The victory belonged to all members of the team. Looking wistfully out the window, Jazar said he wasn't sure if that was actually the case. Finally, he looked at Leon and said that if he hadn't joined the team, it was likely that the outcome would have been very different. Leon was very confused by these words. It was as if the bishop knew the truth about El Cide. Smiling, Jazar turned to Leon and said the guy looked overly surprised. Looking at the blue skies outside the window, the bishop said that when he saw the boy's actions during the operation, he understood everything. His words meant that he had guessed about El Cide from the beginning. He explained that he was a member of the knightly order of the Iron Castle. He has a huge life experience, as huge as the lifespan of an elf. Inside himself, Leon knew that Jazar wasn't the kind of man who could be fooled for long. Bishop said that no matter how powerful Leon's solar aura was, he wouldn't be able to cut down such a serious opponent with such ease. The elf added that besides, Leon's abilities are not yet honed enough to be called a master. Leon was embarrassed by the remark, but said he agreed with Jazar. The bishop said there was nothing to be ashamed of. He added that he greatly admired Leon's courage. He added that he greatly admired Leon's courage in taking the risk despite knowing that he was inexperienced. And the blow struck at the end proved decisive. The elf recognized the sword technique of the great bear sword, created by the greatest warrior in history, Rodrigo. Jazar said he remembered mentioning the technique in a book that described the actions of heroes of the past, so he couldn't believe that Rodrigo had reappeared. Leon smiled and said that after those words he would no longer be able to dodge the answer. Guy asked the bishop if he remembered the sword Leon had used in the labyrinth. The elf thought for a moment and replied that if his memory served him right, he had disappeared at some point. That was why he hadn't been able to take it with him. Leon remembered that Elcid had said that even in his absence he could use the sword. So now he wanted the sword to show its true form. The space around electrified and the guy started to pull out the holy sword. Jazar couldn't believe his eyes. He had only heard of this weapon in legends. But here in front of him was a young lad who wielded this legendary sword. The bishop's breath caught. He could find no words to describe his shock and delight. He fell to his knees and began to pray to the goddess in awe. Jazar immediately began apologizing for not recognizing the goddess's divine energy right away. Leon, in turn, apologized for hiding that fact. The bishop asked the guy if he was going to continue to hide his identity. Leonu looked at his bandaged hand and said, Yes, after all, the seal of the holy sword had not yet been broken, and his skills were not sufficiently honed. The guy said that when he himself is not ashamed to call himself a hero, then he will reveal his identity. 
Jazar said he already looks like a hero in his eyes, but if the guy is willing, he'll keep it a secret. However, the bishop only asked the guy to share the information with one and only one person. Leon asked who the man was. Jazar said he was talking about the saint. She is the only one he can trust with such a secret. The bishop clarified that although the handover ceremony has not yet been finalized, such news will help her recover her spirits. Leon thought that if the conversation was about the saint, he had no objection. So he gave his approval to the bishop. Jazar brightened and thanked Leon profusely. Suddenly, Leon realized that they were talking quite loudly, and those standing outside the door could hear them. But Jazar reassured the boy by telling him that the room was under a spell that prevented him from hearing anything outside, so no one would know about their conversation. But then there was a knock at the door. The bishop said that the visitor could come in. Karen walked into the room. She looked stunning in her dress. She said hello to Leon and told him it was the first time they had seen each other in three days. Both Leon and Jazar felt some strange atmosphere. Seeing their skewed faces, the girl said that if her arrival was too unexpected, she would stop by later. Leon suddenly remembered that when they had been on a mission together, he had found out that Karen's true identity was the Undertaker. He was one of the three main villains of the slums that even Khan couldn't recognize. During the fight, the guy said he'd turn a blind eye to her double life. But no matter how you look at it, that promise was a verbal entreaty. It was clear why the girl wanted a clearer answer. But Karen had come at a very bad time. For now, the bishop was beside them. But to his surprise, the girl said it was all right. After all, he'd caught her red-handed anyway. Karen smiled, but the bishop didn't look surprised. He calmly continued to drink his tea. The guy was shocked. He, that only he knew the truth about the girl's true identity. Turns out Jazar was aware of what was going on. He said it was his aura. The auras of the sun and moon can resonate. They're sensitive to interference in that connection. Bishop added that it was very surprising that people with such rare attributes as sun, moon, and now also a shadow would be in the same place. Jazar assumed that Leon must have realized everything when the jump through space occurred. Leon, embarrassed, wondered if the bishop would reprimand him. He knew who Karen was, but he'd kept it from him. The bishop said he had no right to judge anyone. He can't judge because Leon gave someone a chance to be at their best. Jazar said that he was initially reluctant to cooperate with the assassin. But still, Karen stayed on the battlefield until the very end. The bishop pointed out that shedding her blood would hardly cleanse her of her sins. But at least she had done something worthy. Leon figured that if Karen was only a cold-blooded killer, she wouldn't have helped them. Guy felt the atmosphere in the room soften. Karen wondered in bewilderment why Jazar and Leon were smiling so strangely. She clarified if they meant her the date of the death penalty. The girl was embarrassed when the bishop called out to her in a stern voice. Jazar said that first he would like to hear her story about why she leads such a lifestyle. Karen was quite surprised. After all, no one had ever tried to find out her motives before. Standing in front of Leon and Jazar, the girl asked, Who do they think is the most hated person in the world? Not one of the people in the room could find an answer. Then the girl glumly answered her own question. It's an orphan. And if you add mixed race to the mix, you've got the whole package. Leon realized that the past she dared to reveal did not look like an easy story at all. Karen said she wasn't just a hungry, defenseless orphan. She was a member of the lowest class, the one who was exposed to all sorts of dangers in the slums. One day, a girl was rescued by one man. But unfortunately, the outstretched helping hand turned out to be filled with evil to the very tips of her fingers. The girl said it was a common practice to catch orphans and raise them into cold-blooded killers. Out of a hundred children, at least one would pay off. Most likely, even for the man who caught her, the girl's future was a surprise. She had the blood of a human and a dark elf in her. She awakened her abilities early on, for which she earned the nickname The Coffin Maker. Over time, the girl's status rose, and soon she was second to her boss. Karen bowed her head and said sadly that dealing with the boss was the easiest thing to do. It took her no more than seven seconds. Having eliminated the organization's boss herself, Karen has risen to the position of one of the three main forces of the slum. She had become an unwanted assassin and had repeatedly committed murders that many were not happy with. But Karen no longer wanted to live as an undertaker. After clearing the organization of debris, Karen freed orphans who had been captured for the same reason she had. Her activities as an undertaker had become rare. Wanting to start living a normal life, she began working as an adventurer to wash away the dirt of her past. She smiled sadly and said that after all, her deception had been exposed in this way. After hearing the girl's story, Leon and Jazar were immersed in sad thoughts. Now they had a better understanding of the murderer before them. 
Karen clenched her fists and said that now that her identity was revealed, she didn't think she could escape the Holy Church, but in view of her assistance in the last mission, she asked for a sentence of hard labor instead of prison bars. Leon and the bishop didn't even know what to say to the girl's request. Jazar looked at the boy with a pleading look. It was obvious that he was asking him for help. Leon was astonished that the bishop was going to leave it up to him to decide the matter, though it made sense that Jazar left the sentencing to Leon since he considered him a new hero. The boy began to analyze Karen's story. He realized that she had not become a killer by choice, but no matter how terrible her fate was, she showed herself in the fight against evil. Also, her desire to live a new life didn't seem fake to Leon. In this situation, even a hero wouldn't have the right to speak of forgiveness. However, he saw no need to point his sword at someone who was repentant. Leon says he will give Karen two options to choose from. He and the bishop promise to respect her choice no matter what she chooses. Karen didn't understand why Leon and not the bishop was making the decision. Speaking of which, Leon also at this point wanted to hide his identity. The only people who know about him are the bishop and in the long run, the saint. Leon wondered if it was okay to share his secret about being a so-called hero with Karen. As if reading the guy's mind, Jazar said that the idea didn't seem bad at all. The bishop added that the girl might be useful in the future. Karen didn't understand at all what he was talking about. Leon made a decision. He told Karen that he was going to show her something now and after that she should make her choice. Karen watched as bright flashes and lightning bolts enveloped the room, thickening the air. The girl watched, shocked, as Leon materialized an ancient sacred weapon, a holy sword in his hand. Leon fully recovered and left the guild only a week after the battle with evil. He was grateful to everyone who had taken care of him during this time. But the guildmaster assured the boy that they should be grateful to him, because he had saved the city. Guildmaster Bernard asked if the boy was happy with the arrangement he had chosen for himself. Leon replied firmly that he was fine with it. Bernard smiled warmly and said that he was glad to see Leon anyway. If the boy changed his mind, he could always turn to him, for he had extensive connections. Leon walked out of the guild building and staggered forward through the streets of Blaine. Not far from the adventurer's building, Karen was waiting for him. Leon was happy to see the girl, but he wondered what she wanted. Karen looked the guy over and noticed the noticeably bulging muscles under the black t-shirt. She playfully kicked him with her elbow and said that Leon had matured a lot in the time they'd been away. Karen said she had heard about Leon seeing the guild leader right after he was discharged. The boy replied that it was about his reward for his help. The girl asked in surprise what the reward was. The boy said that he had been offered an adventurer rank upgrade to A. Embarrassed, Leon added that he declined the offer. Karen was flabbergasted by this. She didn't understand how it was possible to refuse a promotion. Furthermore, the guy also shared that the guild leader had offered to introduce him to the Lord. Embarrassed even more, Leon said he turned down that offer too. Karen's jaw just dropped from what she heard. She asked the guy if he was an idiot by any chance. The girl could not understand why, having drawn a lucky lottery ticket, the guy thoughtlessly threw it in the trash can. Leon said that if he had taken advantage of those offers, his role in the battle would have been made public. Karen realized where he was going with this. Other evil factions would know of Leon's existence. The guy said that he still borrowed the power of the Holy Sword to resist enemies. He needs more training to solve problems on his own. Karen guessed that was the reason Leon had made her such an offer. The essence of the offer was that the girl could become an ally of Leon, marching under the banner of the Holy Sword of Alcidas. Karen took a little time to think about it, but it looked like the answer was ripe. They walked with Leon through the clearing until the girl said they had found the perfect spot. Karen explained that to the elves of the forest, the trees were as sacred as the goddess. She was no exception, for she had elven blood in her. To Karen, the guy's suggestion sounded like whether she wanted to live in the sunshine instead of the dark. Before answering, she wanted to be honest. She said she was not conscious about the blood she had spilled because she had survived because of it. For her, born in the gutter, death and suffering provided an opportunity to change her life for the better. The girl said sadly that she hoped someone like her would not be born into the world. She knew no love and mastered only the art of killing. Karen wished no one could live like her. Leon was amazed that this seemingly brutal killer deep down wanted to make this world a better place. Karen sat on her knees and said that if the guy was able to help her in this endeavor, she would be insanely grateful to him. And from now on, I'm ready to devote myself to serving him my whole life. Looking at the girl, Leon wondered if he was ready to take on such a responsibility. But then he remembered Elsie's words that this is the duty of a hero, to make this world a better place. He gave Karen his hand and said that he would help the girl in her desires, because then there would be at least one less suffering person in the future. 
The moment their hands touched, the Undertaker died. Only Karen survived. The newfound allies were sitting under a tree, talking peacefully. Leon suddenly wondered what had happened to Khan. Leon hadn't heard from him, so he assumed he had simply returned to the slums. Karen was surprised that the guy hadn't heard anything about Khan running away. It is said that right on the day after the decisive battle, he packed his belongings and left the walls of the city. Karen Savvy Khan was a nimble bastard, so no one would be able to get on his tail. Leon laughed and said there was nothing unexpected about it. His escape is logical, because due to the battle, the slums have been destroyed almost halfway and will be demolished permanently, especially since there are still records of his collaboration with evil. Khan will not escape the punishment of the Knights of the Holy Iron Castle. He will be sentenced to either hard labor or a prison term. Still, Leon didn't think the man would run away so soon. Karen replied that the man had his head in the sand, so he was in a hurry. Leon thought that perhaps it had occurred to him that they would cross paths again. Leon stared at the girl's beautiful figure, but her further words distracted him. She said she wanted to know what his future plans were. After all, he couldn't move on without making plans. Looking the guy in the eye, she said it was not befitting of a hero. Leon was surprised by the emphasis on the word hero. He thought about how to tell her about his and El Cid's aspirations. The plan itself existed. After obtaining rank B, Leon planned to go to the Titan Mountains. He hoped that a hundred days would be enough time to polish his aura and reach the right rank. If the time frame is limited to a hundred days, the guy has plenty of time to spare. The only problem is that El Cid has fallen into a slumber. Karen saw the expression on Leon's face turn anxious, but the guy still decided that Karen could help him reach his goal. Leon suddenly realized that in front of him was an A-rank adventurer and part-time professional assassin. The girl had all five senses heightened. Also, it is able to use its surroundings to move and maneuver. Smiling broadly, Leon said he would be counting on her for a while. Karen genuinely didn't understand the change in the guy's behavior. Leon got out of his seat and ran, saying that they had to go to the bishop. The girl felt uneasy, so she demanded an immediate explanation. Leon calculated in his head that it would be another three weeks before Elseed awakened. Until then, he wanted to hone his aura skills. Plus, he wanted to try to challenge the big bear's technique and master at least basic lunges. As Leon ran, he realized he was eagerly awaiting Elsid's reaction. They arrived in the 13th district. Fortunately, thanks to the bishop, food supplies are available there. On the streets, food was distributed to refugees who had evacuated from the 23rd district. There were quite a few people in need of help, among them mothers with small children. The man who was distributing the bread said it was not his property and gave the little boy an extra loaf. He told his mother that if she was grateful, let her go to the temple and pray to the goddess. After all, if it were not for the church, they would not have gotten help. The woman realized that from now on she would have more faith in the grace of the goddess. People who came to the church noticed that the atmosphere here was completely different than in the 23rd district. It was very peaceful, but a sudden loud sound within the confines of the church made one doubt what was said. The people became agitated and now doubted that they were in a safe place. The reason for the strange sound was Leon and Karen's increased training. Wielding her deadly daggers, the girl taught the boy a variety of techniques. One second ago, she was standing in front of Leon, and now she was gone. She was at his back in a flash, ready to attack. But Leon had exposed this maneuver in time and now knew how to proceed. He was able to dodge the blonde's powerful kick and took a better position. The girl noticed that Leon could move his legs better than she thought. Laughing, she said that now he was more suited to the image of an assassin than a knight. Leon listened with annoyance that for the moment his skills were the same as a talented recruit. The girl explained to him that the techniques themselves were not bad, but there were some gaps. Ordering her to continue training further, Karen disappeared from Leon's sight. She created an illusory doppelganger in just two steps and attacked the guy. The guy realized that if he was going to keep up with her speed, he had to use the vision technique. He looked closely at the girl's images and deduced almost imperceptible differences. Swinging his sword, he chose an object to attack, for the false image was on his left. Karen was shocked when Leon attacked her. It turns out he could tell the difference between the fake and the original. Leon didn't answer anything, only stared intently at the blonde. Karen said she used almost no aura and moved like she was in a real fight. Now she wanted to test the extent to which the guy was perceptive. The girl decided to use one of her favorite tricks. Leon realized that Karen had applied the mirage technique. Earlier, he had clearly seen an illusory doppelganger, but now the real cloning technique was in front of him. One of Karen's clones said she was starting. The guy determined the girl's speed was slower, but the problem was the multiple faces. She was making her eyes water. 
Leon was disoriented. He was straining his eyes so hard that he couldn't keep track of Karen's many incarnations. So the boy could not notice that Karen was already standing behind him, holding a sharp dagger to his throat. She lightly poked the blade in her neck and said Leon would be dead by now. Karen said, thus their score, 102 fights and 102 wins that belong to a girl. Leon threw his hands up in the air and said he was giving up. He asked if Karen was enjoying bullying him so much. The blonde said it was great fun. Karen said that the action of the aura was similar to strengthening the body. The boy had no throws, and he should have considered the fact that they were fighting in an open area. Karen's point was that all of the terms were favorable to Leon, yet he didn't prevail. Her words scared the boy more than the daggers. He thought he had achieved considerable growth since he had performed quite well in the last battle against evil. But the power gap with Karen was enormous. But you have to take into account that she fights at full strength. Leon asked Karen what she thought of the latest attack. The girl said it was pretty much bearable. She laughed and said the guy did a great job. She noted that if he was able to see the illusory doppelganger, the assassin would have a hard time fighting him. Karen rated Leon's abilities above rank B. Leon was surprised by this assessment. After all, he still couldn't materialize his aura. The girl said that aura is a really powerful weapon, but you have to dodge the blow and it's a cakewalk, and the guy's vision and body movements allow him to do that. She explained that the tangible aura was capable of cutting iron and smashing rocks, but on its own, it was not capable of pursuing and defeating evasive enemies. Most assassins are often one step behind adventurers of similar rank. The only way to win is to outsmart your opponent at all costs. That was a victory too. The Undertaker himself was often tricky, hitting targets from a distance. Karen said the guy's plus points were stable fundamentals and a keen eye, but all he did was keep his cool. But there was a downside. The skills to deceive the enemy were completely absent. The girl noted that after repelling the attack, it was difficult for Leon to retake the initiative. Leon thought about these words. He began to think about how he could deceive his opponent. Karen grabbed the guy by the neck and told him not to rack his brains. After all, cheating was just filling a skill gap, a base to build a foundation for maneuvering. The girl said she didn't know who Leon's mentor was, but it had to be either a genius or an unprecedented monster. Leon nervously recalled his mentor, El Cid. At that moment, Karen said he lacked creativity in his attacks and movements. The girl pointed out that Leon didn't have to repeat after her, but it is useful to have a few varied cards up his sleeve. Leon realized that Karen was right. Perhaps he really shouldn't neglect the tricks that would help ensure victory. He clenched his fists and decided that he could indeed become stronger if he added a variety of techniques to his arsenal. Suddenly, a clawed paw embraced the boy and a squeaky voice said that there were enough fights for today. It was worth moving on to the next class. Leon bounced away from the Undertaker's shadow. Karen scared the guy with her stunt. Smiling, Karen advised the boy not to dwell on what he had heard. She suggested trying to make his aura tangible to create an aura weapon. The girl asked where they left off last time. Leon prompted, on the interaction between the aura attribute and the training method. Karen continued this theme and said that the aura is a force created by the filtration of the body of its possessor. It is a kind of disclosure of its essence. The basis becomes the subject's life experience and worldview. If we look at the example of facing the enemy, some bravely engage and some run away. However, it was impossible to distinguish good from evil based on traits alone. To train the aura was to make its essence purer and more powerful. Karen gave the example of practicing the aura of the fire attribute, constantly destroying something, fighting someone, or exhausting yourself to the point of exhaustion. Most such actions result in the purest consistency of a fire aura. Leon felt creeped out by this information. Karen explained that depending on the attribute, the difficulty of the training varied. In the case of her shadow attribute, the training consisted of completing missions. Karen said that the attribute of the sun symbolizes the goddess and is manifested from generation to generation in the hero of an era. Looking at the girl's appearance, Leon couldn't quite focus on her words. The girl asked Leon what comes to his mind when he hears the word sunshine. The guy replied that he represents the infinite light that brightly illuminates the whole world or dispels the darkness around him. Leon was suddenly struck by a hunch. He realized that his aura could illuminate everything around him. Karen noticed that the boy had drawn some kind of parallel for himself. Perhaps it was the previous training that had fueled him, but Leon felt a boiling magma-like aura flowing through his veins. With the help of the power of the spirit, it is necessary to pull the flow a little and concentrating, collect it on the fingertips, 
The boy felt incredibly hot as if something was burning, but he didn't understand how to let the aura out. He was now 100% sure it was about the sun. Leon tensed up and summoned all his strength. His aura began to materialize. It looked like a miniature scorching sun. Karen was amazed at the power she saw in front of her. Leon realized that it was all about the light. Even though he couldn't use it as a weapon yet, he was still able to release a blob of aura. Suddenly, the aura disintegrated and after throwing out the last discharge of energy disappeared. Leon staggered back with a sharp pain in his arm. He felt as if he'd been electrocuted. Leon realized that when he borrowed El Cid's power, he didn't know how high the limits of aura materialization were. The girl began to praise Leon, saying that the basis of creating a material aura was to control the aura flowing out of the body. She said the most important thing was that the guy was able to hold the blob of light for at least a couple seconds. If he could increase his range and apply the aura more steadily, the training would be over. The guy looked at the girl in bewilderment, waiting for further clarification. Karen explained that it was like recognizing the flow of the aura, like a blood vessel, and gradually pulling it out of the body. It takes a lot of energy, so you need a steady circulation. Jazar came in and said that materializing an aura based on a mental image was like gambling. If you release a lot of aura flow, you can't use it for a long time. Leon asked if the bishop had finished his inspection. Jazar said he got a preliminary assessment of the damage Leon and Karen had done some time ago. The boys felt like little kids being told off by an adult. But they would talk about the accounts later, for the bishop had brought a message from the saint. Leon was surprised that the saint herself honored him by sending a personal letter. There was just now a succession ceremony taking place. The saint had to receive the sacred power of more than ten bishops herself. Even someone who had reached the limits of mastery couldn't withstand this kind of power. No one thought that she would break through the power of the former saint at the ceremony, but the eighth Saint Elahan succeeded. Today, the strongest saint who supported the hero was born. Three hundred years ago, the first saint accompanied the great hero, Emperor Rodrigo. During her wanderings, she realized her helplessness. After all, one must have the strength to defeat evil, not just pray for the hero's well-being. By order of the first saint, the Iron Castle was created. Thus, the church became the strongest armed group on the continent. The place of the saint was created to provide support for the hero, so great grace descended upon Elahan. Elahan understood that. Now she could fight alongside a hero. It's what all saints strive for. Elahan has one last test left to pass, preparing for the fight. The body of the future saint glowed and her clothes began to transform. Elahan stood clad in beautiful golden armor. She reached out for the huge mace and raised it above her head. The bishops were amazed at this sight. For the great mace, the weapon of the saints of past generations had obeyed the girl. This whole procession went out into the mountains and stopped on a snow-covered cliff. In front of their eyes, there was the biggest sword mark left by the holy king in this world. It is said that he made this mark with a single blow. And the footprints carved into the rock are what the saints left behind while conducting the succession ceremony. So now it was Elahan's turn to go down in history as one of the strongest saints. Despite the strong gusts of wind and blizzard, the girl headed forward down the snowy slope. She thought about what she had been handed, that the hero was being active. Oracle Day was still six months away, and he had already accomplished so much for the good of the community. Elahan figured that when she finally became officially a saint, she wouldn't make the hero blush. The girl couldn't wait to find out just how brave and courageous the newly minted hero was. So, she decided that she needed to become a saint who would be completely subservient to him. She approached her destination and everything around her glowed and erupted in lightning. Swinging her huge mace, she shouted that all sinners would be punished. After saying those words, she slammed her weapon against the ground with all her might. The mountain they were all on shook from the impact. The force of the wave that swept across the area shocked the bishops. Elahan hoped the hero would allow her to be near him, even if she wasn't at the peak of her powers yet. Jazar began to read out a letter from the new saint. It said that she would gladly dedicate her life to the boy. It ended by saying that Elahan hoped he could see Leon as soon as possible. After hearing this, Leon felt as if he had been thrown into a vat of cold water. He had a feeling that trouble was about to come knocking at his door. He had no idea what kind of person the saint was, though she could be expected to be a great help. Leon didn't realize whether this news was good or bad for him. If the saint is as excellent as they say, then he needs to become a skilled warrior. Now that he had finally grasped the essence of using aura weapons, all he had to do was form an image. The guy asked the bishop if his attribute was really moon. The bishop surprisingly replied, yes. Leon apologized for the tactless question, 
but decided to find out what image the bishop was using to complete the aura weapon. If Jazar was surprised by the question, Karen was shocked by it. The girl said that such a strong aura wielder shouldn't be asked such a question. To reveal the image of one's aura weapon is the same as revealing one's weaknesses. Bishop agreed with Karen, but said he would tell the kid about the image of his aura weapon, Jazar said, picturing the phases of the moon in his head. The tiny crescent moon he represented while using a small amount of power, half of the moon he could see while using a medium power force, and he visualized the full moon when he was fighting at his limit. In some situations, he also imagined a transparent moon and a lunar eclipse. Leon strained to think about the fact that the bishop had as many as five variations. Karen wondered if Jazar trusted her and Leon so much that he had told her this information with such ease. Leon thought about how to apply this information to his situation. After all, unlike the moon, the shape of the sun was permanent. The guy realized he wasn't going to be able to build an image as a bishop. However, creating an image of a solar eclipse is quite possible. If we understand the image of an eclipse as an accumulation of power, then the sun, which always burns brightly, is itself an embodiment of continuity. So in this situation, he just needs to solve the problem of his simultaneous existence with the eclipse. Jazar noticed the change in the boy's face and realized that an epiphany seemed to have come over him. The joyful Leon replied enthusiastically that he did, and he would like to demonstrate what I have realized right now. To do so, they moved into an open clearing. Leon got into a fighting stance, clenched his sword, and said it was safe to begin. Jazar said he liked the look on the boy's face. He asked to see what insight had come to him. Leon thought that he should materialize the aura properly this time. Bishop warned that he was coming and swung his mace at the chains. The boy withstood the blow. From the force of the attack, the sword began to sparkle. He kicked the mace away and when it landed, the ground went cracking. But Leon realized that active use was still forbidden. Although in this training, he only needed to respond to the bishop's attack. Even though Bishop regulates his power, Leon must not forget that he is dealing with aura weapons. If he touches the chain, it will tear his flesh apart. But the guy realized that you can't just block punches and dodge all the time. He must calculate the trajectory and target a gap in the defense. For a weapon like chains, keeping distance is life. If Leon gets close, he can block half of the tech. But first and foremost, the guy has to have time to dodge the punch. This was quite difficult to do, as the chains surrounded Leon on all sides. Bishop asked the newly minted hero if he could dodge this attack. Leon himself didn't realize how possible it was. He got into a more stable position and decided to put his doubts aside. He must, by all means, accomplish the task at hand. Leon summoned his strength and cried out from the exertion. Jazar was shocked by what he saw. The boy used the reproduction of the Sword of the Great Bear. Leon visualized the solar eclipse in his head. This helped him successfully summon an aura weapon and demonstrate the eclipse sword. The first thing Leon was aiming for was the second technique of the Great Chariot Technique, Merak. The lad realized that it must not be an unconscious repetition, but a manifestation of his own will. The first thing to do was to compress the aura and put it into the blade of the sword, preventing it from going beyond it. The problem was releasing the aura, and the solution Leon had found to materialize the aura was the Sword of Eclipse. The guy successfully managed to channel the power so that it flowed straight into his sword. All Jazar could do was stare dumbfounded at what was happening. He couldn't even get a word out when he saw that his favorite weapon had been cut in half. Leon was cutting the chains off one by one. The boy seemed oblivious to his surroundings. Looking at the startled bishop, the guy said that for now, it's just an unstable technique. Leon said that it was still a long way off before he fully mastered the technique. Therefore, he would use this technique as a temporary measure. You could say he created his own personal simplified method. But be that as it may, Leon now has a technique in his personal arsenal that he can use to strike at his opponent. Looking at the wreckage of his favorite weapon, Bishop said Leon was magnificent. Karen suddenly appeared and shouted for them to look in her direction, for Leon had a visitor. The red-haired girl rushed over to Leon and said that it had been so many years, so many winters, and she was glad to see him. Leon recognized the girl from the Adventurer's Guild building. It was Miss Lee. They moved to the church, and sitting at the table, Lee began to ask how Leon was doing. The boy replied that he was fine. The girl said that she had brought tonic potions with her. Also, in a small box, she presented Leon with an award bestowed by the Lord. She explained that he had a space enchantment bracelet in front of him. Even though it was small, it would be useful. Karen was surprised at such an expensive gift. If the design wasn't so simple, it would be worth more than a thousand gold pieces. As expected, Karen knows a thing or two about such things. 
she said her earrings had the same charms. Since the capacity was small, the girl could only store small things inside. Leon had figured out where Karen got her daggers from. Leon was eager to try out this gift, so he quickly clasped the bracelet on his wrist. He decided to try putting the potion Miss Lee had brought inside. A second, and the potion was magically placed inside the bracelet. Leon appreciated the gift, for it was a handy magical tool. Count Blaine was more generous and magnanimous than he thought. Miss Lee said the second reason she came was to transition the guy to a B rank. Holding up the rank token, she said that he had all the prerequisites for promotion. Leon just had to show the aura weapon, and the token was his. Leon felt sorry that Elseed couldn't see how he had reached rank B, well before the 100-day deadline. The guy demonstrated his aura weapon without further question. For a second, Miss Lee was speechless. Stammering, she said that the presence of the aura weapon was confirmed. Leon couldn't believe that he was holding a rank B token in his hands. He remembered that when he was at the academy, he never dreamed that he would ever become an adventurer of such rank. Jazar and Karen began to congratulate Leon on his promotion in one voice. Miss Lee announced the last purpose of her visit. She said they had received the request Leon was looking for. The boy stared at the girl with incomprehension. With hope in her eyes, Miss Lee asked if Leon wasn't going to have guild security duties. Leon didn't have an answer because that wasn't exactly his plan. The girl said the trade caravan was headed for the Titanium Mountains. Blaine was only a temporary stopover. As soon as the provisions were replenished, he would be on his way. Miss Lee said that by taking advantage of her position, she was able to carve out one spot for Leon in the caravan. Hearing that there was only one seat, Leon was embarrassed. Karen turned around and gave him a disapproving glare. The boy said he didn't know then that there would be those who would want to follow him. To fix this problem, Leon turned to the bishop, who had strong ties to the guild. And until a reply from the guild was received, Leon and Karen continued to train hard. Leon concluded, the only thing more dangerous than the art of dagger throwing was Karen's speed. No matter how hard the guy tried to fight, he couldn't finally win. Teasing the guy, Karen said it was all about his eyes looking at his opponent wrong. Leon realized that he couldn't rely on vision. The purpose of this training is to make up for deficiencies in the vision technique. The guy needs to improve his ability to sense aura so he can use the Eclipse Sword. So he needs to focus. He must watch for any changes in the gusts of air and the slight shaking of the earth. Concentrating, Leon managed to sense Karen approaching. He turned around just in time to look directly into the girl's eyes as he prepared to fend off the attack. Karen was very surprised at this vigilance of the guy. She prevented him from attacking by reversing the direction of her jump and landing behind Leon. The blonde said it was amazing. She had never expected him to master the sense of aura so quickly. Leon was flattered by this praise. He smiled and thanked his companion. Karen was so touched by the boy's sincere gratitude that tears welled up in her eyes. She wasn't used to such emotions. So she hid the sensuality behind irritation and began to feign punching Leon. Leon made a mental note not to forget this sense of aura and continue to use it time after time. Then he could become much stronger than he was now. Jazar came up to the boys. He congratulated Leon for showing great growth again. The bishop said he had arranged to meet with the guild leader this afternoon. That means the problem with the second caravan spot will be solved. Leon and Karen looked at the bishop as if he were an angel descended from heaven. After a while, Leon and Karen moved toward the caravan. They got there just in time. He hadn't left yet. The guy suggested we go to the campground and look around. As the guys approached the main tent, they were asked if they were from the guild. Leon smirked, held out his badge, and said that he was a rank B adventurer. The man from the tent introduced himself by the name Arnold. He was from the Stom Guild. He extended his hand to Leon and said that even though they were a small guild, he hoped for mutual cooperation. The guy shook Arnold's hand and said he hoped they would interact as well. They exchanged frowns of scrutiny, and Leon noticed something unusual. Arnold's palms were not like those of a swordsman. In front of him was a hand that had undergone a deformation characteristic of a scribe. Leon thought that this man, conscientious and sincere, had lived much longer than he had held the sword in his hands. Arnold said that Leon's handshake reeked of courage. The boy couldn't hold back a satisfied smile. Guildhead. Stom and Leon shook hands contentedly and said that they were fully counting on one over the other. When it came to the second spot in the caravan, Arnold said they were on a tight budget, so it wouldn't be possible to hire another chaperone. The destination is the Titanium Mountains, and it's a very dangerous climb. Therefore, Leon said that if their caravan was escorted by a rank A adventurer, they would have a reliable insurance in their hands. Arnold was impressed by what he said. He didn't think that the second place in the caravan could go to such an experienced warrior. 
He agreed with Leon but clarified that it cost a lot of money to hire, especially if you add the daily rations to it. Likewise, Arnold expressed his doubts that an adventurer of such a high rank would guard a small guild. As if nothing had happened, Karen pulled out her badge and apologized for not introducing herself earlier, since she is a rank A adventurer. The girl said that they don't have to worry about money. She's here to accompany Leon so the reward can be set at rank B. The guild leader quickly agreed and stamped the necessary documents. Arnold apologized for being so tight on funds right now. Next time, he promised to pay for Karen's services at the A level. Karen graciously replied that she was the one who should apologize for her unexpected appearance. Leon asked the girl in surprise if it was normal for Arnold to fawn over them. She replied that it was the way it should be because she had a high rank. Karen said everything was great and they could safely enjoy the amenities they had been given. Turning his head, Leon noticed that there were mercenaries present in the camp. Karen kicked the guy and asked why he was so surprised. Leon replied that he had only watched them from afar and had never seen them up close. Even during the battle with the heretics in the slums, he hadn't had the chance to cross paths with other armed forces. The mercenaries, every single one of them, looked very strong. But they were casting very unfriendly glances in Leon's direction. Karen explained that mercenaries have prejudices against adventurers, but everything would be fine as long as both sides didn't provoke each other. Leon stepped aside and looked at the outline of the city. He realized that he was about to say goodbye to Blaine, too. After he left the birdcage called the Academy, a lot of things happened to him in this city. Leon suddenly realized that even if other places could be erased from memory, Blaine would definitely be hard to forget. If possible, the lad would like to leave after Elseed's awakening, but trade caravans rarely head towards the Titan Mountains, so one must take the chance. He also realized that he couldn't rely on Elseed alone. It is not appropriate for the hero to stand idly by in the absence of his mentor. Karen and Leon went in to say goodbye to the bishop. He blessed them on their journey and wished them good luck. Leon thanked Jazar profusely for all he had done for him. The bishop said he should be the one to thank. After all, if it weren't for their fateful meeting, the city devourer would have been unstoppable. The bishop held out his hand to the lad in which was some sort of medallion and said he wanted to give it to him. Jazar explained that this necklace held sacred power. It could be used for healing purposes, but it would also help in situations where it would be difficult to unsheathe a sword. Leon thanked and immediately put the gift on. Now that Elsid was asleep, it would be very useful. The bishop also said that if you show the medallion to the top leadership of the church, you can summon the Knights of the Order of the Iron Castle. The guy couldn't believe that he now possessed such an object. Jazar advised to use the necklace carefully, as someone who does not own it can only use the feature once. Leon looked at this gift and realized that it could be used to mobilize the Order's forces. Even if the summoning is disposable, it's hard to put a price on this item. When the boys returned to camp, Arnold graciously invited them to breakfast. When they came to the table, they saw an abundance of varied food. It didn't look like this guild had a limited budget. Leon was surprised at this abundance of treats and said he shouldn't have bothered so much. Teasing the boy, Karen wondered if he'd never been treated like this before. He looked like he was about to fall under the ground with embarrassment. The girl threw a glance somewhere behind Leon's back and said that maybe they would get a little extra trouble. The boy turned his head to see what Karen meant. He saw the malevolent looks the mercenaries were throwing at them. Grinning, Leon thought that there might not just be not much trouble, but more than enough. Karen said that there are people in the camp who have gotten fed up with them. Leon was very surprised at this news, for he was seeing these people for the first time in his life. After a little while, the caravan set off. Sitting in one of the wagons, Leon told Karen that he hadn't expected to move so quickly. The girl said it was all about two horses pulling a body with a spell carved on it. The lightweight spell is one of the most common and useful spells. It is cheap and can be used for a long time, but there was a downside to the spell. When used on wagons, they become unstable to shocks. Therefore, when climbing the Titan Mountains, it would have to be turned off. At sunset, the caravan stopped in a clearing where it was decided to make camp. Leon suggested that Karen get out of the wagon and look around a bit. She said tiredly that she didn't really want to go anywhere. She laid down on the floor, covered herself with a blanket, and said she wasn't hungry yet, so the guy could go for a walk by himself. Karen warned him to call her if anything happened. Leon got out of the wagon and saw that life was bustling around him. Someone was cooking supper. Someone was feeding the horses. Seeing how smoothly the entire guild worked together, Leon concluded that all these people had been working together for a long time. While the guy was looking around, 
he was approached from behind by three mercenaries who were clearly not friendly. Leon guessed that if he was alone, someone would pick on him. He asked what business the men had with him. The red-haired mercenary grudgingly remarked that the guy sounded like he was some kind of employer. Leon nonchalantly replied that if that's what they decided, then he really does sound like a superior. The redhead got angry and said that Leon was only acting like an important bird because we were traveling with a rank A adventurer. The boy was annoyed by this behavior. The mercenaries rushed at him alone, so it was obvious that they were the ones boasting of their strength. Leon said he was annoyed that his abilities and experience were being belittled by some suckers and he had to put up with that attitude. The red-haired man boiled at those words. The mercenary stepped up close to Leon and it was obvious that he wanted to match strength with the boy. But then a voice called out to the boys, urging them to stop the action. Karen asked, since when do big boys fight only in words? The girl suggested a duel if they doubted Leon's strength. The men were amazed that a girl like Karen had an A rank. The girl asked threateningly, Did they really think that since she was on Leon's side, she would interfere in the duel? One of the mercenaries said that if the blonde was willing to provide fair judging, he would like to fight Leon. Karen smiled sweetly and said she could guarantee it. She turned to the guy and asked if he would mind fighting right now. Leon said he was all for it. He realized that events were unfolding exactly as Karen had said. If the mercenaries had doubts about his strength, he would have to teach them a lesson. At the end of the day, it's all about skills. And when these shallow men see them, all gossip will stop. The boy looked at his holy sword mark and thought about what Elsid would say to him now. He remembered that sarcastic spirit and decided it was better not to know his opinion on the matter. Leon's opponents were veteran mercenaries of rank B. Still, the lad was almost 100% sure he would win this fight. Friction between mercenaries and adventurers is a long-standing problem. Leon thought that the mercenaries must have been jealous of him. After all, he was a rookie, but he was already working together with a beautiful A-rank adventurer. Meanwhile, without wasting a second, Karen has already started taking bets on the upcoming fight. Leon realized that the girl had already deployed her own playground. She announced a battle between a B-ranked mercenary and an adventurer. When the head of the guild approached her, she inclined him to bid as well. Arnold very mysteriously approached the girl and whispered to her the name of his favorite. Leon wanted to roll his eyes at the showmanship. It was already clear who he'd bet on. To the cheers of the people, Karen announced the start of the duel. At one end of the clearing stood the adventurer Leon. In the other is a representative of Hansen's Steel Claws mercenary unit. The girl announced that direct hits from aura weapons were forbidden. Also, weapons that weren't mentioned were forbidden, and one could not use rogue shenanigans. She clarified that there is no time limit and it is impossible to leave the field. Also, if any of them harms the spectators, they will immediately lose. The bout participants unanimously confirmed that they understood the rules. Leon and Hansen prepared for the fight and got into fighting stances. Leon assessed his opponent, who had a spear and a shield. He was surprised, as it was very rare to see a B-rank fighter using a shield. He also noticed the silver scratches on the shield. They told him that he was not wearing the usual protective gear. Leon spelled out aloud the fact that the shield was not as simple as it seemed at first glance. His opponent confirmed these words. He also added that Mithril had been added to his alloy. The man said that he had saved a gnome a few years ago. He received this shield as a token of his gratitude. Leon asked if it was possible to share such information so easily. The man replied that after a couple of blows, he would have figured it out anyway. Hansen also said he wasn't originally going to get tricky in the kid's bout. Leon grinned. He realized that he was considered too much of a frivolous opponent, and that was a major mistake. The boy clenched his teeth and thought he would make his opponent regret underestimating him. The guy decided he should start with the lightning lunge technique. Leon jerked forward sharply, trying to reach his opponent as quickly as possible. Only a moment passed and the guy was already attacking Hansen with his sword, taking him by surprise. The man immediately realized that he had been mistaken about the boy's abilities. He didn't understand how he had such great strength. The man managed to fend off the blow and tried to attack Leon. But as soon as he turned in his direction, Leon immediately bounced back, preventing him from getting any closer with his weapon either. The boy continued to analyze his opponent. A one-handed spear and a shield of mithril alloy were for holding back blows and instant counterattacks. In this style of fighting, the focus is on defense. So when a guy rushes into an attack, he only damages himself. Leon had the feeling that there was a hedgehog in front of him with spikes all over his body. He thought he could get rid of that shield by using the eclipse technique, but he wasn't sure he'd be able to chop just the shield in half. However, the enemy's pressure was too great, so he left Leon no other choice. The guy squatted down and prepared to use the hold. 
This action surprised the spectators who were closely following the fight. Karen was beginning to guess what the guy was up to. Before Hansen could blink, Leon suddenly disappeared from where he had been a second ago. Another moment passed and the man's shield pressed against his face. Leon made the intended maneuver and kicked his opponent's leg with all his might, causing him to lose his balance and fly off to the side. The guy asked if his opponent liked attacking with his foot rather than his sword. This question pissed Hansen off more than a little. He asked if the boy wasn't a true swordsman who adhered to the strict canons of combat. Leon didn't answer anything, but only rushed forward into another attack. Hansen put up a defense and pressed his shield tighter, preparing to repel the enemy's blow. But Leon used a deceptive maneuver. Hansen was expecting an attack from the front, but the kid attacked from behind. Karen noticed with a smirk that the guy was using killer steps. Leon Hansen was twisted in the air by the impact. He flew several meters away, scattering his spear and shield in different directions. The man was screaming and couldn't believe that this kid was able to disarm him so quickly and without any problems. When he landed on the ground, his enemy's sword was already aiming at his head. Leon stood right in front of him. His sword reflected the rays of the setting sun. Hansen realized he had lost. Karen announced that the fight was over and victory was awarded to the adventurer Leon. Leon looked at the girl and thought that the technique he had learned from her was very useful. Leon thought that if Elseed were here, he'd immediately start nagging him, saying why on earth would he imitate an assassin? But it was better to have more techniques in his arsenal. Hansen's two buddies stood there, annoyed to think that they were next in line to fight Leon. A dark-skinned man came up and barked for them to stop this buffoonery. It was Commander Gustav. The man wondered if after what he'd seen, the mercenaries still hadn't realized the difference in skill between them and the guy. Leon realized that the person standing in front of him was the commander of the Steel Claws mercenary squad. The commander made a respectful bow and apologized for the behavior of his subordinates. He said that Leon's skills matched rank B. The mercenaries were blind and made the mistake of looking at his young age. Leon was pleasantly surprised to see such respectful behavior from this formidable man. Commander Gustav remarked that it was unfortunate for them to realize that despite their mature years, they were on the same level as such a young warrior. Also, he admitted that they, four men, were traveling in the same wagon, while Leon sharing a two-man wagon with such a beauty. They were just blinded by envy. Gustav apologized once more for being so petty and inconsiderate. Leon heard Karen laugh behind him. The boy walked up to the mercenary commander, extended his hand to him, and suggested that from now on we live amicably. Gustav shook the lad's hand firmly and said that they were now heavily indebted to him. The man promised that someday they would be sure to wash away that stain of shame. Leon said that they did not need to talk about any debt. Gustav said a man's duty is worth more than life. They would surely pay him back in full. In the meantime, the man invited Leon to have a drink with them that night. When night fell, Leon realized it was safe to go to his newfound friends. As he approached the fire, he saw that the party was in full swing. Gustav immediately ran up to the boy, offering him a drink. Leon wanted to refuse. But a moment later, to the cheers of the men, he was drinking some kind of liquor. Karen sat back and watched with a satisfied smile. When morning came, Karen had to deal with Leon's hangover. She found it funny that the brave hero was dragging his feet after taking a sip of alcohol. Leon did not even react to the girl's words. The strong alcohol contributed to a sound sleep. After reconciling with the mercenaries, the atmosphere within the guild improved greatly. Leon even got an unexpected benefit. Hansen was from the Northern Army. He taught the boy how to fight mountain orcs. After all, their destination was infested with these creatures. So this information was very valuable. The other mercenaries, too, whenever they met Leon, proudly told their stories and shared their methods of attacking monsters. One of the mercenaries inquired about Leon's actual relationship with Karen. Leon was so surprised by this question that he didn't even immediately find an answer. When he realized what the mercenaries meant, he laughed loudly. The men asked if he was trying to hide something. The mercenaries reasoned that the fact that a girl and a boy were traveling in the same wagon spoke for itself. Leon denied it, but they told him not to be embarrassed. The red-haired mercenary asked Leon if they should really consider the two of them as student and teacher. The man noticed that their movements were quite similar, but they communicated without any special ceremonies, so it was unclear who was in charge. Leon remembered that the red-haired man's name was Hamel. He was a former forest ranger, so he had good observation skills. After all, he was able to notice common features in the movements. The guy explained to the mercenaries that he and Karen had bonded over joint requests. It was not at all the kind of relationship the men had hinted at. Asleep, 
Karen overheard a conversation near her wagon. The men were asking Leon if he still hadn't hit on her. The boy said they were wrong. When Leon analyzed the conversation, he realized that he was accompanied by a top rank adventuress. So from the outside, one would think she needed him for comfort. He thought he was being mistaken for a kid who thought the request was nothing, so he hid behind a woman's skirt. He didn't deserve that opinion of himself, so he shouldn't relax for a second. Looking at Gustav passing by, he decided that he should spend every moment to his advantage. Leon snapped out of his seat and decided to cross swords with the mercenary commander. People passing by began to chatter about Leon fearlessly challenging Commander Gustav to a duel. The commander said that Leon was really strong. There was no way the man expected him to be able to withstand his direct attack. Spitting up blood, Leon said he could barely stay on his feet. He asked if there were many who could react as he had. The commander replied that he didn't use any gimmick, he just decided to hit with all his might. But Gustav had no idea that Leon would not dodge, but would take the blow for himself. Sitting down heavily on the ground, Leon smiled and said he was a little disappointed too. Gustav laughed and said that the more he looked at Leon, the more he liked him. Leon decided that responding to strength with strength and speed with speed was a foolish tactic. In a real fight, he would have been decapitated because he hadn't gotten into a defensive stance in time. Leon thanked Gustav for fighting and said it was a very good lesson learned. The commander was an opponent that was hard to beat even once out of ten fights. Gustav said that it was good for him to cross swords with a fighter like the guy, too. Gustav said disappointedly that they wouldn't be able to fight each other for a while. He said they would reach the forest in the evening. There was no need to make a fuss, for all sorts of annoying creatures might come after them. Leon asked how long it would take to cross the forest. The commander replied that if things went well, they would need about three days. But if something went wrong, the journey could take five or six days. The boy asked a question, would they have to fight monsters? Gustav answered that they would have to fight monsters. While such a small caravan may not be touched, it is worth remembering that the forest has a medium level of danger. The man said that if a medium-sized monster came across the path, it would definitely attack. The boy looked at him in bewilderment. Gustav said that there are hordes of trolls in the forest. Leon realized that if they met these monsters, it would not be an easy road. The commander explained that adult trolls are four to five meters tall and compared to other types of monsters, they are quite agile. Gustav said that contrary to being the possessors of a decent potbelly, there are those who are able to climb trees. Leon was very surprised. Gustav said that those who have never seen it don't take their word for it. Forest trolls can safely be dubbed ape-like. The boy listened to the commander's stories with inexpressible delight. Even though he knew absolutely nothing about trolls, the information Gustav had shared with him was extraordinary. Leon learned many useful things. For example, that trolls attack in groups and can use goblins or orcs as subordinates. In the evening, Arnold announced that the caravan was entering the forest. He called on those in charge of security to perform their duties diligently. Leon thought that after going through the boring plains, he would finally end up in a forest where monsters lived. Leon realized that it was time to focus and get down to business. Karen perked up too and said it was time to get to work. She noticed the boy's intense tension. He reasoned that they were in the woods and you never know at what point the enemy will show up. The girl reassured him by telling him that those things would probably show up tomorrow at dawn or in the afternoon. Karen urged him to relax and just rest. Leon decided that since Karen said so, he might not take a nap for a while. He had not yet recovered from the fight with Captain Gustav. He realized that before the battle with the monsters, he had to get himself cleaned up. The caravan moved quietly along the forest road, but a sudden noise interrupted the silence. Karen was the first to hear it and immediately became alarmed, waking Leon. Hamel was riding on the roof of one of the wagons. He listened carefully to his surroundings. Then he smelled something and immediately knew what to do. The red-haired man took aim with his bow and launched an arrow into the sky. When the arrow hit the target, something flashed, illuminating the space around it with a bright light. It was an attack of huge green creatures. The goblins were approaching them in a huge mob. Leon and Karen were already at the ready. They did not hesitate to destroy the enemies. Hamel shot aura arrows at the green monsters. They cut through space and moved towards the enemies in bright green flashes. The red-haired man managed to hit a large number of opponents. The other mercenaries praised Hamel's work and said that now it was their turn to do a good job. The men bravely swarmed to destroy the attacking goblins. The fight had begun. Severed goblin limbs were flying everywhere. The mercenaries were in their element. Leon realized the fight was different from his participation in the punitive squad to destroy evil. There, he was tearing through enemies, relying on his own skills. 
Now the battle scheme was different. They would have to perform various attacks while fighting side by side with each other. Gustav looked at Leon and noticed his confusion. The guy looked unsure, so the mercenary commander asked if this was his first time in a battle of this nature. When the boy looked at him with his confused look, Gustav realized that he would have to back him up if he didn't want to lose such a fighter. One of the goblins was approaching Leon from the right. Gustav had warned him, hoping he could kill the creature himself. But Leon was quick to engage and decided he needed to try and attack first. The guy flew right up to the two goblins who were already ready to lash out at him. He managed to successfully chop their bodies in two, releasing a spray of hideous green blood outside. Leon felt something strange on the tip of the sword at the impact. He had faced goblins before when he had trained with Elseed in the woods, but now he delivered a chopping blow with greater ease. That meant only one thing. The guy had gotten significantly stronger. Orders to kill the goblins in the trees were heard everywhere. It was reported that the creatures that had attacked the caravan had been destroyed. Gustav told the mercenaries they did a remarkable job. He wanted to single out those whose work was particularly exceptional, but he was prevented from finishing. A new horde of goblins attacked him, but the man successfully dealt with the monsters. Leon was amazed at the ease with which Gustav could wield a massive two-handed sword in the thick of the forest. He wanted to try it. When he wanted to swing, he didn't notice the mercenary standing behind him and pushed him back slightly. The mercenary got angry and started swinging his sword around with a shout, saying that the guy almost jumped him. As Leon stepped away from one mercenary, he stepped on the other's cloak. The guy didn't have time to apologize and felt clumsy. The boy sadly stepped aside. He thought that he was just getting in everyone's way and getting in the way. He berated himself for not keeping a reasonable distance with his comrades. The aura sense needed to be more refined and stable. He needs to focus to avoid crossing into the strike trajectories of other fighters. You had to find gaps that Leon could fill with himself. That's what he saw. He tracked the trajectory of the mercenary standing next to him and entered the open space, thus saving the man from the goblin. When the mercenary realized what Leon had done, he thanked and apologized for yelling at him earlier. Karen, standing nearby, smiled warmly and said the boy was growing up before her eyes. After a while, the last goblin from the gang that attacked them was eliminated. To the cheers of the crowd, Gustav announced that the goblin attack had been repulsed. Leon and Karen listened as the commander ordered the scouts to work a little longer. The rest of them could go to their wagons. The captain of the mercenaries called Leon to him and told him that there was a job he could be useful in. The boy was interested in the offer. Gustav said it was a troll hunt. Leon was surprised to be called to such a dangerous endeavor. Karen put her arm around the boy and allowed that the security squad was intent on catching the troll. Gustav confirmed the girl's speculation, saying that he had already discussed the matter with the head of the guild. The captain clarified that trolls treat the strong and the weak quite differently. He said that if the A-Rang representative demonstrated her power in front of them, they would flee without a backward glance from the area. Karen guessed that Gustav was suggesting that she stay out of it. The captain was embarrassed, saying that it was only a recommendation. If the girl didn't like the suggestion, they could give up on the idea of catching the troll. Karen asked Leon what they should do. The boy didn't understand why she was even asking about it. The girl only said that it was about a troll. Karen said that if a guy has never faced one, it would be a good idea to take a chance and fight a troll. Trolls were medium-sized monsters that dominated the terrain due to their unique abilities and physical strength. They were completely different from the monsters summoned by satanic techniques, so it would be a rewarding experience. Leon decided that if he was offered to fight someone whose body was superior to a human's and had abilities that could not be purified by a holy sword, then one should accept the challenge. Karen said approvingly that she knew the guy couldn't pass up a chance like this. The girl began to step aside, saying that she was content that she wouldn't have to get personally involved in the battles. However, she told Gustav that she had one condition. It consisted of the commander giving Leon the opportunity to fight the troll one-on-one. -on -one. Leon was surprised by this strange request from Karen, but he understood that she wanted him to have a useful experience. Karen also ordered Gustav to pay Leon if the troll was killed. The commander agreed, saying that he had already coordinated everything with the guild leader. At night, the caravan moved along a quiet forest trail. Leon said that it was already past the fourth day since they had entered the forest. He had no idea who would attack them this time. The first time was the nasty green goblins. Next to attack were the gnolls and kobolds. There was no pattern to calculate the next attack. One way or another, Leon realized. They hadn't gone halfway through the forest, and they were moving day and night. The boy suggested that perhaps it was the trolls' shenanigans, and they had targeted all the monsters of this forest. 
The power of the intruders wasn't much of a threat, but it was fundamental to catch whoever was leading them from the shadows. Leon asked Karen if it was possible that after observing them, the caravan would be attacked by trolls. The girl answered that such a scenario could happen. As soon as the blonde said this, her eyes widened in horror and her face turned pale. Karen could hear Leon asking what was wrong, but she could only stare at the huge rock that was approaching the neighboring wagon. A moment later, he was already pinning the wagon to the ground. There was a deafening crack and everyone felt the ground shudder under their feet. The silence of the night was broken by shouts. Everyone started talking about where the stone had come from. As we got closer to the scene, the bodies were discovered. Death was instantaneous. They had lost three in just one attack. There was an eye patch lying around one of the victims. Leon immediately realized who it belonged to. It was the mercenary near whom he had fought in the battle with the goblins. Leon clutched the found object in his hands and promised himself that he would avenge this guy's death. Karen alerted that their enemies were here. They had to prepare for another battle. Another huge boulder was approaching them. It was probably the troll's work. People started to run away in panic. Horses tried to escape. It was chaos. Leon analyzed that the rocks were flying from a hundred meters away. It was like a catapult attack. He shouted to disperse into the area. He was about to use Eclipse to shatter the stone. But Gustav was ahead of him. With a shout for silence, the man jumped straight toward the cobblestone. He swung his huge sword and with considerable force he was going to deal with this rockfall. The commander successfully accomplished his task by neutralizing the danger. The mercenaries looked at their head with pride. Ignoring their faces, the commander ordered them to assemble for formation. Gustav immediately calmed the men down, ordering them to take the wagons into hiding. He told the adventurers to beware of monsters that might appear. Leon marveled at the commander's ability to give such clear instructions in such a stressful situation. Suddenly, sounds came from the thick of the forest. They were announcing that everyone would soon have new problems in the form of monsters. A whole crowd of various creatures were advancing on the caravan. Gustav said that if it went on like this, there would be no end to the monsters. But right now, the first priority was to destroy the trolls. The commander ordered Hamel and Hansen to take four mercenaries with them and find out where the trolls were. As soon as they spotted them, they would have to engage them. Gustav said these creatures should be finished off so they can't throw any more rocks. Karen announced that she and Leon would go to the troll that was farthest away from the others. The commander said he was counting on them. Receiving Gustav's approval, the boys rushed out to find their enemy. But their path was blocked by goblins who rushed at them from all sides, swinging their sharp axes. Karen's eyes lit up with the anticipation of dealing with these creatures. She seemed to be waiting for them to attack so she could vent her frustration on them. Leon only had to watch as the girl lightning ripped several goblins to shreds. Without wasting another second, they went on their way. A moment later, the girl told Leon to get ready, for they were almost there. In the twilight of the forest, they saw a huge creature that towered several meters high. The huge beast held a huge boulder in its clutches. Now it was clear who had thrown the stones at the caravan. Karen immediately said that she would be blocking the escape route. So Leon can fight the monster all he wants. The girl smirked and asked if the guy had forgotten about his one-on-one -on -one fight with the troll. Leon guessed that they had approached the troll faster than he had time to notice them, because they took advantage of the distant distance from the other mercenaries. When the huge beast turned in their direction, the guy realized he could capitalize on the fact that monsters have night vision. He drew his holy sword and used the purifying light technique. The space was filled with blindingly bright light. That glow made the troll cover his eyes with his hands and scream loudly in pain. When his opponent was discouraged, Leon realized he could put him down with one punch. Victory was at arm's length, but suddenly Leon felt rocks flying at him. Even though the monster was blinded, it didn't stop fighting. He tried to fend off his enemies by throwing small stones wherever he could. Having lost its sight, the troll became even more dangerous, for now it began to attack indiscriminately. The rocks flying in different directions made it much harder for Leon to get close to the enemy, but he had to break through at all costs. Only a few minutes had passed, and the troll's eyes were burning bright red. Leon couldn't believe that he had managed to regain his sight in such a short time. While the guy was marveling that the troll had incredible healing powers, this huge beast was already reaching for his weapon. The troll swung his club. He clearly intended to crush Leon like a pesky cockroach. Leon looked at that gaunt log in his opponent's hands and realized that if the blow fell on him from that height, lethality would not be avoided. He remembered how he had managed to repel Gustav's frontal attack. But that had only been practice. The boy realized that he could not make a single mistake from now on. 
Looking at the enraged enemy, who was getting closer by the second, Leon rushed to repel the attack without a second thought. When the baton came down on the guy, he managed to bounce aside and avoid the fatal blow. After analyzing his opponent, he realized that the troll was faster than he thought. If he counterattacks from here, it won't work, so we have to get a little closer. Leon kept jumping back from all the enemy's blows. Thanks to this, he was able to get a little closer, but that wasn't enough. We had to get close enough to deliver a devastating blow. Leon accelerated as hard as he could, planning to run around his opponent from the back. Apparently, the troll exposed the guy's plan, so he threw rocks right in his face. Because of this, Leon had to retreat and jump back a few meters to the side. The guy was incredibly annoyed by the troll's fighting tactics. He couldn't get any closer because of it. Leon was only a few steps away from hitting his opponent with his sword. Leon stopped and concentrated. He thought the enemy had left him no other choice, so he summoned his power. Since his technique needed to be refined, the guy decided that he wouldn't use it if possible. The troll watched with interest as the guy's sword filled with light and crackling lightning bolts flew out of it. While Leon was in a vulnerable state, the troll decided this was the perfect opportunity to attack. But that was exactly what the guy was trying to do, to create a perceived vulnerability to force the enemy to strike a devastating blow. Without thinking long, Leon summoned his aura, and when his opponent got close enough, he used the eclipse technique. Without much difficulty, the guy managed to cut off the leg of this huge monster. Following the leg, the arm flew as well. The limbs landed on the ground with a thud. The attribute of Leon's aura weapon was the sun. So, among the intermediate techniques that represented light and heat, there was also the high heat of Eclipse. It was with the combat power of high temperatures that he introduced the troll. But even despite the injuries inflicted by the guy, the monster tried to flee from the scene of the battle. Leon clenched his teeth and decided that he would not let his enemy escape. After all, he had come all this way to kill him. The monster tried to avoid further attacks and fled from the sword like a nightmare. Leon shouted after him, saying that he was only capable of attacking unilaterally when he was sure that his life was in no danger. The guy said he wouldn't let someone like a troll slip away quietly. Leon clenched his fists and remembered the victims this troll had caused. He had given himself his word to avenge them, and he would. The guy summoned more of his aura power and shouted that he would kill that vile brat. Without expecting it himself, he used the great chariot's technique of Merrick. A huge flash of light illuminated part of the forest. After that, the earth began to tremble and everyone felt the presence of a great power. All that was left of the troll was a halved, smoking body. After successfully executing the attack, Leon fell to his knees helplessly. He thought he could breathe a sigh of relief that he had succeeded. But the guy didn't know that unlike Eclipse, which only focuses power on the sword blade, Merrick takes a huge amount of aura. He realized that even if his body was in perfect condition, with his current supply of aura, he was unable to perform this technique twice. Karen ran up to Leon in a flash. She said she had no doubt that he would defeat the troll. Still, she added, she blocked the enemy's escape route just in case. Leon was proud that he had correctly implemented the basic principle of the technique without Karen's help, using only his own strength. And despite the fact that the technique is not yet properly honed, he has been successful. Happy Leon was about to go back to the caravan, but suddenly he staggered and could not stay on his feet. He fell straight to the ground and a confused Karen put his head in her lap. The girl whispered that he was having a hard time because of the technique he used last. She promised him that she would take care of the rest. Karen put her palm to his forehead and told him he was doing great. Leon felt like he was floating among a thousand twinkling stars. He didn't know when he'd fallen asleep. The boy felt so serene. He hadn't felt anything like this in so long. Leon suddenly berated himself and realized that he didn't have a single reason to be chill like this. While he was resting, Lion was getting much stronger and he couldn't afford to lose to him. Leon came to his senses and opened his eyes. He looked around and realized he was inside the wagon. The boy remembered that yesterday he had lost consciousness right after using the new technique. He tried to get up, but it wasn't so easy, for there was incredible pain running through my entire body. Leon flopped back onto the makeshift bed and realized that he wouldn't be able to heal in one day. The guy remembered that the bishop had given him a very useful thing that helps in situations like this. He removed the sacred pendant and looked at it with admiration. Leon tried to do as the bishop said and take advantage of the restorative property of the suspension. After a few seconds, he was relieved. The pendant was much more effective than the boy had thought. Even the fatigue was gone. The boy laughed at the fact that the bishop had called his gift a mere trifle. He was very grateful to Jazar. Karen appeared out of nowhere. She was surprised that the boy was already on his feet and asked if the movement made him uncomfortable. 
Leon embarrassedly replied that thanks to the bishop's relic, he had recovered quickly. The boy asked what had happened in the end. Following Karen around the camp, Leon learned that the troll hunt had been a success. They had managed to neutralize three of the four opponents. The girl said that the troll that escaped was seriously injured, so she was sure he would never set foot in this forest again. Leon growled that their enemies were a bunch of cowardly creatures. The girl said that the troll had lost his entire herd, so he wouldn't be looking toward the forest anytime soon. The boys approached the outskirts of the camp and Leon noticed the corpses of defeated enemies. Karen said there are the bodies of three enemies here, along with the one Leon killed. If you convert that to money, it comes out to about 90 gold coins. The boy asked if a troll's head was so valuable. The girl explained that troll blood is the raw material for high-quality potions. But there was bad news. Leon's ingestion had drained almost all of the troll's blood, so they would only get half of the 30 coins. Leon grinned nervously and apologized for his oversight. Karen irritably shouted that he was a ballbuster and an idiot and staggered away from him. The guy looked at the corpses and noticed that the first one had been hit by at least four weapons. The second met its end at his hand. Looking at the bloody mess in place of the third troll's face, the guy guessed who had done this to him. It wasn't hard to imagine Commander Gustav chopping the monster's head off with his huge sword. As the boys were about to leave the clearing, the guild leader Arnold called out to them. The man said Karen and Leon did a great job last night. Karen modestly replied that they were only doing their job. Leon looked sadly at Arnold and asked about their losses of men. The guild leader replied that there were eight dead and 21 injured. There were no seriously injured, but a few people would still have to be left behind in the next settlement. The boy's fists clenched tighter as he listened to the guild help with the funeral and compensate the families of the dead. He felt guilt because they had failed to keep these people safe, and now their families would get money and a dead body instead of a loved one. Karen didn't seem to care at all. She immediately asked Arnold about the payment for the troll. The man promised that everything would be paid. The guild leader began to calculate that one troll was worth about 30 coins, but the pipes were cut in half and there was no blood left at all. But as a bonus, he could give 30 coins. Karen interrupted these calculations and said they would stop at 15 coins. Arnold wanted to offer more, but the girl insisted. Leon was very surprised that the blonde agreed to less. The girl said that she thought it was strange that this generosity was shown only to them. She said that if someone shows you kindness, you'll have to repay the favor one day. Leon was very surprised when Karen said that now, being around him, she didn't have to be indebted to others. Gustav interrupted the conversation. The man approached Leon and put his arm around him, saying that he was glad that nothing serious had happened to him. The commander asked the boy about the technique he used to destroy the troll. Gustav was dying of curiosity, for the cut was not like that made with an ordinary sword. Leon replied importantly that it was his secret swordsmanship. The man immediately apologized for his tactless question. Guy asked if the mercenary commander's comrades were all right. Toth replied that Hansen and Hamel had a couple scratches and that Leonique was blooming and smelling as usual. Gustav ruffled Leon's hair and told him not to take what had happened too personally. The commander said that everyone who went on the trek was ready to die at any moment. Many of them even carried a will with them. He pounded Leon in the chest and said that death is an unfortunate thing, but the guy shouldn't burden himself with responsibility for what happened. After saying this, Gustav waved goodbye and walked off deep into the camp. Leon smiled warmly in farewell. He felt cared for by this stern man. Karen said it's okay to mourn someone, but it's for the living, not the dead. What happened should make a guy move on. The girl emphasized that even if he is a hero, this principle does not change. Following Gustav's example, she ruffled the irritated Leon's hair and asked if he felt better for her words. He remembered what Alcide had told him. A man driven by a sense of duty wouldn't last long. Beliefs are values, not fuel that can run out. His musings were interrupted by Karen's question. She asked if he had heard anything about the desert area. Leon began to remember at least some facts about the desert that he had ever heard. Karen said it was an area covered in sand, with hardly any rain and much colder at night than during the day. Such an environment was merciless to living things. Along with the nomads, there are also countless monsters dwelling there. These two forces are often in conflict with each other. The description of the area made the boy uncomfortable. He didn't even want to go near the desert. The girl reassured him, saying that they were moving near the border and would only pass a small section of desert. Moving by wagon, the sands would be behind them in a week. From these words, the lad concluded that they were not even close to the desert yet. Leon asked how long it would take to reach her. Karen replied that at this speed it would probably take about three days. 
The boy was pleased to realize that Elsid would have to be awake by now. He realized he hadn't heard him chatter in a month and had managed to miss his mentor. Karen's joyous exclamation distracted me from my thoughts. She announced that they had finally left the confines of the forest. The camp was set up in a hot, sandy area. The only place to hide from the sun was in a tent. Leon wanted to use the map to determine where they were, but it had disappeared. Suddenly, the holy sword began to fill with energy and crackle with power. With a shout of joy, El Cid burst out of his sword. He announced to the whole wagon that he was finally back. Such an unexpected appearance of the spirit made Leon shout in surprise. When the boy realized what had happened, he looked with warmth in his eyes at his mentor, who was finally there for him. Alcide asked why the boy screamed so much when he saw him. Leon replied that such an appearance was too unpredictable. The spirit said he wanted to stretch well first thing, since it had been a whole month since his so-called nap. Leon jokingly said that he was already wishing he could go back to the beginning of the month. Elsid also joked, saying he should be grateful to the heretic leader for giving the boy a hard time. The spirit began to reprimand the boy, saying that at his age, his mentor was a king. Leon asked if Elsid had ever treated his teacher with such reverence. To the boy's surprise, the spirit replied that he had no mentor and learned everything on his own. Elsid asked if anything interesting had happened during his absence. He wanted to hear a short story. Leon began his story from the moment he woke up in the Adventurer's Guild Hospital. What surprised Elsid the most was that Bishop had figured out the guy's true identity and the blonde undertaker had become his comrade. Leon convinced the spirit that Karen could be relied upon. Even though she was a murderer, her personality was not deformed, Alcide agreed. After all, if she let go of her past, there was no reason to kill Leon, especially since the girl could compensate for his weaknesses in terms of experience and skills. The spirit also asked if his ward's skills had improved this month. Leon didn't bother to prove anything, only saying that the mentor could check his progress himself. Elsid couldn't help but notice that the boy exuded confidence. He snapped his fingers and called up the characterization screen. The spirit and Leon stared at the screen in surprise. They both didn't expect the boy's skills to grow so much. Looking at his stats, Leon realized that he had managed to overwhelm all of Lion's stats. Now, only a new duel would help to determine who was stronger. But the boy was sure that Lion hadn't been idle all this time either. Still, the experience one could get at the academy was limited in scope so it was unlikely that the blonde could outrun Leon by much. Elsie jokingly said that maybe the system had malfunctioned. After all, to grow like that in a month was a very good result. The spirit praised the guy for trying to master the great chariot technique. And looking at the stats, he assumed that Leon had mastered the first step. Leon said it was all thanks to Elsie showing him an example. However, he clarified that he could only use Merrick for now. The mentor said he has already exceeded his expectations. Perhaps the boy was born with a talent for learning. But still, the spirit liked to think that such success of a negligent student was entirely his merit. After all, he was a terrific mentor. Leon did not take umbrage, for he knew the sarcastic and proud nature of this evil sword spirit. Leon only copied Elsid's sarcastic tone and said he didn't even know how to thank him. After a moment, Elsid sniffed and said he could clearly smell the sands. He asked where they were. Leon said that they were heading towards the Titan Mountains as they had planned earlier. The guy accepted the guild security request. Looking at the lifeless landscape, the spirit said it all sounded good. He asked why the caravan had taken a course into the heart of the desert. Leon was surprised. He had thought they had deviated only a little from the direct route. The boy had assumed they were taking the fastest route. The guy unfolded a map and said the original route was either through a mountain range or a canyon. Elsid looked at the map and couldn't believe his eyes. He shouted, asking why there was a desert here. Leon didn't even understand the question, for the sands had been in this area for over a hundred years. Elsid said nervously that three hundred years ago this place was a plain. The region was immune to climate change, so it seemed strange, this desertification. The spirit continued, saying that such a process could not be natural. Perhaps someone had turned the area into a desert on purpose. Leon asked if it was possible. Elsid replied that he didn't know how long it took, but it was obvious that someone had disguised it as a natural phenomenon. Leon thought that if the heretics were able to destroy the city with magic, then perhaps they had turned such a vast area into a wasteland. Elsid didn't confirm his speculation, but said that either way, something was clearly wrong here. Leon asked if the spirit was sure that this was not the result of a natural process, but a conspiracy. The spirit said they were too late anyway and the investigation would be fruitless. The boy was very angry when he heard that he could care less about it. But in addition to the anger, 
Leon also sensed how distinctly he felt the presence of the spirit, and this they had known each other for less than half a year. That realization made him smile even wider, and he said he was glad El Cid was back. Karen watched Leon, who was sitting in the wagon, talking to the air and gesticulating vigorously. She had questions for the guy. The caravan continued its journey through the lifeless desert. Karen sat in the wagon, complaining that the heat was killing her. It was so hot that every part of her body was sweating. The girl was irritated beyond belief, but at the moment, even more than the heat, it was her companion who unnerved her. Leon sat across from me, smiling, polishing his weapon. He didn't seem to care about anything around him. Karen was curious about the reason for this behavior, so she asked why he was in an excellent mood. Had something good happened? Leon didn't even know what to say to that. After all, he had never revealed to anyone that the spirit of the Holy Sword was his mentor. The boy didn't have to make up an answer as a voice came out, ordering him to stop. Today, they would camp in the desert. Karen explained that the desert is much colder at night. Therefore, if you take the sudden temperature difference lightly, you could have problems. The girl ran forward to get a quick look at the area. Leon told El Cid that they had to go too, but the spirit did not respond to the call. It just looked sadly at the landscape around them. El Cid said there was not a single clearing, not even a small clearing, from his memories in this desert. Leon realized that the spirit had in no way expected that after 300 years, things would turn out this way. Seeing Karen waving her hand, the mentor said, I think the guy's name is. When evening came, pleasant odors filled the air. They came from the delicious-smelling food cooked on the fire. Sitting by the cauldron, Hansen and Hamel began to call the boys to help themselves to the delicious meat stew. Elseed marveled at how friendly these people were towards Leon. Karen laughed heartily at his jokes. It was as if they had known each other for a long time. Commander Gustav was always trying to put his arm around the boy, and Hansen and Hamel were putting tasty treats on his plate. Elsid smiled at the thought of how well the lad had acclimated among these people. He realized that perhaps he had given himself up to sad thoughts in vain. What difference does it make whether it's a desert or a meadow? After all, the person living in this era was Leon, not Elsidus. After a while, the flames of the fire finished burning out, and the travelers went to their makeshift beds. Leon, like everyone else, quietly drifted off to sleep. But suddenly he awoke to some unpleasant feeling of discomfort. As soon as Karen saw Leon awake, she immediately put her finger to her lips, ordering him to be quiet. Leon stepped closer and asked with incomprehension what was going on. A second later, they felt the floor shake under their feet. Some huge sand monsters were approaching the wagons. Leon asked if there was an enemy outside. The girl nodded her head and said that the number of heads was quite high. She consulted with the boy about what to do. Karen had said they didn't emit killing energy, so she only noticed them when they got too close. But she didn't think they were going to fight. Leon asked why the sentinel had not noticed anything. The girl explained that an inexperienced person might not notice an enemy approaching by burrowing into the sand. From their wagon, the boys noticed these critters heading toward the cargo. It looked like they were going to make a theft and escape. Karen looked at Leon again and said that the plan for their next steps was left up to him. He realized that they were at a disadvantage because they had allowed the enemy into the camp. So raising the alarm was not an option. Sleeping unarmed men will not be able to immediately bring themselves to proper fighting capacity. El Cid added that those bastards also know that if they oppose the guild guards, they won't win. So they came here with the intention of stealing things without showing any desire to kill anyone. If they raise an alarm, they will fight back, but casualties will not be avoided. Leon didn't understand why his mentor was so excited. El Cid explained that he could finally look at his foolish student's skills. The boy began to develop a plan of action. He asked Karen what the exact number of enemies was. She replied that those moving toward the Cargo 14, there were 22 other bastards on patrol. That's everyone in her line of sight. Leon understood that these 36 people could use the desert environment to their advantage. So it was important to make the right first move. The guy looked at Karen and said he had a couple ideas. A couple minutes later, Karen was already sitting on the roof of one of the wagons, watching the approaching enemies. She estimated the trajectory of these sand monsters and jumped high up. The girl pulled out her sharp daggers with the help of space enchantments and was ready to put them into action. She concentrated and channeled her power to use the aura weapon. Her daggers began to strike directly at the enemies that were under the layer of sand. Their bloodied opponents crawled out of the ground like moles in terror. At that very moment, Leon appeared on the horizon. He raised his sword up and was ready to rush into battle. The guy summoned the power of his aura and his weapon shone with a bright light, illuminating everything around him. 
He shouted at the top of his voice that enemies had infiltrated the camp and were targeting the supply wagons. The peacefully sleeping mercenaries and the guild leader immediately woke up upon hearing this shout. The attackers of the camp did not expect to be noticed. They hoped to rob the wagons and escape unnoticed. But here the angry mercenaries were approaching them. The commander reminded them that the protection of the guild leader and the cargo came first. The robbers realized they couldn't handle that many enemies. Karen's daggers were chasing them from the air. It was decided to retreat from the camp empty-handed. The mercenary received orders not to let the enemies get away. Karen saw that one of the robbers had managed to bring someone else's stuff with him after all. She threw her daggers at him, but the enemies were not as easy as they seemed at first glance. One of them intercepted the girl's dagger on the fly. It was a sight that amazed Leon. Karen's daggers were flying at unimaginable speeds, hitting the target. The boy and girl watched as their enemy tossed the dagger aside and disappeared underground. Karen said nothing. Her enemies rarely escaped the attacks of her deadly blades. Gustav was not about to let the intruders escape. He shouted to Leon that enemies had been spotted on his side. The lad turned around and saw many footprints moving underground of the robbers. Alcide asked if it was time to take a look at his misbehaving student's skills. Leon exhaled and summoned the power of his aura. The sword shimmered and filled with energy. The boy wanted to demonstrate a new technique to his mentor, but realized that now was not the right time. After all, if he used the big bear sword technique here, he could finish off a dozen more enemies. But the attackers were not like ordinary monsters. Besides, his comrades were not on the verge of life and death. They were facing the most common thieves, so there was no point in massacring them unilaterally. The lad's doubts were dispelled by El Cid, who said there was nothing objectionable in his hesitation. The spirit told Leon he was a hero, not a bandit. Whether to burn everything in his path or to punish evil in the name of justice, he must find his own way. Sure, there are universal standards of right and wrong, but it's hard to set your own standards by personally deciding who to punish and who not to punish. Leon had a choice to make. Stab the thief to death without even the thought of leniency, or try to re-educate him by word and deed. The guy understood that every decision comes from a righteous heart, but each person has a different opinion on which path is more righteous. Leon realized that his own values were still unformed. He could only hope that one day he would find the answer for himself. The captured thieves were kneeling before the mercenaries who had brought them in. Guild leader Arnold announced that due to the surprise of the attack, some of the cargo was stolen. Gustav asked how that was so. After all, the thieves were not even able to fight back, caring only for escape. He wondered when they had managed to steal anything. Twirling the sharp dagger in her hand, Karen said there was one bastard with a load. It seemed to the girl that it was their boss. She reported that he was acting extremely relaxed. Karen assumed that the cargo had been stolen before the fight began. The thieves had acted covertly, trying not to give themselves away. But what was strange to the girl was that she couldn't tell from the looks of it that the enemies had that kind of skill. Perhaps they had used some kind of artifact. Everyone present in Arnold's tent wondered the same thing, why the villains had shown up here in droves. Leon thought that even if they concealed their presence with artifacts, it shouldn't be forgotten that that enemy easily caught the dagger thrown by Karen. Arnold said they stole the most valuable cargo. He asked those present to track down the bandits. Gustav hesitated but did not make a decision without consulting his mercenaries. He asked Hamel for his opinion. The red-haired mercenary replied that if one planned to chase, one should move out right now. After all, due to the natural trade of the desert, the tracks left behind are quickly erased. Even if they set off right away, the chances of catching up with the enemies are only 50%. Karen said she'd be able to track down the thieves. After all, on the arm of one of the bastards, there was a mark from her weapon that would lead straight to him. Arnold's eyes shone with hope. He said that if the girl succeeded in tracking down the enemies, he would take care of the reward for her. Karen specified that Leon would go with her, of course. After all, she needed a reliable companion. She also added that she would need Mr. Hamill's help. The man immediately agreed to her request. The guildmaster handed the girl a compass and said they would definitely need it. Karen noticed that the thing was broken, but Arnold explained that this compass was enchanted. A stolen jewelry box is hard to distinguish from ordinary cargo. This compass will help you recognize it. When it is within a 10-meter radius, the arrow will point to its exact location. Hamill said it will be a race with time until sunrise, so they need to move out now. A small team of three men, without wasting a second, set out to find the lost cargo. Gustav watched the guys and realized that if a rank-A adventurer was with them, this pursuit squad would win. Moving across the desert, 
Karen suddenly found the trail of the escaped thief becoming clearer. She had to speed up a little. Watching Leon keeping up with the boys running across the desert terrain, El Cid said that the boy's stamina had increased noticeably. Karen held her hand up, ordering her companions to stop. They had arrived at their destination. The pursuit party approached a huge crevice in the sandy soil that went far into the depths. Jumping down there, Leon said he couldn't even believe there was such a valley in the middle of the desert. Karen looked around carefully and concluded that the place had been built artificially. People had created it a long time ago. It was hard to imagine how people could build such a behemoth with their own hands. The girl said that these buildings were about a hundred years old. She noticed the inscriptions carved into the stone. They were so old that they were completely unreadable. Hearing that the structure was a century old, a hunch flashed through the lad's mind. El Cid said that he too thought that this place was the cause of desertification. Leon asked if digging a hole in the ground could achieve such a result. The spirit rolled his eyes and said that in that case, all the mines of the world would be in the desert. The whole point was that this place was unusual. It was the center of the spiritual vein that flowed through the meadows and glades. Now, no matter how much the spirit searched for remnants of that energy, there was nothing. The soil had turned to dead earth where nothing could grow. Leon wondered who had unearthed this spiritual vein and for what purpose it had been done. Alcide said it's almost impossible to find out after all this time. The trio of pursuers moved forward through this desolate cleft. There were a great many human footprints everywhere. Karen suddenly felt someone's presence and asked Leon if he felt the same. The girl felt three guards standing ahead. Behind these guards were more than a hundred other enemies. It looked like they had found a den of thieves. The blonde asked the boy what they should do. Apparently the thieves found this abandoned structure and began using it as a base, gradually strengthening their power in the desert. Karen said there were gates ahead, guarded by guards. Behind them she sensed the presence of more than a hundred people. The girl turned to Leon, asking if they should all be killed. Leon looked at the sword in his hands and began to ponder whether it was necessary to complete the mission by killing every last one of them. After all, then his actions would be a brutal massacre. The boy listened and heard the scraps of conversation between the two thieves. They were talking about how their last foray had been a waste. The thieves said that half of the band had been caught, and the chief, in a fit of rage, had killed two more. Everyone realized that attacking the guild caravan was a mistake. One of them further said that the other day they came across a family. The father was on his knees begging to spare at least the child. They killed the man along with his wife, leaving only their offspring alive. The thief said it would be more fun to kill. His interlocutor disagreed, saying that leaving a child in the desert would slowly dry it up, which was a funny sight. The other thief laughed approvingly. After hearing this, Leon realized that now he had no need to look for reasons to spare these people. The boy summoned the power of his aura and realized that inside himself he had already made a decision on how to proceed. His response was the eclipse technique, which he used against these brutal thieves who didn't spare even children. El Cid watched approvingly as the lad matured, making tough decisions. When the way was open, Hamill shouted that it was safe to advance. Karen said that even though the enemies were weak, they were numerically outnumbered. She urged them to concentrate on small groups. The girl insisted that she would take the initiative, so Hamill and Leon would just have to follow her. The boys had no choice but to follow Karen. Hamill could see that she was on a roll, but the girl did not wait for her companions. The girl didn't wait for her companions, but without wasting a second, she rushed into the battle and already attacked another opponent. Within seconds, her deadly daggers bled and took the lives of several members of this thieving gang. One of the thieves watched Karen massacre his comrades and wondered who the girl was. While he was thinking of putting the chief on notice, the undertaker silently approached him. A moment later, there was no one to warn the chief of the invasion. Karen tossed back her hair and said serenely that this kind of warm-up was very refreshing. Her whole body was stiff from the wagon ride. She advised guys to warm up like this all the time if they want life to beat. Hamill asked Leon if Karen was originally like this. Leon grinned and nodded affirmatively. The red-haired man sent him a sympathetic look. The guy noticed that there was blood on the blonde's face. He went over and wiped it off with his fingers. Karen's eyes widened when Leon's fingers touched her cheek. The touch awakened a strange emotion in her. Terrified of what feelings might awaken, Karen immediately turned away and staggered away from Leon. Hamill, who was watching, gave the guy a hug and said he was a true professional at what he did. Seeing Leon's incomprehensible look, Hamill said that one day in the distant future, he would understand everything himself. Two more guards stood in front of the entrance to the enemy's lair. 
Karen said the compass points to that door. That means that's where the stolen cargo should be. The girl said she would infiltrate there in the form of a shadow and check everything out. She ordered her partners to deal with the guards and start the invasion. After giving her orders, she summoned the power of her aura, and a shadow appeared out of nowhere and completely surrounded the girl. Hamill watched as the shadows engulfed Karen and said that she had simply unique abilities. The red-haired mercenary pulled out his bow and said it was time for them to get to work as well. At the tip of his arrow was an explosive he planned to use against the guards. He took clear aim at the door and released the arrow. While the boys were trying to find the stolen items, the thieves tried their best to open Arnold's jewelry box. One of the thieves, most likely their leader, ordered to find a way to open this box sooner rather than later. Finally, there was some progress and the carving in one of the caskets cracked, but no sooner had they looked inside than there was an explosion, turning the room into ruins. The main bandit, though surprised by the sudden attack, was able to stay on his feet. The door that led to the corridors, which was well guarded, had been blown off its hinges and opened a free passage. Leon and Hamill took advantage of this passageway. With their weapons at the ready, the boys prepared for battle. The head thief realized with horror that these were guild members guarding valuable goods. Hamill stated that they came here to get their goodies back. The bandit assessed his opponents and decided that if they made it to the gate without a scratch, it meant their rank was higher than B. He didn't want to face them, but no sooner had he made the decision to escape than the undertaker caught up with him, deciding his fate. The head of the bandits flew aside, but he was still alive. He only got away with a cut leg. The undertaker squeaked out in a gruff voice that the man had been lucky to duck, for the plan was for his body to be cooling by now. Karen's shadowy personality said that if they had run into each other four years ago, the man wouldn't have given him a chance to even touch his ankle. The thief asked in horror what he knew about his past. After all, everyone who knew anything was already dead. Looking at the ghostly shadow, the man remembered that there was someone who was still alive, even though they knew of his past. Karen lowered the image of the coffin maker enough so that part of her face was visible and addressed the thief, calling him Mole. Even through the gas mask, the thief's eyes widened. He realized that the undertaker was standing in front of him. While the old acquaintances were enjoying the reunion, Leon was attacked by several men from a gang of thieves. After a few swings of the sword and arrows fired, each of the attackers were no longer alive. Hamill looked around, assessing their work, and said they seemed to have everyone sorted out. The redhead asked what to do about the ringleader. Leon didn't answer anything, only looked at the fact that Karen had gone to deal with him herself. In addition to the image of the undertaker, Karen didn't hide her true colors. She and the leader seemed to know each other. Twirling her dagger in her hands, Karen reminded herself that she had once told the man to get the man out of this realm for good, or she would finish him off herself. The leader of the thieves had not listened to her, and now she was obliged to fulfill her promise. The man had to die. The man jumped aside and told the girl not to make him laugh. After all, he was no longer the man she knew him to be. The image of the Undertaker was known as the Terror of the Dark World. Even if the man had changed, the difference in their powers was too great. Only death awaited the thief. The enemy jumped back farther and farther away, saying that the winner was known from the beginning. Despite these pathetic attempts at escape, Karen pointed her daggers and wondered if this was a protest. The girl started throwing daggers, saying she had given the man an order to die. One of the daggers pierced the mole's arm, nailing him to the sandy soil. The man roared in pain. Karen wondered how many times her old acquaintance would be able to withstand such attacks. The man summoned his strength despite the pain and long claws like those of wild beasts appeared on his hands. Karen didn't give the man a chance to attack. She started throwing her blades at him. They clearly entered the thief's body, releasing a spray of blood outside. The daggers hit his arms and legs and slashed his opponent's face and head. A moment later, the man couldn't keep his feet and fell to his knees. The mask fell from his face, revealing the true image of his opponent. His features were contorted in pain. Coughing up blood, the head of the thieves said that Karen was terrifyingly strong. He called her a real monster. Suddenly, the man asked, why did the girl do that to him? He shouted in rage that she had a good life. Her parents had not been killed, and the girl had not been stolen from her family. A worthless orphan girl just picked up on the street and made stronger. The thief asked why Karen had so much resentment building up in her soul. Creeping closer, Mole growled that even if she did kill the boss, there was no need to destroy the entire organization. Karen frowned and wondered if she had ever asked to be made stronger. The man laughed hysterically, saying that the girl had gotten greedy. After all, the organization had given her shelter, and if it weren't for them, 
she would have died long ago in some gutter. The girl said that maybe that's exactly what would have happened. But avoiding the worst-case scenario doesn't mean everything else is the best. Karen explained that her life is made up of things she never wanted. For example, as an orphan, she was raised to be a murderer. Even being granted such power was not her cherished wish. So she decided to get her hands on what her heart longed for. The man aggressively asked, What was it that the girl wanted? Karen clenched her fists and replied without a shadow of a doubt that her cherished wish was freedom. The bloodied head of the thieves stared at the girl with incomprehension. Seconds later, he laughed out loud, asking if that was what she wanted. He said that if she wanted her freedom, she could fuck off to her heart's content. The man didn't understand why she had decided to share that freedom with all of them. The mole said they had very different desires. None of them had ever wanted freedom. Karen listened in shock as the man bemoaned the fact that she had only thrown them one measly dagger, and other than that they had no other way or hope of survival. The man covered his face with the palm of his hand and said that he was only a ghostly darkness after all. Unexpectedly, Karen sat down next to the man and hugged him. She wanted to comfort this traumatized man. The girl apologized to this thief, saying that perhaps it was all the result of her turning her back on them. Karen and Leon's gazes crossed. The boy was amazed at the girl's mercy and sensitivity. Karen thought that if the man sitting in front of her had had the same chance as her, things would have gone differently. She gave Mole a new order, survive and become a better man than he is now. The man listened in amazement as the girl ordered him to survive and find her later. Without another word, Karen turned and ran towards her comrades. Running up, the girl asked how things were with the stolen jewelry box. Leon said the first thing they need to do is get their stuff. When the deed was done, Karen pointed down the confusing corridors, hinting that it was time to head back to camp. Just as the team was about to return to their seat, everyone felt the ground shaking beneath their feet. The head of the thieves pressed the panic button, thus causing this phenomenon. Smirking, Mole told Karen to look closely at what he had become. Leon guessed that self-destruct button. They need to get out of these buildings as soon as possible. Everything around them began to shake so violently that it was hard to make out the road that led to the exit. The head of the thieves sat down in the middle of the crumbling hall and did not move. It was clear that he had accepted his fate and did not want to escape. At dawn, three figures were spotted approaching the guild camp. Hearing this, Gustav smiled, for he knew who the approaching men were. Karen, Leon, and Hamel were returning safe and sound after completing their mission to recover the stolen items. When the caravan set off again, Leon told El Cid that now they could forget about exploring the canyon forever, for it was destroyed because of the mole. El Cid said sadly that the place had been hidden from everyone for over a hundred years, so whoever made the canyon was unlikely to have left a single clue. The spirit asked his mentee to discuss it later. It was strange for Leon to see his mentor in such a mood. Karen, who was sitting on the roof of the wagon, suddenly called Leon to her. She said excitedly for Leon to look ahead. After all, they were almost to the nearest town. Leon looked ahead and saw that the impressive fortress city of Barcassa was in front of them. As they drove closer, the boy realized that it was the first time he had ever seen such a high fortress wall. Karen said it's a border town protecting the border. This territory is directly governed by the Marquis. For this reason, Barcassa is the city that the king gave the right to have independent troops. Arnold announced that they would stay in town for three days to replenish their provisions and get the caravan in order. The guild leader asked what Leon and Karen were going to do in their spare time. Both girl and boy stared at Arnold with incomprehension. The man explained that they could stay where they left off, or they could go about their business. The main thing was to return before the caravan moved on. Karen immediately said there was one thing she would like to find. She said she would show up where they were staying and asked for the address. Arnold said to go three blocks to the left down the main street and find the Song of the Goat Tavern. Rooms had been rented for them there. The man said Karen and Leon could use the large room on the top floor. Her pride of place is a huge double bed. The boy's eyes widened at the same time when they heard that the room contained a double bed. The embarrassed Leon asked if they would have one room for two. The guild leader asked, wouldn't it be more comfortable? Leon didn't even know how to react to the fact that he would be sharing a room with Karen for the night. The girl was very much amused. She asked him why he was suddenly embarrassed. She winked and asked if he had any expectations. Leon quickly said that he didn't even think of anything like that and flashed away from the girl and the guild leader. Arnold asked irritably if he had done something wrong again. Karen laughed and said it was okay. She smiled broadly at the man and said she wouldn't be getting much sleep at night anyway. Arnold asked if he should maybe get another room ready so he doesn't embarrass anyone. After a moment's thought, the girl replied that she shouldn't worry so much. 
she and Leon would get along in the same room. When Karen was finally alone, she indulged in sad thoughts that there would always be powerful allies near the hero. Though she became Leon's first ally, there was no guarantee that she could always be by his side. The girl was worried that if someone stronger than her came along, she might lose the opportunity to be together with Leon. Karen realized she should try harder, and this town was an opportunity for her to prove her worth. She wanted Leon to think there was no way he could do without the girl. Sitting on the roof of one of the buildings in the city, she looked carefully to find what she needed. Her eyes sparkled when she finally saw what she was looking for. At this time, Leon was worried about bothering Karen again. Even at the academy, boys and girls lived separately, so sharing a room was unusual for him. Listening to the boy's worries about it, Elcide thought the boy was still too stupid. Leon's musings were interrupted by Arnold, who began to say that he was sorry. The man said that he had unknowingly put him and Karen in an awkward position. Leon started making excuses and saying that everything was fine. To change the subject, the boy asked what kind of cargo they were so desperate to get back. It seemed that there was something valuable in those boxes. Arnold said the information about what was inside the boxes was an important secret. But immediately the guild leader said that he shouldn't be too hard on the person who risked his life to bring him back. He would share the information, but in return he asked Leon to promise that he would keep what he heard a secret. The guy gave his word. Arnold walked right up to Leon and whispered that inside that box was what was called the Black Crystal. Since it was a first-grade product with no impurities, the production cost of this gemstone is almost a thousand gold coins. But most importantly, the item had been commissioned by Lord Reuben, the governor of the city through which they would pass next. Arnold said that if someone like their guild suddenly fell into disfavor with him, he would retaliate without discriminating between right and wrong. Leon guessed that was why the guild leader said that that cargo had to be returned by all means. Arnold said that his life depended on it. After talking to the head of the guild, Leon started looking everywhere for Karen. Inside one of the wagons, he found a note pinned to the floor by the blonde's dagger. It said the girl would be back soon. Leon remembered her saying she wanted to find something, so she had already started to act. Suddenly, Leon felt someone approaching him from behind. Turning around, he saw a crowd of mercenaries frowning at him. Leon said that he was alone now, since Karen had gone somewhere else on her business. Some of the mercenaries were disappointed that the girl wouldn't be with them. Leon had absolutely no idea what was going on or why they suddenly needed him and Karen. Gustav grabbed Leon and said with a smile that he should go with them. The boy asked where they were taking him. The mercenary commander replied that of course they had to visit the tavern. Gustav shouted to the rest of the mercenaries that they were going to drink with the young master. But there was a condition. The one who throws up first pays for the drink. When dusk fell on the fortress city of Barkasu, nothing good was in store for people with evil thoughts. The dark streets were filled with the bloody corpses of those who had crossed someone's path. This time it was the nasty men who got Karen out of her mind with their lewd language. One of these men dared to touch the girl without permission. Now the foolish daredevil was lying on the road, pinned to the pavement by a woman's foot. Karen did not forgive those who saw her as nothing more than a body to be commandeered for their own pleasures. The girl said she had one question that the man had to answer. She wondered where the biggest gang in this city was located, the one that ran areas like the black market and smuggling. The man didn't know what to say, because if he told him, he would die, but if he kept silent, he would also die. When Karen found out the information she needed, she was done with the pervert. She knew the neighborhood was controlled by the Golden Owl Gang, it was an organization of traders whose main occupation is smuggling and the black market. Plus, they hold high government positions because they make a lot of money. But it is said that the Marquis, who is the owner of the local lands, also supports them. Karen realized that this state of affairs was adding to her troubles. The girl finally reached the streets whose walls were covered with golden owl signs. The last time she had been here was about ten years ago. She stepped close to the door, which also had the sign above it. Her feet still remembered the way here. Karen remembered Leon wondering about the meaning of the nickname Coffin Man. She had left the path of an assassin, so there was no point in making a mystery of it. Then the girl explained to him that it was all because of the coded communication method. All dark organizations use their own individual method of secret messaging. The Spider organization, of which she was a member, used it as well. At Spider, the main requirement was to visit the funeral home and place the contents of the request, which included the identity of the target and the fee for the work in the casket. Leon began to understand the nature of the nickname. Karen said that usually organizations do not complicate the request procedure so much and use simpler methods. 
For example, when a client comes to them, they use a flashlight that causes optical illusions to create a fake entrance. The real door remains open only for those who know the secret combination. Those who don't know it will grab the handle of the fake door and won't be able to get in. Karen said she possessed a shadow aura and things were different for her. She could see through optical illusions, so they were a mere trifle to her. The girl could always safely find the real passage and get inside, just like she did this time. Bypassing the illusion, the girl found herself in a long corridor, the stairs of which gradually descended downward. As she began her descent, she felt someone's presence thanks to her aura. In the hall that was at the bottom of the corridor was a guard dressed in a red cloak. Karen entered this room and, as if nothing had happened, said hello to the man in the most friendly way possible. The guard also adopted a cartoonishly friendly look and greeted the intruder. He asked if the girl had enjoyed their warm welcome. Karen remembered a bunch of traps that were in the hallway leading downstairs and said the reception was so-so. The guard asked what she wanted. Karen replied that she wanted to buy information. When the man asked who exactly she was interested in, the girl gave the name Fiode Rubin. The girl said she was going to pay for the information, so there was no need to hide anything. The don't sell option was against the principles of this gang. The guardian set the price at 800 gold coins. Karen said it was too expensive and asked for a discount for the valuable information she could provide. The man replied that in that case, the fee could be reduced to 700 gold coins. Karen began to bargain, asking him to lower the price a little more. She smiled slyly and told the butler to think better of her request. The man didn't understand how the girl was able to guess who he was. Karen said that although her disguise skill was not bad, her eyes could not be fooled. In front of her was the executive director of the Golden Owl, in charge of the local black market. Butler Glenn was one of the Marquis of Balkus's most trusted men. The man realized there was no point in hiding his identity any longer and told Karen that she was very bold. Karen once again asked if they were willing to sell the information. After all, the man seemed extremely interested in the information she had to offer. Glenn realized that having such a keen eye could at least be an A-rang adventurer. If he tried to get rid of her, there would be consequences. The butler said that 260 gold pieces was the final price. Karen replied that she was happy with that deal. The next word surprised Karen. Glenn said that Fiat Rubin was now like a hole in a drain. Looking at the girl's uncomprehending look, the man explained that it meant that whoever went in could not come out. While Karen was busy with business, the fun was in full swing in the tavern. While Leon drank, Gustav told him that the booze should go in like water down a drain. If it comes out, the guy is lost. The boy was crooning at the strength of the drink. The mercenaries laughed and shouted that he was good. A pretty waitress came to the table and asked what their next destination was. Hamel replied that they were on their way to Feod Rubens. The girl clapped her eyelashes fearfully and said that they were really brave, for the other mercenaries avoided this place. She assumed that the rumors had not reached them. Hearing this, Gustav turned around and asked what rumors were being talked about. Leon also began to listen attentively to the girl's story about the vampire ruling the streets at night. Vampires were a race with intelligence not unlike that of humans. They also had excellent magical abilities. They also possessed immortality that could be compared to that of mid- to high-level demonic monsters. Vampires were rejected by society because of their habit of drinking human blood. It is said that only a few of this race have survived. While the church has not declared them an extinct species, at the same time, none recognize their existence in their territories. The mercenaries began to shout that if a vampire appeared here, they would cut his throat. Leon realized that the presence of such a monster in the city stirred his heart. He would like to try to fight a monster that has strength almost like middle-grade demonic monsters. Leon pondered whether he, as a hero, should take it upon himself to eliminate them, or he should first make an attempt to resolve the problem through conversation. Guy asked his mentor for his opinion on the matter. Elseed said that in his time, there were very few vampires left. The strong ones had joined the Demon King's army, and he had personally killed every one of them. The spirit also said that he had never seen a normal vampire who didn't need to be punished. Leon realized that the possibility of existing with humans was still questionable. But still, he wanted to try to talk to the vampires about it. He decided that, as a hero, he should judge for himself what is evil. The boy decided that the vampire trial should be postponed for now. He wanted to see and hear for himself. Leon's attention was drawn to a violent pounding of his fist against the wall. Some aggressive man was shouting something at Gustav. A blonde man entered the tavern and asked Gustav indignantly why they were making such a fuss. They hadn't rented the whole inn. Gustav said the man's name was Jerome, 
and his presence signaled the beginning of a new storm. The mercenary commander urged Jerome not to make too much fuss in this lovely place. Jerome resented this order, for he was not one of Gustav's henchmen. The commander said he was ready to voice his request once more. He wanted the blonde man to just get the hell out of this place. The response to this request was Jerome spitting directly into Gustav's drinking glass. Such insolent and disrespectful behavior shocked all the mercenaries present in the tavern. Laughing loudly, Jerome asked what would happen if he didn't want to leave the place. Such provocative behavior pissed Gustav off. He got up from the table and said that bastards like Jerome could only spoil the mood of others. The commander said that if the blonde wanted a show of force, they could go outside. He wouldn't be able to escape his hand there. Jerome accepted the challenge and followed Gustav and the company of mercenaries outside. He wondered if mercenaries had so many unexpected fights. Observing all this, Elsid told Leon that mercenaries prove their worth by force. If they talk but do nothing, their credibility goes down. Basically, they were people who always get into an argument and strike back. Hamill remarked that Jerome seemed to want to put up a fight from the start. Leon asked, Is that strange? The red-haired mercenary replied that he had seen Jerome fight with his commander countless times. But this was the first time such an open challenge, for the winner was obvious. Looking at the blonde, Leon asked if their abilities were so different. Hamill answered proudly that few could compete with their commander. Jerome is also known for looking for easy work. But according to Hamill, his behavior was very different today. The man told Leon that he has a bad feeling about this fight. Gustav turned to the boys and told them not to even think about him losing. He would definitely beat that blonde idiot. Jerome asked his opponent what the rules of the fight were. Gustav answered, die or surrender. Elsid said for Leon to watch the fight closely, for it was a high-level battle between mercenaries. Clenching his weapon tighter, Jerome said the fight could begin. Without wasting a second, the blonde immediately rushed to deliver the first blow with his dual swords. Such a quick and unexpected attack quite surprised Gustav. Jerome smiled madly and struck one after another at a frantic speed. He managed to draw first blood and wounded Gustav in the shoulder and cheek. Jerome wondered if he continued to seem like a small fish to the mercenary commander. Elsid took a closer look at the blonde man's weapon and realized that he was holding a falcata, a unique weapon whose center of gravity was at the front of the sword. Gustav replied to Jerome that his skills had improved greatly. After that, the man summoned his aura. The enemy was struck by Gustav's white aura. As it turned out, his attribute was steel. The blonde man laughed, saying that he had expected such a move. His attribute was water, and he had recently mastered the wave move. This time, he wanted to bring Gustav to his knees. When Jerome once again attacked and the opponent's swords crossed, Gustav had no problem withstanding the attack. Invoking the power of his aura, the mercenary commander threw the enemy back a few steps. The impact was so powerful that it was heard even in the nearby streets. When the wave from the impact passed, the first thing Leon was interested in was what the result was. Jerome was alive, but he was barely on his feet and coughing up blood. His falcata lay beside him. Gustav approached his enemy closely and urged him to stop there, for otherwise one of them would have to die. Jerome laughed, asking his opponent if he had any such thought that the one who would die could be Gustav. Rising from his knees, the blonde said it was only a warm-up. Now he would demonstrate real power. The mercenary commander asked if he still had the strength to compete with him. He suggested that he leave that silly boast behind. To the surprise of everyone around him, Jerome summoned some strange power and the nails on his hands began to turn into animal-like claws. When the man raised his head, his eyes no longer resembled human eyes. They glowed red and his fangs had lengthened. Here Gustav looked at his opponent, and a second later he disappeared as if he had never existed. The mercenaries began looking around in bewilderment, trying to find Jerome. Leon applied his ability to pick up even the smallest of details and was able to spot him from above. Jerome jumps up so high he was out of range from Gustav. He had the perfect opportunity to strike while landing. The blonde didn't miss the opportunity and struck his enemy. Gustav screamed in pain. Blood was spreading over his body. The mercenary commander couldn't believe that someone had managed to shatter his steel aura. It was incomprehensible where Jerome got such immense strength from. Gustav was shocked. He didn't understand what was happening or how the blonde managed to attack so stealthily. There was chatter in the crowd that they had only seen the commander's fall. The mercenaries couldn't imagine how Jerome had become so fast with only a B rank. Leon was at odds with the mercenaries about the man's rank. After all, he was just as fast as Karen. Jerome slowly walked over to Gustav and stepped on his bloody foot. This action caused the commander to roar in pain. The mercenaries immediately rushed to the aid of their commander, for this blonde man had no respect for his opponent. 
Jerome raised a clawed hand and ordered everyone to stand in place. Other mercenaries who had the same red eyes and long claws came forward. They asked, What to do if a third party interferes in the duel? The crowd was amazed, for these were the people they knew, who had walked among them. Gustav looked at what was happening with shock, but still he raised his stubborn gaze and looked at his enemy. A smirking Jerome walked up to the commander and said he was waiting for him to start begging him for mercy. The blonde man's facial features had lost all semblance of humanity. His eyes were bloodshot and his mouth was drooling. Alcide realized something was wrong. This man looked too strange. When the spirit realized who was in front of them, he told Leon to raise his sword as high as possible. It was necessary to scatter the light of his aura all around. Without asking too many questions, the boy did as his mentor said. Bright light filled the space around him. Jerome couldn't stand the rays of light coming from the holy sword. His skin and eyes began to burn unbearably, causing him to scream in pain. Mercenaries like the blonde man behaved the same way. They were squirming, screaming that their whole bodies were on fire. A couple minutes later, these people were unconscious on the ground. Leon didn't understand what had happened or what it all meant. He wanted to share his hunch with El Cid, but he voiced the thoughts himself. The spirit confirmed the boy's speculation that these weren't just people. He called them dumpiers. This was the first time Leon had heard such a concept, so he asked his mentor to explain to him what they were. The spirit said that dampiers were those who had ingested a reagent made from vampire blood. Simply put, this creature stood on the border between humans and vampires. He was no match for a vampire. He had strength only at night, but his regeneration was much stronger than that of mere mortals. El Cid added that although dampiers didn't use black magic, it was difficult to defeat them at night. However, the holy sword and solar aura could handle it. Gustav approached Leon and wanted to know what had just happened. When the guy asked how the commander was feeling, he heard that everything was fine. Leon realized that Gustav was understating things. He had serious injuries. He needed treatment, and as soon as possible. Leon said briefly that the bastards were vampires. That news made the crowd murmur. After a while, the vampires began to come to their senses and try to get to their feet. Gustav and the mercenaries had already expected this, so they immediately approached Jerome and asked him if he was awake, because they had a matter to discuss. The quiet evening in the city was broken by the shouts of Jerome, who stated that by their actions, the mercenaries were breaking the rules. When the fun with the vampires came to an end, Leon went to the place where he and Karen had rented a room. Guy sat on the bed pondering Jerome's confession. According to him, the root of the problem was Count Reuben. The caravan's next destination was to visit this very man. The Count organizes an army, making mercenaries and adventurers his subordinates. Guy thought that if the church found out about this, her shock would be enormous. He wondered what Count Reuben was up to. Plus, it's not clear why he's so eager to get his hands on the black crystal they're going to deliver to him. They planned to go with Gustav tomorrow to talk to the head of the guild, so it was time to go to bed. However, Leon was worried about why Karen hadn't shown up yet. Elsie'd asked slyly if he and Karen were going to sleep together. Leon didn't even understand at first what the spirit was talking about. What do you mean, together? Then he realized he was sitting on a huge double bed. There was no other place to sleep in the room. This realization made the guy really nervous. He said he was just worried about the girl's long absence. Just then, Karen showed up. She smiled and said she had been looking all over for Leon. The girl excitedly began to say that she was about to share some very important information she had gotten during her absence. Leon was embarrassed beyond belief. He thought he could take his mind off the fact that they were alone, so he asked what news she had brought. Karen asked Leon not to be too surprised. The girl thought dreamily that by sharing the information from the Golden Owl, she would show Leon her intelligence, not just her strength. Not holding back her emotions, Karen reported that a vampire had appeared in Count Reuben's feud. The girl spread her arms victoriously to the side, waiting for Leon's enthusiastic reaction. But the guy said coldly enough that he was surprised. Such a rotten reaction made Karen angry. The girl got an emotional reaction except that it wasn't from Leon, but from the head of the guild. Arnold was simply stunned by the news. Karen thought she wished she could see that expression on Leon's face instead of Arnold's. Sitting in his office, Arnold reasoned that despite the vampire in his feud, the Count was building up his military might. The guild leader asked if the information that none other than Count Reuben was behind all of this was accurate. Gustav said that's exactly what it is. Besides, dampiers have appeared, and for these monsters to appear, there must be a connection to a vampire. In other words, someone was behind Jerome, and there's a good chance it was Reuben, 
The commander said that fortunately this information had come to light before they arrived at Ruben's feud, so they could take action. Arnold said that Gustav was right. However, they still wouldn't be able to avoid meeting the Count. The guild leader thought that it would be better if they had stolen that box, then there would be an excuse. But if he didn't give it back now, the Count would take it as a personal insult. As a simple merchant, Arnold could not make such a mistake. They could well have been killed for showing disrespect to a member of the nobility. Gustav realized the man was right, so he said they had no choice. The commander said it was up to them to step into the danger. From a strategic point of view, this was the worst case scenario. Both Leon and Karen understood. Even realizing all of this, they couldn't quit what they had started. Gustav said that if they refused to do their job, they would undermine their credibility and reputation. They must be held accountable until the very end of the mission. Arnold slapped his hands on the table and said he was willing to spend all his spare cash to hire more mercenaries. He was willing to supply them with silver bullets and holy water to fight the vampires. The guild leader wouldn't beg for his life to be spared. Gustav looked into Arnold's eyes and when he realized he was serious, he smiled approvingly. Afterward, the men sealed the arrangement with a handshake. Karen said thoughtfully that the men would do just fine on their own. The girl asked Leon for a moment of her time. He was a little alarmed by the request. Karen stepped aside and Leon had no choice but to follow her. The girl shouted irritably that this valuable information had cost her a lot of effort. Leon was confused. He didn't understand what had caused Karen to react so violently. The blonde came even closer and said that if she hadn't put so much effort into it, they wouldn't have been able to even guess what was going on. Karen said there was a reason Mole had attacked them in the desert. Most likely the head of the thieves had received clear instructions from Count Reuben, which was the reason for their fight. Now Leon gave exactly the reaction Karen had expected. He didn't think the attack in the desert could be tied to Count Reuben. The girl was finally satisfied that Leon understood the peculiarity of the situation. Karen said that there was no way the mole could have known what the most valuable cargo was. So the attack was no accident. Leon realized that those thieves had shown up unexpectedly to steal the jewelry box. Karen nodded her head affirmatively. The girl concluded that Mole was actively cooperating with Count Reuben and doing his dirty work for him. Boy and girl together came to the conclusion that Count Reuben did not want them to arrive in his possession. Most likely it was because it was extremely cumbersome to accommodate an entire caravan, and the guards were extremely loyal. So the Count couldn't get his hands on everything without being seen. That's why he had to rely on the bandits. Leon thought that even if Reuben was up to something in his feud, he was trying hard not to attract attention. That was probably why he'd tried to steal the cargo he'd ordered. But not only did the guild manage to protect the cargo and destroy the enemies, but the caravan was also able to approach the borders of Reuben's feud. The lad realized that the Count must think he had added to his troubles. Things were taking a dangerous turn. The danger increased several times over when the guild exceeded the Earl's expectations. Now he would prepare for a more thorough massacre in his feud. In such a case, it would probably be worth going to any lengths. The necklace with the sign of the Order of the Iron Castle would have to be used. The guy looked at Karen carefully and said there was one place they needed to visit. Dark shadows enveloped Count Reuben's domain. The place deserved the title of Night City. In an old room with broken panes, a man dressed in black sat reading a book in the moonlight. As the shadows began to club behind him, the man turned to them, saying that he had been waiting for him to return. A man materialized from the shadows and greeted the seated man with the words, Your Highness. He was old and wore an elegant suit. The reading man called him Roman. The one who was addressed no differently than Your Highness said that the clan was completely destroyed and such titles were no longer appropriate. Roman said that to him he would always be Prince Tepes, a member of the vampire nobility who had inherited the blood of the Wallachians among three generations of Nosferatu. Roman said there were none of the Count's men within a one-kilometer radius, so the vampire Prince Tepes could stay here for at least five days. Tepesh pounded his fist on the table and wondered how this could have happened. Why Roman and he were the only ones left of their clan. The prince resented the fact that his sins were great, all because he was trying to find a place to live. He never expected that he would bring such disaster to his clan. Roman said that this sin belonged to the wicked man. But even if it did, Tepes did not absolve himself of responsibility for what had happened. He wanted to save his clan. Suddenly, the vampire prince felt uneasy. He covered his face with his hand and asked Roman to be quiet. Tepesh's already red eyes became even more bloodshot and seemed to glow from within. Roman realized that he was using a power, the ability to share feelings with those with whom the vampire shared his blood. 
even if it was blood he gave unwillingly. As long as the source of the power is in Tapetia, their minds are bound. Therefore the vampire prince saw the carnage that Jerome had caused through his own eyes. But the most interesting thing about this vision was that there was a guy present who wielded a holy sword that dispelled all darkness. A hysterical laugh escaped his throat. He thought that things were going great. Tapesh told the Roman that it looked like the goddess hadn't left them yet. The man asked what the prince meant. The prince told him that he had seen the Dampiers who had become the Count's puppets. This guy had neutralized the non-purebloods in one fell swoop using sacred power. Tepesh realized that if this warrior was here, he had information about him as well. The prince turned to Roman and said that this could be the key to a counterattack. Tepesh mentally turned to Andre Rubin and told him to wait a little longer. The vampire prince wanted to tear the count apart with his bloody claws. It was morning, which meant Elsid could bore Leon with more stories about vampires. The spirit said that in order to destroy those who were allied with the Demon King's army, he had single-handedly invaded the Vampire Lord's castle. Leon was sick of hearing about how Elcid had destroyed vampires in his time, how he'd wiped about 90% of the top bloodsuckers from the pages of history. The boy felt like he was going to bleed from his ears a little more. He told his mentor that he was fed up with his stories. Leon began to complain that he couldn't even practice in the wagon, since all he had to do was listen to Elcid's heroic stories. The boy was even sad that the road to the Reuben feud was so safe. It was too quiet and peaceful. He summarized by saying that the spirit had been chattering non-stop all week. He had to ride along with the chatty sword king. Mocking Leon, Elsid asked where he stood. The boy squealed and said he didn't have the strength to listen to him anymore. Karen finally showed up. She hung her head down from the wagon and said they had arrived. The caravan was approaching the Reuben residence. It was a beautiful building that sat at the foot of the mountains. Of course, the residence doesn't compare to Barcasa, which is called the city fortress, but it's pretty big for a castle on the outskirts of the country. Looking around carefully, Leon noticed something strange. It felt as if the fortress wall was glittering. Alcide said it was a barrier, protecting the castle. Using vast amounts of silver, a spell was engraved on the castle wall to block access to vampires. A thought popped into Leon's head. Perhaps their assumption was wrong. If Count Reuben was a dark horse controlling vampires, why was it necessary to put such a barrier on the fortress wall? The castle guard stopped the wagon to inspect the cargo. Arnold said that he was the head of the Stom Guild. When the guards heard this, they said that they were just waiting for them to arrive. The guards dispersed and allowed the caravan to pass through the barrier into the castle. Leon felt the powers of the barrier. When passing through, the feelings were not the same as when he came into contact with the sacred power. Karen also said that she was present with unpleasant sensations. Elcid said that if they had been vampires, they would have melted alive. Either way, it could be concluded that the knights guarding the gate were neither vampires nor dampiers. The spirit said that from now on they had to be on guard. There was no telling where the enemy would strike from. Leon looked around, scrutinizing the locals. They were ordinary people, no different from anyone else. The boy didn't understand what was going on. They hadn't met a single dampier, let alone a vampire, on the way from the gate to the castle. Was the information about the vampires wrong? The sun was still high, so maybe they weren't easy to figure out. The wagons pulled up to the next gate where the guards stood. A knight who introduced himself as Senior Knight Brand stepped forward. According to the Lord's order, only the guild leader and adventurers with mercenaries of B rank and above could pass through. Karen wondered if they could go too. Leon wondered for what purpose the Count was asking even the caravan guards to go inside. Once inside, the guests could see the luxurious apartments. The walls were light-colored and there were statues everywhere. Some of the mercenaries asked how to properly greet in such a place. Hamill said to just stand still. They stopped in front of a huge door that the Elder Knight Brand had led them to. He knocked on the doors and announced to his lord that the head of the Stom Guild was here along with his guards. The door opened and a voice was heard from there saying that guests could come in. Once inside, they saw Count Andre Rubin. The man looked at his guests with a frown. Arnold immediately crouched down on one knee showing his respect for the representative of the noble family. Leon followed the guild leader's example and bowed as well. He looked questioningly at El Cid, waiting for his assessment. The spirit said that this gentleman was not a vampire. That information surprised Leon. After a second, El Cid added that the man standing in front of them was a far more annoying creature. He was human. The spirit also added that all the knights in this room were ordinary people. It turns out that if neither the Count himself nor anyone from his entourage are vampires, then perhaps the information that bloodsuckers are practicing in this feud is a lie. 
Leon didn't sense in Reuben's tone the arrogance typical of high-ranking nobles. His eyes were filled with a gentle light. He didn't look like a villain at all. He greeted everyone standing in front of him and said that before he started talking, he wanted the item he had ordered. Arnold immediately handed him the box. The guild leader opened it and displayed a beautiful, sparkling crystal. The Count was completely satisfied with the order. He gave the promised amount and promised to reduce the price of the goods to be purchased by his guests by 20%. Arnold bowed obediently and said he was very grateful to the Count for his kindness. Andre Rubin said that there was no need for such formalities and now he wanted to get to the main thing. Both Leon and the mercenaries were very surprised to hear this sentence. They did not know that Arnold had any other business with the Count. Reuben told them not to be surprised. There are vampires lurking in his domain right now. This confession shocked absolutely everyone. Leon had never expected the Count to be honest about it. Reuben said they searched the Citadel day and night, but he found it hard for his knights to find the vampires, because these things are good at hiding. Also, he was concerned that the knights had not fought monsters before. So the Count suggested that his guests take up vampire hunting. None of the mercenaries and adventurers answered anything. Then the Count said that he would guarantee a decent reward and provide silver weapons and holy water. Karen and Leon agreed that the situation was completely incomprehensible. To get to the bottom of it, it would probably be necessary to accept the Count's offer. After the conversation, they were all placed in the important person's mansion without exception. Left alone with the guild leader and the mercenaries, Karen said she thought the Count intended to follow them. Arnold said they had no choice but to accept the offer. Gustav asked how likely it was that what the Count had said was true. He was alarmed by the fact that he had been the first to mention the existence of vampires. Leon and Karen also thought about him acting suspiciously, but in the end, it was just speculation, and they had no proof. Arnold threw up his hands and said that it was necessary to do as he said. If suddenly those behind the Count found out that they had doubted him, there would be trouble. Elsid also reminded Leon that they were now in Reuben's territory and they couldn't attack him in the open without evidence. Leon concluded that it would be best for them if Count Reuben was not their enemy. Elsid finally decided to share with Leon that Reuben was a high-ranking mage. The spirit said that the barrier on the wall was his work. The wave of magical power belonged to him. Leon figured that if the Count really couldn't stand vampires, he had no reason to borrow their power. He could turn the protective spell on the walls of the fortress into an offensive spell, and then all the vampires in the area would be burned to the ground. So, the Count is either eager to catch the vampires alive, or wants to silence the guild forever using the excuse of exterminating the vampires. Just like Elsid said, the Count is undoubtedly up to something in his feud. After all, there's a reason why he's hiding the fact that he's a high-ranked mage. The assumption that the Stom Guild had signed its own death warrant by getting involved was most likely true. When you think of Dampier mercenaries, there's no guarantee that Karen and the rest of them won't turn into something similar at the hands of the Count himself. Leon clenched his fists and promised himself that he wouldn't let something like this happen. Elsid reminded the lad that the main problem now was that the Count was the enemy. Elsid began to fly up and say this to either Arnold or Gustav as if they could hear or see him. Leon realized that it was unlikely he would be able to explain what the Count's true identity was without revealing Elsida's identity. The only one who would believe him was Karen. Suddenly the girl shouted to everyone to end this discussion because she wanted to bathe and go to bed and there was no progress in this conversation. What Arnold, what the mercenaries with Leon, absolutely everyone was in agreement with Karen's proposal. Left alone with the girl, Leon told her that Count Reuben was a magician. This news shocked Karen. The girl said that he was very dangerous, for he was on a level that even she couldn't see. Karen said there was no guarantee they would prevail with their current strength. She suggested buying time. Leon said that before he crossed Reuben's borders, he sent a request for help to the Order of the Holy Iron Castle using the bishop's necklace. However, the guy didn't know when they would come and in what quantity. The boy's attention was drawn to a strange sound that came from someone nearby. Moving closer to the door, Leon and Karen heard scraps of conversation. But when Leon opened that door, all he found was an empty room from which such sounds could not have come. While the guy looked around, Karen followed him in and locked the door. This alarmed Leon, for he didn't understand why they would close up if all they wanted to do was look. The girl bit her lip and looked straight into the guy's eyes with a strange expression. Before Leon could do anything, Karen had already flopped him on the bed and was on top of him, pinning his arms down. The boy seemed to be speechless. He couldn't believe that it was all happening to him. Karen was looking at him in a way that seemed to make all his fantasies come true. 
Her saucy smile and seductive form were right in front of him. In the house where the guild members and adventurers were lodged, lights were burning in almost every window, but that didn't stop a man dressed in a black cloak from climbing up and sitting near a dark window. When this strange man looked through the window, he saw the moving silhouettes of some people. In the darkness, you could make out Karen and Leon, who were so given to the kiss that they didn't notice anything around them. The girl was on top and gave Leon no chance to escape her touch. When the man outside the window realized what was going on, he stared in surprise at the couple. After a couple seconds, he flew away from that window and went on his way, letting the guys get on with more interesting things to do than him. Leon was simply overwhelmed by what was happening. He felt like he was having a wonderful dream that he didn't want to wake up from. Karen was no less fascinated by these events. She had long dreamed of being in Leon's arms. When the man who had been watching them left, Karen stopped using her aura and the illusion of the passionate couple disappeared. It was all a deceptive maneuver. The girl winked at Leon and said it looked pretty realistic. The guy was embarrassed and annoyed at the same time, so he said how would he know? Elseed thought irritably that he was in the same room with juvenile fools. Karen caught up and asked if it was time for them to go out on a reconnaissance mission. Leon was surprised she wanted to do it now. The girl explained that since the enemy was spying on them, they should return the favor. Especially now that the spies thought the guys were busy with each other, they wouldn't think Leon and Karen would go out together. Leon recalled that in the castle, eyes were everywhere. He asked if they could go out and remain undetected. Karen summoned her shadow, the mortician, and reminded the guy who she was and what she could do. Shadows began to hover around the girl's body, hiding her under their cover. She said she was ready to escort the honored hero. But against the huge moon, only the undertaker's cloak, black as night, was visible. But at Karen's slightest command, the shadows dispelled and revealed the hidden to the world. The Undertaker's cloak concealed a guy and a girl who were out on a night mission and wanted to hide from prying eyes. Karen said that the city at night was better than during the day. The streets were enchanting at this time of day, but she couldn't understand why it was so lifeless and quiet. Leon assumed that the point was that the rumors about vampires were true. The girl doubted it. Moving through the streets, the guys found the guards. The boy was surprised that they were much more numerous than the city's inhabitants. The presence of silver weapons on the sentries spoke volumes about their open display of readiness to fight the vampire. Leon didn't understand the Count's relationship with the vampires. After all, for enemies, confrontation was too clumsy, and for allies, these measures would be unnecessary, Elsid said cryptically. Leon himself had already answered his own question. The spirit had said that the world didn't have to be divided into enemies and allies. The boy hadn't considered the matter from that perspective, so he was surprised. Leon began to run through his head that they had come to the conclusion from the beginning that vampires were enemies for no good reason. Perhaps both the vampires and Count Reuben were their enemies, or maybe they'd be better off on one side. Everything seemed very ambiguous. Karen called out to Leon and said that she had looked around the neighborhood beforehand, and the slums started from here. She wondered what they should do. The boy wondered if vampires would really wander into places like this and seek shelter in them. Elsid said the vampires were an arrogant aristocracy. They looked down on humans. Because of their pride, they would hardly hide in such a shabby place. The spirit said that if these creatures had begun to hide in the slums, they must have reached an extreme line and were now truly dangerous. Leon made the decision to check out these surroundings. When he and Karen walked a few meters deep into the slum, they felt that the air had become very heavy. The girl also said that even using her gut, she didn't sense the presence of people anywhere nearby. That was alarming. Even if Reuben's feudal lord was extremely rich, at least a couple of poor people must have lived in the area. It seemed out of the ordinary to Leon, too. It was like that everywhere. If there were people who lived in mansions, there were also those who could not afford such luxury. However, no slum dwellers have yet been seen in this city. Only traces of their existence remained, but the inhabitants themselves could not be found. It was a most disturbing thought. It was eerie for the boys to stay in the slums for it was not clear what Count Reuben had done to the poor of the feud to make this part of the city so desolate. Karen was about to shroud them in shadows and hide them from view so that she could return to the Count's estate unnoticed. But it wasn't that simple. A punch was sent into the ground behind the low, catching Karen and Leon off guard. Leon gripped his sword tighter, realizing that they were under an attack that even Karen couldn't notice. Two men stepped out of the shadows. They looked silently at the armed boys. The eyes of one of the attackers were burning bright red. The guy noticed their enemies moving, changing their bodies like a misty haze. Were they really mages or high-class assassins? 
El Cid dispelled all of Leon's questions with the information that these guys were the truest of vampires. A long-haired brunette came forward and said that he was the last representative of the royal family of Wallachia. His name was Tepesh. Leon suddenly realized that with such an impressive arsenal of techniques, vampires could have attacked them before. They could have been exsanguinated and left in the slums, but she didn't. It was hard to tell if they were enemies or allies. However, Leon was glad at least that he didn't feel any hostility from these vampires. They gave up their sudden attack and engaged in dialogue. Glancing over to Karen, the boy realized that he should take the opportunity to talk to these creatures. Maybe they could shed some light on what was going on. With his decision finally made, Leon laid down his weapons and showed his willingness to talk to these mysterious vampires. The guy asked why they had appeared before them. It was obvious that they did not intend to fight, so it was interesting to hear the essence of their case. Tepesh smiled full mouth, showing off his fangs, and said he wasn't wrong about the kid's prudence. The vampire said he saw through the dampier that Leon had sacred power. He wondered if the boy was a man of the church. This question caused surprise in both the boy and the girl. They were clearly confused. They didn't understand how a vampire could appear before them if he assumed the boys had something to do with the church. It was absurd. Alcide was wary too. After all, if the vampire harbored a malicious intent, he would try to avoid meeting a follower by looking at the church's crest. Leon decided that he had already impersonated a church member once in Blaine, so he might as well do it again. He answered the vampire that he was a follower. Leon hadn't expected what happened next. The vampire jumped up to him and squeezed his hand in his own. Tepesh said happily that he was very happy to see the guy, as he had been waiting for someone like him for a long time. Leon didn't even know how to react to such a warm greeting from a vampire. He'd thought it was a cruel creature who saw him as a bag of blood. When Tepesh and Leon started talking, Roman standing next to them breathed a sigh of relief. Perhaps now something would change for the better. In the morning, when the boys returned from their reconnaissance mission, they recounted the details of their conversation with the vampire prince to their allies. Hamel and the rest of the mercenaries were stunned by what they heard from Leon and Karen. Gustav and Arnold, too, were having trouble digesting the news that had been brought. The mercenary commander was the first to break the tense silence and said that the matter had taken a very unexpected turn. Gustav couldn't believe that Count Reuben was using poor people as food to breed several dozen vampires. Karen waved her head coldly and said that was exactly what happened. She had heard it with her own ears. Leon realized that Karen's presence was very helpful. After all, the words of the adventurer Arang carried considerable weight in the eyes of the others. To the mercenaries, the case seemed very strange. The Count was a high-ranking wizard and suddenly, a vampire shows up and delivers such news. But they couldn't help but believe Karen. Gustav laid it all out once more. Count Reuben was up to something, sacrificing the poor of this town. The Stom Guild, along with mercenaries and adventurers, were getting in the way, so the Count decided to neutralize them under the pretext of hunting vampires, thus shutting their mouths. Karen confirmed the commander's words and added that even if the Count managed to hold them back, it would not last more than ten days. Everyone in the room realized that some unpleasant history was brewing. Gustav said it was quite possible that it was all a lie. It was dubious to believe bastards who drank people's blood. Suddenly, the commander felt a slight chill behind his back and sensed someone's presence. The creature whispered that they weren't too happy to drink other people's blood either. The commander jumped up and jumped on the table in surprise. He hadn't expected a real vampire to be in the room. Tepesh said hello and said that this body is intangible, so it can function in the light of the sun. He said he came in peace and they could relax. The vampire prince said that it was hard to believe what he had heard. But all the information about the Count's affairs was pure truth. Gustav said he wouldn't risk his comrades by taking the vampire's word for it. He needed proof. Tepesh said the man's demands were fair. The vampire showed the document that proved that the church's term of service to the Wallachian clan had ended. Hamel asked in confusion, wondering if vampires were in the service of the church. Tepesh said that 300 years ago, part of their clan had joined the demon king, thereby committing heinous treason against the goddess. As a result, most of the vampires were destroyed by the hero Rodrigo. Even those who remained loyal to the goddess were on the verge of execution. However, one priest interceded on their behalf. In exchange for 250 years of service to the church, some members of the clan were able to continue their lives. Leon realized that Tepesh's words were completely consistent with the information Elsid had given. The spirit said that there was no need for drama. 250 years wasn't that long for those with immortality. 
Vampires were only vulnerable to sunlight and damage beyond their regenerative abilities. Of course, they could still be killed by striking the heart or brain with silver, but in general, they could live for thousands of years. Tepesh continued his story, saying that after the end of their term of service, they began to look for a place to settle down. He hoped that Reuben would be such a city. Gustav suggested that the Count had stuck a knife in the vampires' backs. The prince said that was exactly what happened. After seeing the document, the mercenary commander had no doubts. It meant that they were in a quagmire that would be difficult to get out of. The man turned to Leon to ask when the Knights of the Order of the Holy Iron Castle, whom he had summoned using the medallion, would be here. Unfortunately, Leon didn't have that information, so he couldn't answer anything. The commander said that in that case, they would have to go up against the Count using their own forces. Karen said that was impossible. After all, even Tepes, who was not inferior to them in strength, did not fight the Count, but hid. This was because wizards were more powerful in their own territory. Besides, Reuben was prepared for battle. The girl said that it was more prudent to gradually weaken the enemy's forces and strive to gain superiority. Karen said their hopes were for a sacred power that could dispel the darkness. The guild leader said that they should then wait for the knights to arrive. Gustav added that in the meantime, they would try to reduce the Count's power. Hamel asked how they would carry out their plan if they were under 24-hour surveillance by the Count's men. Everyone in the room began to think intensely, trying to find the answer to this question. The guild leader raised his hand and said that they could try to pretend to fight. Everyone, including Tepesh, looked at Arnold in surprise. It was unclear how exactly he wanted to create the illusion of a vampire hunt. The silence of the night city was broken by a loud explosion in the middle of a residential area. The wounded guards were trying to figure out what was going on and who had initiated the sudden attack. Leon appeared on the horizon with sword in hand. His gaze was menacing, his cloak billowing in the wind. One of the guards, bleeding, asked Leon who he was. The guy introduced himself and said that he was accompanying the Stom Guild. Right now, he was here to fulfill the Count's request for vampire destruction. Just then, Tepesh appeared against the full moon. The frightened sentries looked only at him, forgetting Leon. Seeing the blood-red eyes and fangs on display, the guards panicked and began shouting that there was a vampire in front of them. Leon proudly stepped forward and said that they could trust him from now on. He would deal with this creature of the night. Tepesh laughed ominously and summoned his power. A bloody haze began to appear around the vampire, making his image even creepier. That was how the guild leader envisioned their pretend battle with the vampires. Gustav said he hadn't thought of that method. Hamel also liked the plan. He said that the Count had never imagined such a thing. No one would know they were in league with the vampires. Karen said that if they pretend to fight, they can choose the place and time to fight at their discretion. In other words, they will have the perfect opportunity to cause a disturbance anywhere inside Count Rubin's fortress. Gustav shouted that it was settled. They had to give Count Rubin a good thrashing. After a while, the mercenary commander had already thrown himself into a pretend fight with the vampire. He was putting in so much effort to make the fight look believable. It was then, in the darkness of the night, that the man saw the seal of the mage who had created the protection spell around the manor. It proved that the Count was the mage who had created it. There were buildings in the territory that the locals knew nothing about, and only the Count could enter. These towers turned the whole territory into a huge magic circle. Karen explained that wizards place such reinforcing structures in their territory to increase the effectiveness of their own magic. Gustav suggested that they should destroy them all. Leon said that it was likely that half of them were empties, so they wouldn't be perceived as part of the magic circle. Hamel summarized that they should select the real towers from this pile of towers and destroy them. Leon concluded that if they started destroying only the real towers, the Count would immediately suspect something wrong. They would have to act as if the structures had been hit accidentally. After a while, the guy stood outside and watched one of the manor's buildings explode. Leon told Elcide that Commander Gustav and Roman seemed to be doing a good job. He advised him not to be in too much of a hurry, because then the Count might figure out their plan. The spirit advised, pretend they were fighting and stealthily pick only one tower and destroy it. Leon began a feigned battle with Tepesh. The vampire began to attack with red spheres which emanated powerful energy. Seeing the vampire's power, Elcidas decided to remind Leon that he wasn't allowed to use his aura. The boy wondered in horror why the spirit had only told him this now. He hadn't counted on having to restrain his aura, but it was too late. Tepesh directed a stream of his power at him that resembled blood. Leon had to get out of it somehow. 
When the vampire's powers started circling very close to the guy's body, he exhaled and calmed down. He reminded himself that the fight was pretend. Only Leon regained his breath as suddenly, Tapisha's power struck behind him without hitting a hair on his body. Looking at the power the vampire wielded, Leon wondered if he really couldn't use his aura against such a strong opponent. When his mentor nodded, the boy boiled over. Even if it was fake, they were still fighting, and the destructive power of Tepes's blow was real. Else it explained that his aura was the exact opposite of a vampire's. Even a light touch would do great damage to Tepes. Leon said he had been given too difficult a task, to produce an attack of such destructive power to blow up nearby buildings, without aura weapons. While the guy was indignantly talking to his spirit, there were loud explosions and sounds of destruction within the manor. It was the work of the vampire prince. He channeled his energy into the buildings and destroyed them, the places where his power hit exploded, sending clouds of dust and rocks into the air. Leon could barely maneuver between the blasts. Having finished his attack on the buildings of Count Rubin's estate, Tepesh stood and watched the results of his work. But then he saw Leon coming toward him, sword in hand. The boy swung his weapon, but the vampire flew up and out of sight. Tepesh decided to continue this spectacle, so he went back and took aim next to Leon to make the attack as realistic as possible. The flow of power came so close to the boy that he had to bounce and use his sword to fend off the vampire's attack. As a result of this pretend fight, two towers from Reuben's magic circle were destroyed. The plan to weaken the mage was successfully initiated. Smiling, Elseed said that their fight scene looked like a pretty good workout. When morning came, an exhausted Leon sat in the Count's dilapidated building. He suddenly realized that six days had already passed in the endless battles. Despite his ward's fatigue, Elsid noted that fortunately the process of executing their plan was going very smoothly. Andre Rubin looked out of the window of his manor at the burning magic towers. At least ten structures had been destroyed, so the wall's defenses were now severely weakened. He clenched his fists with anger, for this destruction was affecting his strength and he could feel his power weakening. He raised his hand and began nervously rubbing the magic rings. He urgently needed to figure out how to regain his strength. Suddenly, the rings glowed and the mage felt energy begin to flow through his veins, restoring what had been lost. Walking through the corridors of the manor, Gustav met Leon. He said that everything seemed to be going according to plan so far. The boy told him that he thought it was strange that the Count wasn't doing anything. The commander said that if he still hasn't revealed his true identity, he still needs time. But the longer they wait, the more dangerous the situation becomes. Gustav asked if there was still no word from the Knights of the Holy Iron Castle. Leon only waved his hands. He himself wished they had arrived sooner. Suddenly Karen appeared from the shadows. Her eyes lit up with excitement, and she said that the Knight of the Holy Iron Castle was here. The girl led Leon to the restaurant, where it was necessary to make a preliminary reservation. The guy did not doubt the genius of his ally. As they approached the building, he felt Karen close to him. Her breasts literally pressed against his arm. He asked if it was necessary to go that far. The girl said she had informed the maid that they would have dinner in town, so they had to act like a couple. A waiter approached the couple and asked in whose name the reservation was made. To Leon's surprise, Karen said Noel's name. The girl had just read the guy's name backwards. The waiter ushered them inside without any problems and offered them a menu. The boys walked to a room on the fourth floor and saw a man and a girl already waiting for them. The dark-haired boy was burning through the room with a frown. It was obvious that he was taking the matter seriously. The girl looked very young but gave the impression of a talented fighter. Leon realized that this couple had demonstrated their dominance without even drawing their weapons. That was to be expected from the largest armed organization on the continent. Elsid commented that thanks to his wanderings with Karen, the boy's eyes had gotten better at spotting details. Even though the girl was inferior to Jazar, she was definitely strong. Leon broke the silence and greeted his new allies. He introduced himself and said that he was the one who had requested their support. The dark-haired boy said his name was Damien. It turned out that Bishop Jazar had told him a lot about Leon. Demian introduced his companion, saying her name was Angelica. She couldn't speak, so he urged the guys to be understanding. Trying to speak as quietly as possible, Leon asked how much they knew about the current situation. Demian said that they knew only generalities. The knight said he was aware that Leon and Prince Tepesh had committed sabotage disguised as a battle. Leon inquired how the boy knew Tepesh. Demian replied that the vampire was from the Wallachian clan, known for volunteering for the church. He called the prince's clan unlucky. After all, after 250 years of laboring in sweat, 
they were in this situation. Damien asked Leon to tell him the story first. It was already deep night outside the window when Leon finally finished his story about what was going on at Reuben Manor. Damien clenched his fists in anger. He hated the thought of the Count imprisoning the vampire clan in a dungeon and raising them like cattle. He realized what the Count was up to. After all, there was only one type of magic that used life force in this way. It was black magic, looking at the expression on the knight's face. Leon realized that the situation was more serious than they had anticipated. Elsid said that Damien had correlated all the facts properly. Vampires are a race with no distinction between body and soul. The Count is trying to use them to store energy. Looks like he's using black magic desiccation. It's a method that works best on spiritual bodies. Reuben uses the poor as fodder to squeeze all the juices out of the hardened vampires again and use them for his own devious purposes. Leon couldn't believe it was even possible. Demian explained that it couldn't happen in a normal situation. He said that if drinking large amounts of blood made vampires infinitely powerful, they would have conquered the world by now. Consuming large amounts of blood is one of the taboos that can cause vampires to self-destruct. But the Count doesn't care what state the vampire is in. His goal is to absorb the power. After sucking out all the power, he doesn't care if the vampire dies or not. After these words, Angelica raised her hand and showed the number three with her fingers. Leon and Karen looked at each other, perplexed. They didn't understand what the girl was trying to tell them. Damien explained that this situation is a level three threat. Therefore, they asked for Karen and Leon's full participation in the case. Leon suddenly realized that this situation was equal to the problem with the city absorber in Blaine in terms of the third level of disaster. The second level referred to national level cataclysms and the first to world threatening situations. The first level was observed only once when there was an invasion of the Demon King. Demian said that if the situation reached level two, they would have to gather half of the Knights of the Order or send a request to each country. It was clear to Leon that if something like this happened, the world would be in chaos. The Knight of the Order said that since it was so, they would interrogate Count Reuben tonight. If he refused to be interrogated, he would be tried in the name of the church. One of the Count's magical towers stood right on top of the roof of his prison camp. At first glance, it was an ordinary prison, but in fact, this place was where Angelica's fellow vampires were secretly imprisoned. Prince Tepes and Roman appeared out of the darkness. They greeted the girl and said they had been told about her. Roman explained that it was his and Tepesh's role to help her escape the prisoners to further join Leon's squad. Tepesh said the prison is a facility he has long targeted, but the Count has enclosed the prison with a barrier that replicates the light of the sun. Roman pondered that if the base of the solid wall barrier could be destroyed, then they could move on. While the men ranted, the girl jumped forward right into a barrier that could have sizzled her. Tepes watched in horror as Miss Angelica sentenced herself to a painful death. Angelica stopped right in front of the barrier and raised up her hand, which was like a spiked glove. The holy fist began to fill with power. The girl hit the wall, sending a huge amount of holy power into it. The barrier could not withstand the pressure and began to collapse right before her eyes. Prince Tepes and Roman could not hide their shock. They couldn't believe that Angelica had managed to overcome this insurmountable obstacle. The power of the impact and the force of the ensuing destruction was so strong that an earthquake shook the surrounding area of the city. Leon looked tensely over to El Cid and wondered aloud if the ground was really shaking now. Damien explained that it was Angelica. She was twice his strength, and many of the older knights were inferior in strength to this girl. Knight noted that Angelica alone would be sufficient to settle the prison issue, but the problem related to the punishment of Count Reuben. They will have to solve together because the magician is very strong. Gustav said that five of them were rank B, one was rank A, and so was a St. Iron Castle knight with them. Were these powers not enough? Demian replied that at best they would fight on equal footing, but if any of their squad went out of action, he couldn't guarantee victory. The squad moved toward Reuben's dwelling. They were blocked by guards who began to shout that the Count was not to be visited at this hour. Demian stepped forward. He said he was ranked 38th in the Order of the Church. The knight stated that he had come to this area to ask questions regarding the sin of heresy. The guards were stunned at the news that a knight of the Holy Iron Castle was standing beside them. A butler emerged from the shadows and ordered the guards to immediately put away their spears. The elderly man apologized for the indelicacy and said my lord had asked him to escort the guests to his place. Alcide found such confidence strange. The count had ordered a churchman who had accused him of heresy to be taken to him. That was foolish. 
The mercenaries noticed that the atmosphere in the mansion was radically different from what it was during the day. Everything around them was shivering. Karen and Leon had similar thoughts. They wondered if this unhindered invitation to Reuben was a trap. The oppressive silence was broken by Gustav. He said that once he had entered the manor, no one could leave without completing his mission. The Count met the troop in a huge room with panoramic windows that overlooked the city. The room was illuminated by the light of the full moon, which loomed darkly above them. The Count apologized for the inappropriate welcome, but since Damien was going to ask questions about the sin of heresy, he probably wasn't going to have tea with him. Damien looked at the strange liquid in Reuben's glass. The knight said that the Count should not quibble, for no one would joke with him. He added that the Count is accused of detaining the Wallachian clan at his place, as well as abusing his power by using the blood of innocent residents of the feud. Andre Rubin didn't even try to justify himself. Sipping from his glass, he said that he saw no point in this cheap comedy. They wouldn't believe him anyway. The Count looked at Leon appraisingly, as if guessing who had organized this trial. His gaze promised a brutal reprisal. But Leon was not deterred by the threatening looks. As a future hero, he should be used to having enemies breathing down his back. Reuben grinned, saying he'd been played pretty well. There were few brave men who could sneak up on the vampires and break his barrier. The Count laughed madly and muttered that he was making a promise to everyone in this room that each of them would die in terrible agony. Upon hearing the Count speak, Gustav laughed haughtily, saying that Reuben had made a very inept joke. The Count stared at the commander, who said that his words did not deny, but only proved his involvement in heresy. The knight had every reason to judge him. Looking at how skillfully Gustav led the verbal confrontation, Leon decided that it was almost impossible to win a verbal skirmish with the mercenaries. Reuben asked if the commander wanted to die on the spot. Gustav laughed, recalling that the count had threatened an agonizing demise before. Andre Reuben was not used to being argued with, so he didn't know how to behave when he was so easily killed in a verbal battle. The count began to pull out the crystal hanging around his neck, saying that because of the commander's rotten language, they had lost any chance of survival. The mage activated the power of the crystal and it began to fill with powerful energy. The man's eyes lit up red and became vampire-like. Reuben began indiscriminately shooting lightning-like discharges at his enemies. He could hear everyone yelling to scatter to the perimeter. Leon decided that the best defense was offense, so he drew his sword and waited until the enemy was in a comfortable position to attack. Reuben no longer resembled himself. In addition to having the ability to fly, the man looked mad with power. The boys guessed that this incredible magical power was fueled by the seals created by the Count earlier. After assessing the situation, Karen said that at this rate, this old man ranked at least seventh. She didn't expect him to be so powerful. Damien guessed that Reuben had destroyed the crystal and thus activated the magic of the barrier surrounding the building. The Count gloated, saying that the troop came against him, knowing nothing of the power he wielded. Their ignorance would be the cause of their deaths. Magic began to swirl in Reuben's hand until it formed a bloody sphere. He took aim and fired. He chose Gustav as his first target. It was because the commander dared to get into a verbal altercation with him. The magical power swept over the man and hid him from sight. There was nothing the boys could do to help the commander. Absolutely everyone who saw Andre Rubin's power was simply shocked. They didn't expect him to be so strong and ruthless. Gustav flew back against the wall, which cracked from the force of the blow. When the Count stopped his attack, everyone stared at the bloody man screaming in pain. All Demian could ask was how Reuben could use magic without casting spells. The knight allowed that the mage was engaged in sacrifice. The monster wasn't satisfied with the blood of the poor. He used their souls as well. Andre Rubin saw nothing wrong with that. In his eyes, people were just expendable material that he used to enhance his magic. At this time, Leon was able to get close to Gustav. The man was bleeding and gasping for air. The boy had no words to describe his hatred for this mage. He decided that he would do anything to avenge his friend's suffering. Reuben came closer and closer to the group, flashing his magic rings. He said he'd wanted to bury them all from the beginning. He said that all present would now behold the true power woven from the energy pumped out and sacrifices made. Leon gritted his teeth as he listened to the speech about making advances that would take decades with a few lives. Demian was already coming up with a plan of punishment when he heard that letting all sorts of rabble go to waste could lead to eternal life. Following protocol for action, the knight asked if Count Reuben wanted to confess right now. Reuben laughed, asking if they really thought he would fall for idiotic sermons and bow his head to them. 
Leon decided that the likes of this count didn't need redemption, so he stepped forward and decided to do justice on his own. Seeing the gleam of the holy weapon, Count Reuben recoiled as if he had been struck in the face. Damien stared, then at the boy, then at the sword, and realized that the stifling air hanging in the room had evaporated in an instant. Was this what the bishop was talking about? The knight realized that they could begin what they had come for. He began to say sacred prayers, invoking the light of the goddess. A warm glow appeared in his hands. Suddenly, the room was filled with a sacred light that was capable of exterminating any demonic power. A ball of light broke through the seal that supported the manor's protective barrier. It was the light that the goddess had sent. The balloon exploded right above the roof of the mansion and illuminated the entire courtyard of the estate. Count Reuben felt his strength weakening. He realized that the thing that kept him strong had been destroyed. He could literally physically feel that the source of his power was diminishing, preventing him from drawing power. The irritated mage urged not to stand in his way, for already the power he had absorbed was enough to exterminate the entire squad like insects. The mercenaries surged forward, displaying a huge shield. They sought to save their comrades from the devastating torrent of power. A huge stream of fire engulfed Hansen and Leonik, hiding from sight in the scorching space. When the attack broke off, Leon jumped forward to see what condition his friends were in. When the boy came closer to them, he saw that it was as if the life had been burned out of the men. They stood there with their mouths open, unable to draw in air. Smiling, Reuben said they wouldn't have escaped his attack by hiding behind a shield like rats. Before the Count could finish his arrogant speech, an arrow flew straight into his eye. The man didn't even have time to squeak in surprise. This arrow belonged to Hamel, who was at his friend's side and ready to fight for them to the last. Looking at the way the mercenaries were willing to fight for each other no matter what, Leon could only ask if they were all okay. The wounded but indestructible men smiled and said they felt fine. Leon realized they weren't, but was inclined to believe his friends. Due to the failed attack on the two mercenaries, one of the Count's rings, the one with the red gemstone, began to spark and smoke. It was destroyed. Reuben was furious. He had wasted one of his power rings because of some common mercenary. Hamel was surprised that the Count was still alive, because his mithril arrow had hit him right in the eye. It was impossible to dodge the chasing type's arrow. Damien realized what the rings were on the Count's hand. They were artifacts that eliminated any damage, but only once. The arrow had caused one of the rings to shatter. It was obvious that Count Reuben was really pissed off. The energy around him thickened, and the air crackled with tension. Reuben began to conjure, and soon the space around him consisted of nothing but magical seals. He shouted that no one would survive today. These seals seemed to be something akin to portals, from which some ghastly black shadows with many burning eyes began to appear. Reuben said that even in death, his enemies would not find peace. They would become his slaves. Leon and Damien realized that they were dealing with something that looked like demonic creatures. Andre Reuben summoned these soul-eating monsters and controlled them with black magic. When Demian finally realized what kind of monsters were in front of them, he shouted that only rank five mages could do that. The Count summoned the enslaved undead themselves. Hamel tried to attack the approaching monsters with his mithril arrows, but his weapon was powerless. Leonix similarly tried to attack, but when he chopped down this shadow monster, it simply regenerated and moved on. Weapons were powerless against the undead. One of the monsters managed to touch Leon's cloak, the fabric began to smoke and smolder under the undead's hand. Leon bounced back in time, but there was a smoking hole in his cloak as a reminder of what would happen to his bare skin if you let that monster close. The squad was surrounded. The enslaved undead, controlled by the Count, were coming at them from all sides. At this moment, instead of practical advice, Elsid chose to say that the spiritual body was difficult to destroy with aura weapons. Leon asked if he could repeat the trick he used in the phantom armor fight. Elseed said that in the current situation he should use his trump card, the Holy Sword, with caution, since it was unknown what other artifacts the Count had stashed away. It was necessary to act wisely and not reveal all his cards. Leon's attention was attracted by some movement. He could see from the corner of his eye that someone was about to attack the shadow monsters. He felt an aura weapon that cut the undead to pieces. It squealed and squirmed. The boy noticed a very familiar dagger. It was the work of his strongest ally, Karen. The girl fluttered around the huge hall and slashed her opponents. The enslaved undead were in a terrible state. Some of them were all chopped up, limbs hanging from their veins. A second ago, there wasn't a living spot on them, but now everything had already fused together and regeneration had restored the monster's body. 
Karen squatted and talked about how she knew her plan wouldn't work. She so didn't want to fight such ugly creatures. Karen decided it was time to finally show off her skills, since the hero was in danger. The girl summoned her shadow aura and long arms began to reach out from the ground, ready to grab the enslaved undead. Karen's shadows began to braid the ghostly bodies of the monsters and hold them as if in a vice. The mercenaries murmured approvingly when they saw that their enemies were completely immobilized. El Cid also approved of the girl's approach. He liked that she had decided to use the shadow technique that bound the undead's spiritual bodies. Demian stepped forward and said it was his turn to act. The knight began to recite the ancient sacred prayers. Then, out of nowhere, a holy glow appeared and descended directly on the mercenaries standing in the center of the hall. Each of the men's weapons now carried a glow of that light. Demian explained that temporarily, all of their weapons had been given the attribute of sanctity. Leon watched as his holy sword glowed with additional holy power. The boy was curious to see if any of the weapon's properties had changed. Elsid smiled and said it was for the best, as it would be much easier to hide the fact of the sword he wielded from others. Weapons that carried sacred power were indeed more effective against hordes of shadowy undead. Gustavus was the first to try his sword blessed by the goddess and told the mercenaries to stop standing still and break into battle. Leon was very happy to see the commander in such good spirits. It meant that the wound was not fatal. The mercenaries began to tease Gustav, saying they thought he was dead. The commander praised his body every day and eventually quit after one hit. The man only grinned at his comrades teasing. He was glad they were all alive for now. The commander suggested first tying up those who could not be attacked, then distracting the count and immediately attacking with the opposite attribute. Gustav shouted that it was time to show everyone what the Steel Claw's mercenaries were worth. The real carnage began. Everyone present used their skills to the best of their ability, and the weapons blessed by the sacred light helped neutralize the opponents. While Count Reuben was trying to control the neutralized undead bodies, he didn't notice Karen sneaking up behind him. The girl tried to strike the mage with her dagger, but the man thrust his arm forward and Karen's weapon hit the protective seal. Karen decided that if she couldn't successfully attack, she could distract Reuben, which would play into her squad's hands. This strategy infuriated the mage. Because of this girl, he couldn't focus on the battle and successfully control the otherworldly monsters. An arrow flew at the count again from which he barely had time to defend himself. He shouted that such a puny attack could not crush him. As Reuben looked around, he realized that all the undead had been destroyed, and now the squad members were heading towards him. The Earl's eyes were bloodshot with hatred. The man realized that these lowly creatures had forced him to discard the last card. Everyone was cautiously waiting to see what the Count would do, but he snapped his fingers defiantly. When the squad members already thought that nothing would happen, suddenly streams of blood summoned by Reuben rushed at them. There was such an enormous amount of blood that it poured from every corner of the mansion. In the shadows, the building looked like a cartoonish, horrifying fountain. Leon tensely thought that it wouldn't end with just a torrent of blood and something worse would happen. But nothing had happened yet, and that made it tense. As if reading the lad's thoughts, the Count said to wait a little while and new guests would show up here. A few seconds later, heavy footsteps and the clinking of armor were heard. Reuben announced that his faithful servants had arrived just in time. Leon realized with horror that he had seen some of the people in this creepy army before, but they had had a completely different appearance then. Among the so-called servants, the boy recognized the senior knight Brand, who had escorted them to Count Reuben on the first day. This magician did not spare even his own guards. Leon realized that this man was so imbued with black magic that there was no forgiveness for him. This world would be a better and safer place without him. Something terrible happened to these guards. When the magician summoned the streams of blood, they flowed through the men and turned them into hideous creatures. The eldest knight, Brand, was spared this fate. Being of sound mind, he and the other guards ran up to see what had happened to the injured. At first the men, startled by Reuben's magic, crawled on their knees and made strange, unintelligible sounds like animal growls. As Brand stepped even closer, his subordinates rose to their feet and he saw their contorted faces. They were grinning and snarling like wild beasts. The eldest knight couldn't understand what was going on. He'd heard all those fables about vampires and monsters, but he'd never thought they were true. When the man wanted to go for reinforcements, the magic-stricken guards began to spew forth streams of power just like the ones that had changed them. This magic was aimed directly at Brand, and he had no chance of avoiding the same fate as his subordinates. Damien explained to Leon that these people had been changed by black magic, which temporarily turns a living person into a monster. It was called insanity. 
Such monsters possessed tremendous power that would unleash all the hidden might. The Count went so far as to spare even the people who were protecting him. Damien had already justifiably accused Count Reuben of using forbidden sorcery right in front of a representative of the Holy Church. Reuben said only that he did not understand why the Church at its discretion somewhere binds and somewhere frees from the ways of wizards. The knight said with menace in his voice that it was a unanimous decision of the entire continent to make sorcery forbidden. And so there was every reason for it. Reuben shouted in anger that mages never gave their consent to this kind of nonsense, which meant that the decision was not legitimate. The magician said that the church simply had a fear of being ruled by them with their power and potential in black magic. Reuben said they would all die right now, and that was the signal for his enchanted guards to immediately start attacking. Gustav stopped the first wave of the attack by swinging his heavy sword that was backed by sacred power. It was hard to tell that he had been unconscious recently. The commander could barely contain the onslaught of these creatures. They were terribly strong, so the man wondered what exactly they were dealing with. Demian shouted that they should be careful. After all, those who are seized by madness feel no pain at all and show strength beyond their natural limits. These guards were in a state of life force release. If it wasn't a mortal wound, they couldn't be killed and the enemy's aura would only increase. Gustav realized that there was only one solution to this problem. Fight to the death. The rest of the mercenaries also began to beat back the attacks of the monsters attacking them. Each of them realized that this could be the last battle. Hansen was no exception, but suddenly his legs gave out and he lost his balance right in the middle of the battle. One of the distraught guards took advantage of this moment and attacked the mercenary. The guard's spear struck Hansen squarely in the shoulder. The blow was so strong that the weapon went through and out of his back. Seeing his friend struck by his opponent's weapon, Leonic was distracted from his own battle and paid for it. Controlled by black magic, the Guardian struck his fist with such force that Leonic flew back a few meters and drenched the floor with his blood. Leon realized that it was time to start getting more serious and employ maneuvers that would help deal with these dark forces. He started looking around to see how hurt his comrades were. The boy noticed that the knight was using magic power and fighting off the enemies. Karen has taken on the count, so she is fighting at the limit of her strength. Even if he tried to come to her aid, he wouldn't succeed. He was stuck fighting the older knight Brand. They crossed swords and the guy couldn't even move, let alone move aside. But then Leon heard El Cid's voice saying that he needed to calm down now. It was strange advice in this situation. The mentor recommended looking closely at the movements of his enemies. He emphasized that even if the fighters lost their ability to think straight, their swordsmanship and large amount of experience would not go anywhere. The spirit suggested that it might be more advantageous to deal with both opponents at the same time. Leon thought his teacher had lost his mind. But El Cid asked the lad to remember the fight in the forest where they had fought goblins and other creatures. If the opponent has lost his mind and is using honed skills acting out of habit, it will be easy to find a gap in the defense with the help of providence and aura techniques. If you're fighting one-on-one, -on -one, it will be dangerous to use this technique. But if you are dealing with two at once, you can take advantage of their stun and make a successful attack. When Leon finally realized what else it meant, he gave his mentor a sly smile. Leon quickly bounced off his current opponent and ran in the opposite direction to execute the plan Elsid had suggested. He ran up to where Damien was standing and knocked two guards down at once. Damien and Hansen stared at the guy in surprise. No wonder they hadn't realized what he was up to. Leon shouted to the guards lying on the floor to get up and start fighting him. As if following his orders, the bewitched guards rushed to attack. It was exactly what the boy wanted. Leon used the technique El Cid had mentioned as soon as his enemies got close enough to allow him to make a strike at the right angle. When the boy looked around to see the result of the executed plan, he saw that the guards had been defeated. That meant that El Cid's advice had been correct. No sooner had he rejoiced than he heard Demian shout to warn him that there was a new danger behind him. Turning around, Leon saw the senior knight Brand whose battle he had left to attack two guards at once. The knight grabbed the boy by his cloak and lifted him up so that Leon's feet didn't reach the floor. With his other hand, he clutched the boy's wrist tightly so that he wouldn't strike with his sword. Bran's eyes glowed eerily and the space beside him was also filled with a reddish light. Leon realized that the same thing that had happened to the elder knight himself could happen to him now. The room filled with blood-red fire that was aimed directly at Leon. The guy disappeared from sight and Damien's startled scream echoed in the room. When Count Reuben saw that the main initiator of this campaign was engulfed in magical flames, he grinned happily, thinking that he had won. At first, Leon couldn't even move. The dark power held him back, but then he saw the glow of the holy sword and realized he had to act. 
Demian's holy power, which he put into the weapon, neutralized the black magic. Without it, the boy would have burned to death by now. Brand was less fortunate than the boy. Count Reuben used him to kill Leon, but because of the attack, the knight himself had to die. Reuben didn't have enough anger. He was pissed off at this guy who was immune to self-destruct attacks, and this adventurous girl who made him use the artifact. As Leon stepped back from the attack, his gaze searched for Karen. In the dim light of the moon, he saw that the Count was holding the girl immobilized. Karen was tied up in some strange way. She was covered in blood and she wasn't moving at all. The boy rushed to attack the Count without a second thought. He didn't want to lose Karen, who was not only an ally, but also a friend. The Count raised his hand and ordered him to stand. It was obvious that he was gathering his energy to use his magic power. Suddenly, the bonds around Karen began to tighten and she moaned softly. It was like she was being held by a living organism. The Count said that in the current situation, he had a suggestion. If Leon said yes, he wouldn't lay a finger on Karen. Leon frowned at Reuben and said that he thought he had already forfeited the opportunity to make any suggestions. The Count laughed grimly and said he liked the fact that the lad had a great store of stubbornness. He looked Leon over from head to toe and said that for his young age, he was very experienced. He also had more dignity than the mercenaries. The Count suggests that the boy take his side and kill these mercenaries along with the church dog. Then he would guarantee that Karen would continue to live in peace. If he refused, he threatened to finish the girl off right away. Reuben said he expected an answer immediately. Looking at the boy, Elsid said he thought he'd say no right away. He urged Leon not to pretend as if he couldn't decide what to say. The spirit said that everything the boy was thinking was written all over his face. He won't be able to falsely accept the offer and then take out the count with Merrick. The mentor said that his mastery of the skill was not yet sufficiently honed, so his intentions would be revealed in preparation for activating the technique. Also, Elsie didn't think the Count would buy the lie easily. He was a high-ranking dark mage, which meant he would want to back up Leon's word with some sort of oath. Leon boiled up, asking what he should do then. After all, Karen was in danger and they didn't have time. So there was only one plan that came to mind. Seeing the guy talking to the air beside him, Reuben was surprised. He got the impression that this adventurer had a split personality. Elsid told the boy to calm down. Leon did not understand how he should do that, for they were in a desperate situation. The spirit grinned slyly and said that the boy had forgotten something. The words made the boy think. Before Leon realized what the spirit meant, the room shook, the ceiling vibrated, and small stones fell from it. There was an explosion. A blinding light filled the hall of the mansion. The building did not seem to be able to withstand the force. Through a huge hole in the ceiling, Damien saw a girl who was quickly approaching them. To Elcide's comments about her being very timely, Angelica landed right next to Leon. The boy was very happy to see the girl. Her arrival meant that he and Tepes had successfully completed the mission and managed to free the vampires from the dungeon. The girl crossed glances with Damien, and the latter said he was glad she was joining them. Angelica was immediately attacked by the enchanted guards. The girl stood and calmly assessed the situation she found herself in. She summoned her power and activated the sacred fist. When she felt this power, the enemies backed away and did not rush to attack her. Looking at the girl, Reuben realized that she had serious power and would be a problem for him. He wanted to know who she was. Angelica met the Count's gaze and ran her thumb across his throat, hinting that the man was finished. She concentrated her power in her fist and struck at the nearest enemies. A second and the enchanted knights were already lying motionless on the floor beside her. Watching the girl, Leon heard Elside say that he knew why Angelica had volunteered to act alone. Spirit said she was so strong, it would be hard for a partner to adjust to her rhythm of combat. He appreciated Angelica's idea of using a directed shockwave as an aura through his own body. The mentor had explained to Leon that if she had been even a millimeter wrong, the energy could have torn the girl's guts apart. She had a very strong mentality. To make the guy realize how dangerous the technique was, he compared it to Merrick, which concentrated in the body instead of the sword. The aura was like gunpowder, and if one relaxed even for a second, one would simply explode from the blast. Leon was amazed that Angelique was able to put this technique into practice without a shadow of a doubt. She was an unimaginably strong person. The guy realized that he was also very strong and he didn't want to be left behind. At this time, Count Reuben was once again furious. He was infuriated by Angelica's arrogant behavior, who did not seem to be afraid of him at all. The answer to the Count's angry shout was a new move. The girl banged her fists against each other, and the light shimmered around her. 
She snapped out of her seat and quickly ran to attack her irritated foe. A moment later, Angelica had already flown up to the Count and swung her fist at him, preparing to make an attack. Andre Rubin thrust his hand forward, summoning magic and activating a protective seal around himself. The Count had already started laughing gloatingly, saying that the girl would never be able to overpower his protective barrier. But then it started to make no sense. His sturdy defenses began to crack and crumble right before his eyes. Angelica summoned more power and finally managed to make Rubin's magic shield shatter into small pieces. The squad members watched admiringly as the girl successfully broke the Count's barrier. Angelica jumped away from the Count, who was beating hysterically and shouting angrily. The members of the squad came closer to Andrew Rubin and ordered him to surrender, for he was powerless against them. The magician didn't even have the angry comments he was so fond of letting loose. Demian announced that the knights who had been summoned using black magic had been destroyed and the barrier around the mansion had collapsed. Reuben said he wasn't going to raise the white flag. He reminded the audience that he had one more trump card, the valuable hostage Karen. While the man smiled victoriously, Karen twisted out of her shackles and asked in a sweet voice if he was talking about her. Reuben jumped at this unexpected turn of events. He hadn't expected to lose his last trump card. Flapping her eyelashes coquettishly, the girl told the Count it was time to be done with him. She surged upward and, using her aura weapon, thrust deadly daggers straight up and into the man's back, spurting fountains of blood. Andre Rubin screamed not so much in pain as in frustration. He didn't understand how Karen had managed to get out of the shackles, thus depriving him of his advantage. The Count clearly remembered seeing the girl hanging motionless and barely breathing. But when he turned his head, he saw that it was not Karen, but her shadowy self that was in the shackles and Karen herself successfully attacked and bounced away from Count Rubin's blazing red fire. Before she could catch her breath, Leon came running up to her. He was curious about what had happened to her. The girl said that she had been held hostage, but the Count was in no hurry to kill her and she took the opportunity to switch places with the shadow. Leon shouted that he didn't need to recount what he'd seen himself. He wondered if Karen had been hurt. Karen was surprised to see such concern for her life. She couldn't even answer right away that everything was fine. The girl was confused. She thought Leon was angry with her. Karen didn't recognize his concern for her. Leon was annoyed that Karen was in the crosshairs of death. He clenched his fists and told the girl to stay away from now on. At this time, Andre Rubin was still unable to admit defeat. He was crawling on the floor and his magical energy was spilling out of his wound. Leon slowly approached him. He drew his holy sword and pointed it at the Count, ordering him to stop struggling and surrender. Rubin laughed madly. The man summoned the rest of his strength and said he still had an ace up his sleeve. Leon began to suspect that there was another artifact left in the Count's ring that could be a problem. But when the Count raised his hand, hoping to get the ring's help, he saw that the phalanx on his ring finger was missing the phalanx on which the artifact was. He looked in horror at Karen, who was holding his ring and thanking him for the gift. She said she couldn't leave it to a man like the Earl. The defeated mage screamed desperately. It seemed that this prank of the girl had finally driven him insane. He shouted that his enemies would not get away with this. Suddenly, Prince Tepes and Roman appeared. The vampire said that it was time for Andre to surrender because it was time to pay for his sins. Andre Rubin instantly recognized the man standing before him, the prince of the Wallachian clan. The man used vampires from that clan for his black magic. Tepes's hands were already boiling with power. After what he had seen in the prison camp, he couldn't wait to kill the bastard. This picture didn't make Count Rubin shrink back in fear. He only laughed harder and tried to get to his feet. Leon could not believe his eyes. He thought the Count was living out his last moments, but he was almost on his feet. Rubin took out a huge crystal and squeezed it in his hands. Leon recognized the black crystal that the guild leader had given him. Rubin opened his mouth and began to slowly devour this artifact. Leon and Elsa had watched this picture in confusion and wondered what would happen next. The space around the Count began to blaze. The energy was so powerful that it was simply impossible to stand near him. Andre Rubin began to lose his resemblance to a human. His teeth became sharper, his ears stretched, his eyes burned, and the crystal became red in color and was inside the man's neck. The Count began to shout with an inhuman scream. It made the squad members' ears start to pop. Rubin slowly approached his enemies. It seemed that the damage Karen had done had been completely undone. Tepesh said with horror that the sound control technique was something only one of the three aristocratic lineages of Nosferatu could do. The prince felt the Count's power and recognized in it the might of Elizabeth's family. The magician was completely transformed. 
The transformed Reuben said that ever since he had begun his search for Nosferatu bloodlines, he had been turning the powers he had received into his own. Only Tepesh remained. The mercenaries didn't realize what was happening. Their bodies were trembling and they couldn't contain it. Leon realized that the presence of this monster he sensed with his aura was gradually growing and oppressive. Reuben said he had planned to finalize all the preparations, but the troop forced him to hurry. He declared that he would henceforth be king of the night sky. The Count flapped his wings and declared that this feud was officially his territory, where he would suck the life out of all living things. He planned to become Lord of the Vampires. The attention of those present was drawn to the huge moon, which was colored blood red. Tepesh explained that the blood moon creates barriers everywhere. Its bloody light reaches out and seizes under its influence. The prince also added that this power symbolized the Lord of Vampires, who rules over all the children of the night. It didn't take long for Angelica to enter the fray. She jumped straight towards the new lord. The girl struck her sacred fist directly at Count Reuben's head. The mercenaries cackled, thinking that the blow had crushed the enemy. After all, that fist had shattered the barrier. But there wasn't a scratch on Andre Rubin. He was unharmed. The man said that Angelica's blow was just another little thing. The Count grabbed the girl by the head and squeezed her tightly in his clawed hands. He let go of her, and Angelica fell to the floor like a rag doll and never moved again. Demian started to call out to the girl in a panic. He had never seen his partner in such a state before. Rubin's eyes burned even brighter, and he said it was time to deal with the rest of the enemies. Leon looked around and saw drops of blood starting to rise from the floor. They seemed to be attracted by an unknown magical force. When Tepesh realized what was happening, he shouted for his allies to dodge those drops and try to stay as far away from them as possible. Those drops gathered over the mansion like a bloody rain, but then they glowed and began to gather into huge beams of light. When the destructive beam was formed, it shot straight into the hall where the squad and Count Reuben were. Mercenaries, vampires, they all lay motionless. The beam had such destructive energy that only the smoke from the explosion was visible. When Karen recovered a little from the explosion, she began to cough. She tried to understand what had happened. All Karen could see was the blood that was everywhere. The girl was making her way through the ruins when suddenly she heard Leon's familiar voice calling out to her. The bloodied guy walked towards her through the devastation that reigned around him. He bent over the girl, saying that he was relieved to find that she was alive. Leon became violently ill and he settled to the floor. Karen grabbed him fearfully, saying that if he got hurt, she didn't know what to do next. Leon touched the girl's shoulder and said he had an important request. He wanted her to take Tepes and Roman and move them as far away from here as possible. Karen shouted irritably that she wasn't going to follow his rambling instructions. She wanted to know what he was going to do on his own. When she looked at Leon's bloodied face, she noticed such determination in his eyes that she felt uneasy. She realized that nothing she could say would convince the guy to abandon his plan. The girl sighed and decided to trust her hero. She told Leon that if he dared to die, she would find him in the other world and kill him. Those words brought a smile to the boy's face. He was glad to know that Karen cared whether he lived or died. At this time, the transformed Count Reuben looked at himself and marveled that the transformation into a vampire using the black crystal had succeeded. He looked at his hands, at the red veins and long nails, and realized the might of the life force that had been gathering for decades was inside him. The body Reuben now possessed was the second incarnation of the vampire king who had disappeared 300 years ago. The newly minted vampire heard footsteps. He was surprised that there were still people who could move after what he'd done. Limping, Leon approached him. Clutching his sword tightly in his hands, he challenged Count Reuben to a fight. The vampire smiled, saying there was nothing the boy could do to him. But Len's persistence was astounding. When the Count saw that behind the guy was Karen, who had summoned the remnants of her power, he realized what was going on. Karen had disappeared, and Reuben said that Leon was just distracting him so that at least the girl could avoid being killed. The Count thought the action pointless. After all, Reuben's feud was a land that was to him like his own internal organs. No one would be able to hide in his territory. Suddenly, Leon felt an intense pain inside him. The boy realized that he was completely wrong when he started coughing up blood. Watching this, Reuben laughed loudly. He wanted his enemy to suffer pain. He wanted him to feel despair, to shed tears. Leon raised his head irritably and said that the Count had become even more talkative since his conversion. The boy said that he listened to the chatter as long as he needed to stall for time. But he had run out of patience, for there was no end to the flow of words. These words pissed the Count off. 
Leon's insolent behavior made him clench his teeth in anger. The Count summoned his power, saying he would not allow anyone to test his patience. It was the dialogue that brought Demian to his senses. He felt the immense power that Reuben possessed and realized that the sphere he had created could not be allowed to fall. Leon listened to his own sensations and realized that he couldn't feel Karen's energy. It meant that they had managed to travel a long distance. It was a sign that it was time to spring into action. Leon summoned the power of his aura and activated the Holy Sword. Alcide was angry that Reuben had managed to use the trump card and turn into a vampire. The boy raised his sword and a holy glow filled the hall with pure energy. Leon shouted for Reuben to prepare for his demise. Andrew Reuben could not believe that he felt such a powerful holy force. He didn't even have time to turn away before that light began to burn out all the black magic in him, causing his body to smolder. Under the rays of light, the wounded mercenaries began to rise. They bewilderedly began to examine themselves and found that their wounds were healing. Damien similarly rose to his knees. He realized that this was a true blessing and a miracle of the goddess. The knight was amazed to see the glow coming from the sword in Leon's hands. Andrew Rubin could no longer marvel at the beautiful light, for it made his body nothing but charred flesh. The Count's body began to convulse and another dark entity emerged from it. Leon realized that the man before them was pure evil. Alcide agreed, saying that the Count deserved the nickname, for he had given up his human nature. The spirit explained that the radiance of the Holy Sword was three times deadlier to this kind of unclean power. Elsid said that for the Vampire Lord, it wasn't just an outburst of power, but experience gained over a long life. Leon noticed that Reuben had no more trump cards left. The spirit explained that because the Count had recently become a vampire, it was beyond his ability to control the power that had manifested in him. But suddenly, a dark vampire entity in the form of a skeleton appeared right beside Leon. The boy didn't even have time to look back to face his enemy before the skeleton sank its sharp teeth into his shoulder, splashing fountains of blood. The red moon illuminated the entire feud of Reuben, casting an eerie light on the streets. Bound hand and foot, Prince Tepes and Roman demanded that Karen untie them immediately, for they wanted to end Andrew's life with their own hands. The girl tossed her hair over her shoulder and answered in a calm voice, No, while her shadow essence held the vampires back, she said that once back, the vampires would only get in Leon's way. Karen was only willing to remove the restraints if they would sit still. The prince had no choice but to nod sullenly to the girl. The bindings around his arm loosened. Tepesh grumbled that their enemy was right in front of them and there was nothing they could do. In response, Roman only frowned harder. Suddenly, Tepes felt something strange. His vampire senses were alert. Roman asked his prince fearfully, was this really his power? The vampires noticed a door nearby and realized that the reason for the prince's reaction was behind it. Tepesh said he could hear someone behind that door calling for him. Roman guessed that if his power reacted that way, it meant only one thing. As the prince stepped closer, he confirmed the vampire's hunch. There was indeed a tribesman inside. Karen anxiously asked if a mob of bloodsuckers would pounce on them when they entered. The vampire replied that they'd have to go in to find out. They pushed back the heavy door and entered the dark space. The girl was already glad that the strange room was empty when suddenly Tepesh asked a question into the void, asking who had called him. The very moment Karen's eyes adjusted to the semi-darkness, she realized that the room wasn't completely empty. Not far from where they were standing, the girl noticed red glowing eyes. As she came closer, the grate and the creature behind it became visible. Karen couldn't tell if it was a vampire or a dampir, but one thing was clear. The creature was on the verge of death. When the prisoner saw that they were being approached closer, he began to loosen the bars of his prison. The creature made sounds like crying and stretched out its arms to touch those who came to it. Seeing the hand that was reaching for him so desperately, Tepesh snapped out of his seat and ran forward. He knelt down next to the camera and gently touched the prisoner's hand. The prince's eyes lit up and he felt a connection to this imprisoned creature. Suddenly he saw a memory. The Count was smiling and leading this vampire by the hand through a flowering garden. Then he found himself in a dark, cold place. It was raining heavily outside the window. Tepes felt an animal fear. The next vision showed Count Reuben standing over, then still human and holding a syringe filled with vampire blood. He injected blood into the restrained and deceived man. The veins on his arm began to redden and swell. Andre Rubin's creepy grin gave him a chill. The prisoner's hands began to change. The claws lengthened and the veins and veins began to pulsate and enlarge. At this time, Leon was trying not to die during the attack of the dark forces. 
The creature of black magic was gnawing harder and harder into the guy's shoulder. But the guy was filled with holy power, so the skeleton started screaming and spitting, trying to get away from him and not get burned. Clutching his bloody shoulder, Leon realized that the dark forces had such a reaction to his sun attribute. Without wasting a second, the guy brought his sword above his opponent's head and rushed to attack, taking advantage of the enemy's confusion. What was left of the vampire screamed and a bright light began to burst from his body. The enemy roared and the force of those vibrations threw Leon back a few meters. The boy screamed. He felt the air leaving his lungs and he had nothing to breathe. The skeleton didn't want to die. It seemed to have become even more furious and now it was acting like a hunted animal. Leon crouched down and tried to catch his breath and move away from the sonic assault. As blood flowed from his ears, he realized he couldn't hear anything. The guy thought that if he hadn't had time to envelop his head and neck with the aura, he might already be dead either from the bite or the sound waves. Alcides said the guy did a great job. He asked if everything was in order. Leon replied that he was fine. You couldn't say that about their enemy. He made hoarse noises and looked disgusting. The spirit said the monster had had a power surge and now had only the instincts and abilities of a vampire. Maybe he was even more dangerous. Seeing Leon smirking at the imminent slaughter of his enemy, El Cid said to the lad not to underestimate the enemy. He should be careful. The mentor told him that this vampire had the power of the three Nosferatu clans. He had the blood of the Wallachian clan and the sound of the Elizabeth clan. Also Reuben in the guise of a vampire also had the shadow of the Strigoth clan. During the battle with Tepesh, it is revealed that the power of the Wallachian clan has no effect on Leon. The power of the Elizabeth clan he was able to block with his aura. It remained to test the reaction to Clan Strigoth's shadow. Even though the Count had already become a floor cloth, Leon had also used up 80% of his aura. The fight couldn't be prolonged. Elsid said that during the last attack, the enemy realized that the next strike could be his last. Leon also realized that the vampire was unlikely to let him get any closer. However, the guy had no choice but to go all out to try and kill his opponent with a single blow. The spirit grinned. He agreed with Leon and was proud that his apprentice was capable of making bold decisions. The vampire brat attacked the guy with blood, but this power didn't work on him, so he approached the enemy without stopping. The monster decided to use one last trick, Strigoth's shadows. Huge dark tentacles began to creep slowly toward Leon. The shadows hurt Leon, and he realized that the enemy had managed to materialize a shadow, and it didn't react at all to the sun's aura. The guy realized that without the technique of providence and swift movement, his head would have already flown off his shoulders. He had to strengthen his body and move forward. Leon's eyes lit up with a holy light, and he realized that this attack was his last chance to defeat his enemy. He struck a powerful blow with his sword and felt the steel split the monster's flesh. The holy sword went straight for the vampire's ribs, causing him to scream in pain while his flesh burned with fire. Leon realized with horror that even after being wounded by the Holy Sword, this monster continued to live. Not only was he alive, but he also managed to use his power and utilize the blood of the Wallachia clan and the shadow of Strigoth. Leon threw himself at his enemy in desperation, hoping he could finally kill him. The boy stopped his gaze at the moon. There were shadows in the background, tentacles spreading out in different directions. The monster transformed once again. It looked like a bloody cocoon with a human body inside. Leon never thought that a battle with a mage could be so difficult and dangerous. People gathered in the streets of Reuben's feud. They looked at the red moon which was shining and told each other that they had heard an explosion from the castle. The sleepy townspeople didn't even notice that they were surrounded by bloodthirsty shadow monsters who wanted to feast on their flesh. The same shadow monsters were now filling Reuben's manor as well. One of them sank its teeth into Damien's shoulder and began sucking his blood. The monsters attacked the mercenaries as well. They sucked their blood, stole their shadows, and restricted their movements. Damien realized that the monster was sucking the blood from all the inhabitants of the feud in an attempt to get back into the vampire lord's body. This ability was sealed by a vampire progenitor who realized its danger. An incomplete vampire can exhibit the strongest backlash. Elsid tensely said that this technique was driven by survival instinct. If it spread on such a scale, the city's inhabitants would disappear without a trace. Leon realized that this power was similar to the city devourer. The shadow monsters began to approach him as well. The guy managed to bounce away from these creatures and avoid getting caught in their tenacious teeth. But their next attack, the guy couldn't fend off. The monsters clawed at him from all sides, trying to drink his blood. Elsid shouted desperately as if that could do anything to help Leon. 
At this time, Count Ruben's vampire body began to regenerate and take on its former appearance. Leon tried his best to prevent the vampire's body from recovering, but he couldn't move. The remaining aura protected his body, but he was bleeding heavily. From every corner of the streets of feud, Reuben came cries of pain and pleas for help. When the guy heard them, he realized that he had to deal with the monster. After all, the reason he decided to become a hero was to save people from evil. At that time, the cocoon in which Reuben's body was in was becoming more and more dense and began to shimmer. It was noticeable that he was gaining strength. Through him, Count Reuben in the guise of a vampire lord watched Leon's attempts to win. He realized that this guy was very tenacious. This meant that Reuben had to focus all of his energies specifically on Leon. He aimed more of his shadow monsters at him so that the guy would finally stop fumbling and give up. Leon remembered with a smile that Karen had said she would tell him off if he died. So he must win and return to the girl in one piece. The guy finally decided to use the technique called the Big Bear Sword. He directed all this aura energy straight into the center of the cocoon where Reuben was. The Count could only watch fearfully. Leon began chopping away at the bloody shell hoping that this time the vile evil would be done away with once and for all. The guy struck again, this time using the Merak technique. The cocoon could not withstand such a pressure and collapsed into two halves from which blood was gushing. Reuben's vampire body fell out, cut to the waist. It looked like the dark wizard was finally finished. Reuben was a vile dark mage now, but once the man had been a loving father to a beautiful little girl whom she adored. The little girl was eagerly waiting for her daddy to come back and play with her. The Count was very fond of his daughter, but one day when he returned home, he saw his baby girl Leah lying unconscious on the floor in a pool of her own blood. Andrew Rubin desperately wanted to make things right and couldn't let his child die. The man began to puzzle over how to cure the disease that took the life of his wife and now tried to take his daughter as well. He tried all existing methods. The Count was willing to do anything to save Leah. At that moment, he thought of using dark magic. He sent his guards to the slums and ordered the removal of absolutely all the inhabitants. People began to be actively taken away and sent to an unknown destination. Poor people were needed for Reuben's experiments. He tried different methods to find a cure that would help his daughter. One evening, the butler entered the Count's study and saw his smiling face. Reuben said he had found what he was looking for. The key to everything was the black crystal. He told the butler that with the crystal he would increase the power of the vampire clan and could gain the coveted power of a vampire lord. Andre Rubin had completely forgotten the real reason for his search. He only remembered his sick daughter when the butler reminded him of her. Rubin's body was melting like candle wax. Some parts were charred and muscles were visible in some areas. The Count was clearly not alive. He looked up and saw Tepesh in front of him holding a teddy bear. The prince said that he had been asked to give it to him and to say that his daughter was waiting for her father. Turns out the prisoner in that cage was Reuben's daughter, Leah. The little girl sat chained up and waited for her daddy to take her out of there. What was left of the Count remembered his original purpose, to save his daughter. The image of a blue-eyed little girl with a teddy bear in her hands flashed before his eyes. Tears came to the man's eyes. He could not believe that he had been so intoxicated with power that he had forgotten about his beloved child. The moon was shining over Reuben's feud. It was no longer blood red. The shadow monsters dissolved, leaving behind only red ash. The people of the feud looked at each other in bewilderment. The entities created with dark magic also disappeared in Andre Reuben's mansion. They left the mercenaries and the knight Demian alone. Count Reuben stretched out his charred stump of a hand, trying to reach for his daughter's teddy bear that Tepesh had brought. But he didn't have time to touch it, for his body began to turn to ash. Tepesh said that originally, vampires had no distinction between spirit and body. When you die, your soul doesn't separate. It disappears with your body forever. Looking at the pile of ashes that remained of Andre Rubin, the vampire said that such was the punishment for those who trespassed on the taboo. The mercenaries finally came to their senses, led by Commander Gustav, who stood and pondered whether it was all finally over. The mercenaries pounced on the commander, asking him to stop such speeches. They reminded him that the ogre who had been beheaded had risen to his feet immediately after such words. Gustav's subordinates began to say that if he continued like this, this monster would definitely rise from the dead again. The commander rolled his eyes and asked about what had happened to Leon. Hamel pointed his finger in the guy's direction and told the commander to check it out himself. Demian and Angelica were already standing around the boy. He was unconscious, and the Knights of the Order were trying to help him with the help of sacred power. Slowly, Leon came to his senses. 
the blessed light of the goddess was restoring his body and bringing him to his senses. When the guy felt better, he thanked the allies and said he was fine, and now it was time to take care of the other wounded. Damien and Angelica didn't move until they finished healing Leon. They said that even if they died, it didn't matter. The guy smiled at El Cid and said that it was useless to change these guys' minds. The spirit nodded, saying that this couple was willing to give their lives to save him. Damien said that Leon had been absolutely marvelous. The knight wondered why Jazar had asked for his full cooperation, but only now realized the reason. The boy realized that they had guessed he was a hero. Damien promised to keep his identity a secret, if that was his will. The knight promised that he and Angelica would keep this secret for the rest of their lives. The boys promised Leon that they would deal with the aftermath of this battle and minimize any friction with the kingdom. Karen appeared out of nowhere. She squinted at the guy and asked him if he wasn't half dead now. The girl started to get indignant, saying that she thought her threat would have some effect on him. But now she saw a guy barely alive in front of her. Karen said she was a fool to believe him. After all, her character almost killed himself. The girl would have continued to recite this angry tirade, but noticed that Leon had gotten worse. A second later, the guy fell right on top of her. All of Karen's anger and anger drained away. Now all she could do was hold her self-sacrificing hero in her arms. She cuddled him closer to her and hoped everything was okay and he wasn't seriously injured. The next day, a report of the incident in the Reuben feud was delivered to the royal palace. The Count's family was among those who held power in the kingdom. So when one of the pillars of power passed away, the palace was in disarray. However, when the testimony of the Wallachia clan and survivors who were innocently imprisoned was obtained, everything fell into place. All the evidence pointed to Count Reuben being a follower of Satan's teachings. When the trial took place, Demian said the Count was found guilty of heresy and summarily executed. He told the jury that they had been assisted by several mercenaries and adventurers, but their contributions were insignificant, so it was not worth calling them as witnesses. The nobles were very concerned about the incident, and had it not been for the intervention of the church, no one would have left the caravan alone. All of this information Karen told Leon as soon as he came to his senses in the wagon. The boy remembered that he had fallen asleep in Karen's arms after the battle was over and, it turned out, had spent four whole days passed out. Also, the girl said that the entire personnel of the Steel Claws mercenary squad had survived. Karen's wound is almost tight. No vital organs were injured. She had some bleeding, but she recovered quickly. After a bit of silence, the girl surprised the guy by saying that she wanted to apologize to him. Leon looked up at the girl in confusion and asked her what she wanted to apologize for. She said she was ticked off that the guy got mad at her for pretending to be captured by the Count. Karen realized that because she had acted on her own, she had caused the boy's anxiety. She promised that she would share her intentions from now on. In response to this speech, Leon only grinned, which caused a new wave of Karen's irritation. The guy explained that he wasn't angry at her at all, but at himself. It was because he couldn't understand the girl's strategy. He promised that from now on, he would understand her without words. Those words put Karen in a stupor. No one treated her the way Leon did, and she didn't know what to say. So the girl decided to just run away from her own emotions. She left the wagon, saying that she would go and get some fresh air. El Cid said that Leon fully lived up to the title of hero. Karen's strength was in her unique tactics and improvisation. If she revealed her cards to him, she wouldn't be as effective. The boy was in agreement with this. He said that if his ignorance limited the power of his allies, then he had no right to be called a hero. Mentor smirked and said that his disciple had climbed another step up. The next goal was the Titan Mountains. Leon nodded affirmatively. He said that the legacy left by Holy Emperor Rodrigo was in the land ruled by the giant king. The boy asked the spirit if he had a plan on how to get in and how to find Rodrigo's legacy. El Cid shouted that there was no plan. Leon waved his hand and said that everything would work out again somehow. He would just trust in his sacred power, his comrade, and his holy sword. The guy realized that there was still a lot of work to be done on himself, but if he didn't give up, he could become even stronger and conquer the Titan Mountains. He climbed out of the caravan and looked around. The vast desert landscape reminded him that he had a long journey and new adventures ahead of him. Adventures were everywhere. The mountain town of Chinook was no exception. There was no lord, no law or order in this city. It was widely known as a city of criminals and lawlessness. There was once again a fight in some roadside tavern. Such stories were a stable for this place. Some huge, pumped-up man threw his enemy back with such force that he blew the door down with his weight. The drunken man asked the one on the ground how he dared to attack him, and A ranked Odin. After that, 
Odin walked back into the tavern and told his companions that tonight's drinks would be paid for by that weakling, except that the man was lying on the ground, showing no signs of life at all. There were bandits standing near the entrance to the tavern saying that that place was not a place an innocent girl should visit. They cornered the girl in the cloak and began to impose on her to use their escort services. One of the bandits took the girl by the chin and told her to stop talking because she could be sold and make some money. The other brigands recoiled from him like a leper, asking if the man who had touched the girl was okay. At first the man didn't understand what he was talking about, but then he looked at his hand and saw that it was twisted backwards in some magical way. The cloaked girl's hands sparkled with power and when she spoke everyone around her fell silent as if by magic. The brigands stared at her mesmerized, afraid to even open their mouths. Saint Elahan stood before them. The girl asked if these sinners wished to atone for their sins. At this time, Leon and Karen had already arrived at the Titan Mountain area. They stood and watched the huge creatures flying high in the sky. Karen explained that this place had many dangerous wyverns that were a threat even to Birang. The danger was felt even in the air. Moreover, the demonic energy emanating from the forest was immense. Many rare spiritual plants grew in it, so most guilds wouldn't accept requests for this place. Elsid told me that a giant king ruled this place. It was a land over which even dragons did not fly as they pleased. These mountains were a world not of humans, but of giants and monsters. In Elsid's opinion, there was no better place for training. The spirit grinned and said that Leon would have to try his best to survive. The boy thought he was dealing with a real demon sword. The guy said that once he got here, he couldn't turn back and give up on his venture. He will train hard and do whatever it takes to survive. On that note, Karen and Leon, with a determined look, set off into the very bowels of the Titanium Mountains to test themselves. At this time, a massacre of brigands was taking place in the mountain town of Chinook. Elahan decided that since these sinful people didn't want to confess, she would deal with them in other ways. After all, she knew all sorts of ways. The brigands who had molested her now lay mutilated by her mace. It was not the girl's fault that the men had forgotten their manners, but Elahan did not notice that a man was following her. He had seen the massacre with his own eyes and realized that the girl was unusually dangerous. She was able to take down a former ranger who was wanted for the murder of a superior, a high-ranking knight, and even a former A-rang adventurer. This man was none other than Khan Fung. When the girl's mace flew towards him, he started to run away in fear, as she had dealt with the entire crowd alone. Elahan smiled sweetly and told Khan that he was the last person she planned to straighten out. The former gang leader begged for mercy saying that he was very disappointed because it hadn't even been 24 hours since he had come here. But the girl was adamant. She said that the man before her was an insolent and unscrupulous man whom she did not plan to pardon. Khan became hysterical and began to say that he had been recognized by the Holy Church for his help. Bishop Jazar could confirm his words. The girl stopped. She didn't touch the man, but the force of her swing caused the ground around them to crack. The mace was just a centimeter from Khan's face. Blood spurted from his nose. Recognition flashed in the girl's eyes, and she asked if he was the same Khan who was the slum boss. The men asked in bewilderment how it was that Elahan knew him. The strange girl didn't have time to answer because they were distracted by a scream nearby. The dead bandits began to come to life. Khan asked in shock what was going on and why the man was alive. He said the mace had clearly broken his neck and shattered his spine, to which Elahan replied that she was using the sacred technique of maximizing recovery at the moment of impact. Whatever the injury, one will regenerate and not die. Looking at the way the brigands were recovering, Khan thought that in addition to her tremendous strength, the girl could also heal wounds instantly. What was her essence? The man was familiar with the power of the Knights of the Holy Iron Castle Order, but it was on a completely different level. There was only one being with such power. The girl asked Khan if he knew a respected adventurer named Leon who had fought with him in the same battle. At the word honorable, the man raised one eyebrow. He wondered if she meant the little brat, Leon. Elahan was simply outraged at such disrespectful treatment of a hero, but she made Khan pay for those words. He repeated the fate of the other bandits the girl had killed. When the girl gave Khan a good lesson, she said that she is now granting him forgiveness for his earlier reservation. She wanted the man to find all traces of Leon and find out where he had gone and what path he had taken. Then he should share that information with her. Elohan specified that it was not necessary to give details, such as the hero's habits and preferences. Although she was curious, she thought it was tactless to find out personal information. But first, the young saint wanted Khan to take her to the town of Blaine, 
where the hero's journey began. The former gang leader was not happy about this turn of events. He hadn't fled Blaine for nothing, and he didn't want to go back. But Elahan cared little. She grabbed the man by the scruff of his neck and dragged him where she wanted him to go. Khan didn't even dare to say anything against it. Things were no less interesting in the Titan Mountains. A couple of men were trying to cut off the head of a small dragon. A dark-haired man asked his companion if he could fight. He replied that his ribs were broken and his left clavicle was injured. The men stood near the two dragon corpses and realized that they had a difficult task to accomplish, for a huge dragon was approaching them. It seemed they had killed his children and now the evil parent was ready to devour them alive. They had to confront the drake. Grabbing their weapons, the men rushed to attack the monster with shouts. It was a fight to the death. The dragon used his wings to start dropping rocks on the head of his enemies. Karen and Leon, who had watched that fight, concluded that those giants were titanic mountain dwellers and they fought on par with the drake. But Dake was full of strength, so the advantage was on his side. He was just having fun with the giants. Leon had his doubts that it was a real demonic monster. Elsid said that this attitude is completely in line with the character of demonic monsters. He realizes his superiority, so he likes to play with other people's lives. Also, the spirit said that the dragon's enemy detection range could be up to three kilometers, so he was aware of their presence and the next target would be them. Karen said that she had heard that the inside of the Titan Mountains was a demonic land, but there was no way she expected to see the drake on her first day. The girl added that these creatures can use all sorts of tricks, just like humans. She asked Leon about the best way to proceed. Looking at the boy's determined look, Karen realized that she had asked that question for nothing because he was already ready for battle. The giants continued their battle with the dragon. The dark-haired man swung his axe, aiming to do as much damage as possible. The sharp blade wounded the beast's paw, and blue-colored blood dripped from it. The dragon roared and loosened its grip on the men a little. When the dark-haired giant thought he'd won because he'd hit his target, the drake made his move. First he tossed his foe into the air, then intercepted his tail to slam it to the ground. After, he knocked down the second enemy and just like that, he started attacking with his powerful tail. The blonde couldn't even move. Next, the dragon tossed two men into the air at once. They wriggled and screamed as they realized what was coming next. And then the dragon's powerful tail slammed the giants to the ground with all its might. The ground cracked beneath the men, and they couldn't move, only spit up blood. Looking at the way the drake towered over them, the men thought that perhaps now one might actually die. But then Leon intervened. He used the Merak technique of the great bear and wounded the dragon in the neck. The dragon roared and blood gushed out of it. Seeing that the attack was successful, the guy beckoned to Karen to join the fight as well. The girl summoned her aura weapon and began to fly towards the dragon, aiming her deadly daggers. She hit the poison blades right where the drake had wounded Leon earlier. The girl deepened the wound, making it even more dangerous to the monster's life. Karen smiled, appraising her work. She thought that fighting a dragon wasn't as hard as she had thought it would be, but after a couple seconds, the girl saw the dragon's thick skin simply push her daggers away from her with little to no damage. Karen realized that they were definitely dead now. Leon said he'd seen it coming as soon as he saw the winged monster. They stepped closer to the giants and the giants watched in amazement as these little people speculated on what a difficult opponent the drake was. Leon threw the potion to the giants and said that although it was only a little bit, but it had a high concentration of ingredients in there. So the effect was assured. The men were puzzled. They wondered what this little thing even wanted from them. Seeing the men's doubts, Leon said they would talk about everything later. Now they had to deal with the huge lizard. The dark-haired giant smiled and said that he was ready to join the battle right now. After drinking the potion and feeling a surge of strength, the giants jumped to their feet and shouted that they didn't need to be begged to fight. They were always ready. Leon and Karen walked in front, the two giant men in the back. They were going to fight to the last man. As if anticipating a new wave of attacks, the dragon stood on its hind legs and roared deafeningly loud, shaking the space around it. The newfound team took that growl as a call to action and went on the offense. Leon decided to use the anticipation technique to anticipate the drake's next move and be ready for anything. But when Leon took a new look at the world around him, he was very surprised. For the colors seemed to have left the world. Elsid urged the boy not to get lost. He said it happens when the mind can't keep up with the body's reaction speed. It's a temporary phenomenon. Right now, as Leon looked around, it seemed to him that time had slowed down. If he had abandoned his training, 
he wouldn't be able to see anything at the moment. Leon looked up and decided it was a good time to decide where best to strike his winged opponent. The guy realized that his opponent's defenses were too high. Neither his attacks nor Karen's could inflict fatal wounds. He had to find a weakness. Leon determined that one of the places with the highest probability of damage was the webbing of the wings. Another reliable option was to aim directly at the center of the eyeballs. But first, they all needed to dodge being hit by the powerful tail of this huge lizard. The team members managed to jump back and avoid the deadly blow. The giants said that if it weren't for Leon's warning, it's unlikely they would have been able to take this fight any further. Karen noticed that the speed of the dragon's attack was just unbelievably fast, so fast that even she couldn't anticipate the attack. You could see how irritated the winged creature was. His eyes were burning, and a plan for revenge was brewing in them. Leon realized that the atmosphere of this battle had completely changed. It had gone from fun to murderous intent. Turning around and looking at Karen, the guy realized that her energy had changed as well. Without saying anything, the girl suddenly surged upwards and headed straight towards the angry dragon. She used the power of her aura and began throwing daggers at the drake with incredible speed. Some of the force he'd channeled went straight into the creature's eyeball. The dragon roared so loudly that the ground shook beneath his feet. Both the giants and Leon were surprised to see such tremendous strength of the girl. Karen never ceased to amaze with her tricks. Dake's eye was smoking, and it looked like it was leaking out. But then he opened his eyelid and found that the eye was almost unharmed. Karen boiled with anger. Even for an S-ranked creature, this winged monster was overreaching. After assessing Karen's temperament, the giant said Leon would have to sweat a lot because she was hot. But at least now it was clear where to aim. The giant said they'd cover Karen and Leon. The giants attacked and aimed their weapons directly at the clawed paws of the drake. Feeling the searing pain, the winged beast roared and became even angrier. At this time, Leon summoned his aura weapon and activated the holy sword to attack the demonic creature with it. The dragon realized that something wrong was going on. He felt an energy that he didn't like at all. The demonic creature realized that it needed to act, so it used its power as well. A magical sphere burst out from its mouth. The dragon pointed this sphere directly at Leon and it expanded, creating a dome over the guy. Leon realized that he had fallen into a magic trap. He realized he was trapped in a magic trap. He walked around in this dark, gloomy void, calling for Elsid, for Karen, for the giants. But there was no response. He realized that the dragon possessed the attribute of darkness. That meant he now had another headache. Leon didn't see Elsid, but he heard his voice in his head saying that the guy could create a light that opened a path. Leon applied the Great Chariot technique and used a technique called Third Sacrament. The dark sphere began to fill with a bright holy glow that threatened to burst out from within. The dragon realized that his technique had failed to harm his opponent, and now he would be rebuffed. And so it happened. The sphere exploded and rays of light shot straight at the dragon's head, burning out its eyeballs. Leon discovered he could use another technique called al -Qaid. That was the last thing the boy remembered. When he opened his eyes, a bright light shone on him and he looked around. He saw a completely unfamiliar place with high ceilings. Leon tried to remember where he was, but he was distracted from these thoughts by a quiet whimpering near him. Trying not to wake the man lying next to him, he turned his head carefully. Karen was sleeping peacefully next to him. Her face was relaxed and her body was so close that Leon could literally feel its warmth. The closeness scared the boy more than a little. He was afraid to even think about how long they had been together like that. Looking around carefully, Leon realized that they were lying on a huge double bed. All the furniture was much larger than he was used to. Feeling the guy stirring, Karen woke up and opened her eyes. Leon abruptly stood up and said that they shouldn't be in the same bed. Karen contradicted him, saying that it had to be just the way it was. The girl asked him in a sleepy voice if he didn't remember anything about the events of yesterday. She seemed a little upset. Karen smiled shyly and said that Leon had been really hot yesterday. Leon stared at Karen with incomprehension. He asked about what he had done yesterday. Seeing the boy's startled look, Karen laughed out loud. She wondered what he was even thinking. The guy was relieved to listen to the girl's story about his fever going over 40 yesterday, and she'd been nursing him all night. Karen rose from the bed and began to resent the fact that this dyke was a tough nut to crack. Leon could only stare at the girl's bare shoulder. Ignoring it, the blonde told her that after Leon's attack, the dragon had activated its self-preservation instinct and was thrashing from side to side like a madman. Karen hugged Leon and told him that their winged enemy had finally tucked tail and fled. The girl inquired how long Leon intended to fall senseless after using his technique. 
Suddenly, memories of the moments of the battle with the dragon surfaced in the guy's mind. He remembered that Karen had recklessly run after him right into the fire released by the drake. She was the only person he was willing to sacrifice herself to save his life. Leon turned to the girl and smiled warmly. He was truly grateful to her. Karen didn't understand why the guy was suddenly grateful. In her opinion, she'd done what she had to do. Their conversation was interrupted by the giants, who entered the room and saw that their guests were awake. The men caught the boys in a very delicate position. They sat too close to each other and almost hugged each other. Realizing that they were superfluous here, the giants left. Karen and Leon realized what the men were thinking and tried to stop them. When the men returned, Karen told them that they had befriended the giants yesterday. The blonde one's name was Urga. The dark-haired man's name was Jula. He was smiling and holding out his hand. Leon shook hands with first one and then the second giant. He introduced himself and said he was very glad to make a new acquaintance. Karen said those two were very strong guys. She didn't see a single demonic creature on the way to their home. The newfound acquaintances moved to the floor and sitting on the plush carpet talked about Leon's search for the giant king. Urga hesitated and said that in order to learn something about the giant king, the lad should see the head of the village. The men asked if he was ready to go right now. Jula recommended that the boy get some more rest. Leon said he was ready to go right now. He didn't understand why the giants were trying to strike fear into him. Stepping out of Urga Jula's house, Karen and Leon looked around the giant village with curiosity. All the buildings were simply impressive in size, but the largest was the fortress of the head of the settlement. The boys looked around enthusiastically and looked around in surprise at the giants who approached to say hello. Walking deep into the village, Leon noticed a dire wolf and a wyvern lying there. The corpses were on display. There were even trolls among them. Monsters capable of destroying a small area, even if they showed up alone, lay dead in the middle of the square. Elsie'd said that these titans were very strong. Leon hadn't even expected them to be that strong. The spirit said they all possessed martial arts and intelligence. The entire race were warriors and hunters. They could kill almost any monster. Urga and Jula led Karen and Leon to the burning skull of a huge animal and told them that they had come to the Hellplatz training ground for the Titans. Julu announced that the head of the village was waiting. Leon was a little reluctant to go there when he heard a sound like a scream. No sooner had they stepped inside than Titans started flying out of the training area, screaming. Leon tried to figure out if they were going to an enemy or someone who could give them valuable information about the giant king. A giant began to emerge from the fire of the training ground, asking where the guests of the village were. 